When Kabul's women looked at themselves in the mirror, even before the Taliban captured the city, they saw only despair. In 1996, I met Bibi Zora in a tiny bakery in Kabul. She was a widow who led a group of young women who prepared naan, the unleavened baked bread every Afghan eats, for widows, orphans, and disabled people. Some 400,000 people in Kabul depended on these bakeries, funded by the World Food Programme, which included 25,000 families headed by war widows and 7,000 families headed by disabled men. Zora's mud shack was pockmarked with shrapnel and bullet holes. It had first been destroyed by rockets fired by Gulbuddin Hikmatyar's forces in 1993, then shelled by the Taliban in 1995. With six children and her parents to support, she had donated part of the tiny plot of land where her house once stood to the World Food Programme for a bakery. Look at my face. Don't you see the tragedy of our lives and our country marked all over it? She said. Day by day the situation is worsening. We have become beggars dependent on the UN to survive. It is not the Afghan way. Women are exhausted, depressed and devastated. We are just waiting for peace, praying for peace every minute of the day. The plight of Bibi Zora's children and other kids was even worse. At a playground set up by Save the Children in the battered, half-destroyed Mikrayan housing complex, rake-thin Afghan children played grimly on the newly installed swings. It was a playground littered with reminders of the war, discarded artillery shell cases, a destroyed tank with a gaping hole where the turret once was, and trees lopped down by rocket fire. Women and children faced the brunt of the conflict, save the children's director, Sophie Eliusson, told me. Women have to cope with no food and malnutrition for their children. Women suffer from hysteria, trauma and depression because they don't know when the next rocket attack will come. How can children relate to a mother's discipline or affection when they've seen adults killing each other and mothers are unable to provide for their basic needs? There is so much stress that the children don't even trust each other, and parents have stopped communicating with their kids or even trying to explain what is going on, said Eliusson. A UNICEF survey of Kabul's children, conducted by Dr. Leila Gupta, found that most children had witnessed extreme violence and did not expect to survive. Two-thirds of the children interviewed had seen somebody killed by a rocket and scattered corpses or body parts. More than 70% had lost a family member and no longer trusted adults. They all suffer from flashbacks, nightmares and loneliness. Many said they felt their life was not worth living anymore, said Dr. Gupta. Every norm of family life had been destroyed in the war. When children cease to trust their parents, or parents cannot provide security, children have no anchor in the real world. Children were caught up in the war on a greater scale than in any other civil conflict in the world. All the warlords had used boy soldiers, some as young as 12 years old, and many were orphans with no hope of having a family, an education or a job except soldiering. The Taliban, with their linkages to the Pakistani madrasas, encouraged thousands of children to enlist and fight. Entire units were made up of kids as loaders for artillery batteries, ammunition carriers, guarding installations and as fighters. Significantly, a major international effort in 1998 to limit the age of soldiers to 18 rather than the current minimum age of 15 met with resistance by the US, Pakistan, Iran and Afghanistan. A 1999 Amnesty International report said there were over 300,000 children under 18 enlisted as soldiers worldwide. The plight of women and children would get much worse after the Taliban capture of Kabul. Every Kabuli woman I met during 1995 to 96, and reporters could then easily meet and talk to women on the street, in shops and offices, knew their precarious lives would only get worse if the Taliban captured Kabul. One such woman was Nasiba Gul, a striking 27-year-old single woman who aspired to be part of the modern world. A 1990 graduate of Kabul University, she held down a good job with an NGO, Dressed in a long skirt and high heels, she rarely bothered to cover her face, throwing just a small scarf over her head when she travelled across the city. 
The Taliban just want to trample women into the dust. No woman, not even the poorest or most conservative, wants the Taliban to rule Afghanistan, said Nasiba. Islam says women are equal to men and respect should be given to women. But the Taliban's actions are turning people against even Islam, she added. Nasiba's fears were justified, for when the Taliban captured Kabul, women disappeared from public view. Nasiba was forced to stop working and left for Pakistan. The Taliban leaders were all from the poorest, most conservative and least literate southern Pashtun provinces of Afghanistan. In Mullah Omar's village, women had always gone around fully veiled, and no girl had ever gone to school because there were none. Omar and his colleagues transposed their own milieu, their own experience, or lack of it, with women, to the entire country, and justified their policies through the Quran. For a time, some aid agencies claimed that this was the Afghan cultural tradition which had to be respected. But in a country so diverse in its ethnicity and levels of development, there was no universal standard of tradition or culture for women's role in society. Nor had any Afghan ruler before the Taliban ever insisted on such dress codes as compulsory beards for men and the burqa. The rest of Afghanistan was not even remotely like the South. Afghan Pashtuns in the East, heavily influenced by Pakistani Pashtuns, were proud to send their girls to school, and many continued to do so under the Taliban by running village schools or sending their families to Pakistan. Here, aid agencies such as the Swedish Committee supported some 600 primary schools with 150,000 students, of whom 30,000 were girls. When Pashtun tribal elders demanded education for girls, Taliban governors did not and could not object. In Afghan refugee camps in Pakistan, tens of thousands of Pashtun girls studied. Outside the Pashtun belt, all other ethnic groups vigorously encouraged female education. Afghanistan's strength was its ethnic diversity, and women had as many roles as there were tribes and nationalities. Afghanistan's cities were even more diverse. Kandahar was always a conservative city, but Herat's female elite once spoke French as a second language and copied the fashions of the Shah's court in Tehran. Forty percent of Kabul's women worked, both under the communist regime and the post-1992 Mujahideen government. Women with even a smattering of education and a job exchanged their traditional clothes for skirts, high heels and makeup. They went to the movies, played sports and danced and sang at weddings. Common sense alone should have dictated that to win hearts and minds, the Taliban would have to relax their gender policy according to the prevalent realities in the areas they took control of. Instead, they viewed Kabul as a den of iniquity, a Sodom and Gomorrah, where women had to be beaten into conforming with Taliban standards of behavior. And they viewed the northerners as impure Muslims who had to be forcibly re-Islamicized. The Taliban's uncompromising attitude was also shaped by their own internal political dynamic and the nature of their recruiting base. Their recruits, the orphans, the rootless, the lumpen proletariat from the war and the refugee camps, had been brought up in a totally male society. In the madrasa milieu, control over women and their virtual exclusion was a powerful symbol of manhood and a reaffirmation of the students' commitment to jihad, Denying a role for women gave the Taliban a kind of false legitimacy amongst these elements. This conflict against women is rooted in the political beliefs and ideologies, not in Islam or the cultural norms. The Taliban are a new generation of Muslim males who are products of a war culture, who have spent much of their adult lives in complete segregation from their own communities. In Afghan society, women have traditionally been used as instruments to regulate social behavior and as such a powerful symbols in Afghan culture, said Simi Wali, the head of an Afghan NGO. Taliban leaders repeatedly told me that if they gave women greater freedom or a chance to go to school, they would lose the support of their rank and file, who would be disillusioned by a leadership that had compromised principles under pressure. They also claimed their recruits would be weakened and subverted by the possibility of sexual opportunities and thus not fight with the same zeal. 
So the oppression of women became a benchmark for the Taliban's Islamic radicalism, their aim to cleanse society and to keep the morale of their troops high. The gender issue became the main platform of the Taliban's resistance to UN and Western governments' attempts to make them compromise and moderate their policies. Compromise with the West would signal a defeat and admittance that they were wrong all along. Defiance would signal victory. Hardline Taliban turned the argument of the outside world on its head. They insisted that it was up to the West to moderate their position and accommodate the Taliban, rather than that the Taliban recognize universal human rights. Let us state what sort of education the UN wants. This is a big infidel policy which gives such obscene freedom to women which would lead to adultery and herald the destruction of Islam. In any Islamic country where adultery becomes common, that country is destroyed and enters the domination of the infidels because their men become like women and women cannot defend themselves. Anybody who talks to us should do so within Islam's framework. The Holy Quran cannot adjust itself to other people's requirements. People should adjust themselves to the requirements of the Holy Quran, said Attorney General Malvi Jalilullah Malvizada. The Taliban could not explain how a deeply rooted religion like Islam could be so undermined at the hands of adulterers. All tribal Pashtuns also followed Pashtun Wali, a social code which gave the tribal jirga or council the right to make judgments on cases from a traditional pantheon of laws and punishments, especially when it came to disputes over ownership of land and women and murder. The line between Pashtun Wali and Sharia law has always been blurred for the Pashtuns. Taliban punishments were in fact drawn largely from Pashtun Wali rather than the Sharia. But Pashtun Wali was practiced in varying degrees to a lesser or greater extent across the Pashtun belt, and it certainly did not govern the practices of other ethnic groups. The fact that the Taliban were determined to impose Pashtun Wali Sharia law on these ethnic groups by force only deepened the ethnic divide in the country. Non Pashtuns saw this as an attempt to impose Kandahari Pashtun laws on the entire country. There were no political conditions in which the Taliban were prepared to compromise. After every military defeat, they tightened their gender policies ferociously, under the assumption that harsher measures against women would sustain morale amongst their defeated soldiers. And every victory led to another tightening, because the newly conquered populations had to be shown Taliban power. The policy of engagement with the Taliban to moderate their policies, advocated by the international community, gave no dividends. And their insistence that they would allow women's education after the war was over became more and more meaningless. The capture of Herat in 1995 was the first indicator to Afghans and the outside world that the Taliban would not compromise on the gender issue. Herat, the heart of medieval Islam in the entire region, was a city of mosques and madrasas, but it had an ancient liberal Islamic tradition. It was the home of Islamic arts and crafts, miniature painting, music, dance, carpet making, and numerous stories about its redoubtable and beautiful women. Heratis still recount the story of Queen Gauhar Shad, the daughter-in-law of the conqueror Timur, who moved the Timurid capital from Samarkand to Herat in 1405 after Timur's death. One day, in the company of 200 ruby-lipped beautiful ladies-in-waiting, the queen inspected a mosque and madrasa complex she was building on the outskirts of Herat. The madrasa students, or Taliban, had been asked to vacate the premises while the queen and her entourage visited. But one student had fallen asleep in his room. He was awoken by an exquisitely attractive lady-in-waiting. When she rejoined the queen, the lady was panting and dishevelled by the exertions of passionate lovemaking, and thus she was discovered. Instead of punishing her or the student, the queen ordered all her ladies-in-waiting to marry the students in a mass ceremony so as to bless them and ensure they avoided temptation in the future. She gave each student clothes and a salary, and ordered that husband and wife should meet once a week as long as the students studied hard. It was the kind of story that epitomized the liberal human tradition of Islam and madrasa education in Herat. The Taliban had no knowledge of Herat's history or traditions. They arrived to drive Herati women indoors. 
people were barred from visiting the shrines of Sufi saints, of which Herat had an abundance. The Taliban cancelled out years of effort by the Mujahideen commander Ismail Khan to educate the population by shutting down all girls' schools. Most boys' schools also closed as their teachers were women. They segregated the few functioning hospitals, shut down bathhouses, and banned women from the bazaar. As a result, Hirati women were the first to rebel against Taliban excesses. On the 17th of October 1996, more than 100 women protested outside the office of the governor against the closure of the city's bathhouses. The women were beaten and then arrested by the Taliban religious police, who went from house to house warning men to keep their women indoors. The international media and the UN largely chose to ignore these events in Herat, but several Western NGOs realized the profound implications for their future activities. After a long internal debate and fruitless negotiations with the Taliban in Herat, UNICEF and Save the Children suspended their educational programs in Herat because girls were excluded from them. The suspension of these aid programs did not deter the Taliban, who quickly realized that other UN agencies were not prepared to take a stand against them on the gender issue. Moreover, they'd succeeded in dividing the aid-giving community. UN policy was in a shambles because the UN agencies had failed to negotiate from a common platform. As each UN agency tried to cut its own deal with the Taliban, the UN compromised its principles, while Taliban restrictions on women only escalated. The UN is on a slippery slope. The UN thinks that by making small compromises it can satisfy the international community and satisfy the Taliban. In fact, it is doing neither, the head of a European NGO told me. The world only woke up to the Taliban's gender policies after they captured Kabul in 1996. The UN could not avoid ignoring the issue after the massive international media coverage of the Taliban's hanging of former President Najibullah and the treatment of Kabul's women. Protest statements from world leaders, such as UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali, the heads of UNICEF, UNESCO, UNHCR and the European Commissioner for Human Rights, met with no Taliban response. Beauty, hair and makeup salons were shut down in Kabul, as were women's bathhouses, the only place where hot water was available. Tailors were ordered not to measure women for clothes, but learned to keep the measurements of their regular customers in their heads. Fashion magazines were destroyed. Paint your nails, take a snapshot of a friend, blow a flute, clap to a beat, invite a foreigner over for tea, and you've broken a Taliban edict, wrote an American reporter. Until Kabul, the UN's disastrous lack of a policy had been ignored, but then it became a scandal, and the UN came in for scathing criticism from feminist groups. Finally, the UN agencies were forced to draw up a common position. A statement spoke of maintaining and promoting the inherent equality and dignity of all people and not discriminating between the sexes, races, ethnic groups or religions. But the same UN document also stated that international agencies hold local customs and cultures in high respect. It was a classic UN compromise which gave the Taliban the lever to continue stalling by promising to allow female education after peace came. Nevertheless, by October 1996, the UN was forced to suspend eight income-generating projects for women in Kabul because women were no longer allowed to work in them. During the next 18 months, round after round of fruitless negotiations took place between UN, NGOs, Western governments and the Taliban, by which time it became clear that a hardline lobby of Taliban ulema in Kandahar were determined to get rid of the UN entirely. The Taliban tightened the screws ever further. They closed down home schools for girls, which had been allowed to continue, and then prevented women from attending general hospitals. In May 1997, the religious police beat up five female staff of the U.S. NGO Care International and then demanded that all aid projects receive clearance from not just the relevant ministry, but also from the ministries of Interior, Public Health, Police and the Department of the Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice. This was followed by a demand that all Muslim female humanitarian workers coming to Afghanistan be accompanied by a male relative. 
Finally, in July 1997, the Taliban insisted that all 35 UN and NGO agencies move out of their offices to one pre-selected compound at the destroyed Polytechnic building. As the European Union suspended further humanitarian aid, the UN and the NGOs left Kabul. The plight of Afghanistan's women often hid the fact that urban males did not fare much better under the Taliban, especially non-Pashtuns. All Kabul males were given just six weeks to grow a full beard, even though some of the ethnic groups, such as the Hazaras, had very limited beard growth. Beards could not be trimmed shorter than a man's fist, leading to jokes that Afghanistan's biggest import-export business was male facial hair, and that men did not need visas to travel to Afghanistan, they just needed a beard. The religious police stood at street corners with scissors cutting off long hair and often beating culprits. Men had to wear their shalwars or baggy trousers above the ankle, and everyone had to say their prayers five times a day. The Taliban also clamped down on homosexuality. Kandahar's Pashtuns were notorious for their affairs with young boys, and the rape of young boys by warlords was one of the key motives for Mullah Omar in mobilizing the Taliban. But homosexuality continued, and the punishments were bizarre, if not inhuman. Two soldiers, caught indulging in homosexuality in Kabul in April 1998, were beaten mercilessly, and then tied up and driven around Kabul in the back of a pickup, with their faces blackened by engine oil. Men accused of sodomy faced the previously unheard of Islamic punishment of having a wall toppled over them. In February 1998, three men sentenced to death for sodomy in Kandahar were taken to the base of a huge mud and brick wall, which was then toppled over them by a tank. They remained buried under the rubble for half an hour, but one managed to survive. His Eminence the Amir al mumineen Mullah Omar, attended the function to give Sharia punishment to the three buggeries in Kandahar, wrote Anis, the Taliban newspaper. In March 1998, Two men were killed by the same method in Kabul. Our religious scholars are not agreed on the right kind of punishment for homosexuality, said Mullah Muhammad Hassan, epitomizing the kind of debates the Taliban were preoccupied with. Some say we should take these sinners to a high roof and throw them down, while others say we should dig a hole beside a wall, bury them, and then push the wall down on top of them. The Taliban also banned every conceivable form of entertainment, which in a poor, deprived country such as Afghanistan was always in short supply anyway. Afghans were ardent moviegoers, but movies, TV, videos, music and dancing were all banned. Of course we realise that people need some entertainment, but they can go to the parks and see the flowers, and from this they will learn about Islam, Mullah Mohammed Hassan told me. According to Education Minister Mullah Abdul Hanifi, the Taliban oppose music because it creates a strain in the mind and hampers study of Islam. Singing and dancing were banned at weddings, which for centuries had been major social occasions from which hundreds of musicians and dancers made a living. Most of them fled to Pakistan. Nobody was allowed to hang paintings, portraits or photographs in their homes. One of Afghanistan's foremost artists, Muhammad Mashal, aged 82, who was painting a huge mural showing 500 years of Herat's history, was forced to watch as the Taliban whitewashed over it. Simply put, the Taliban did not recognize the very idea of culture. They banned Nowroz, the traditional Afghan New Year's celebrations, as anti-Islamic. An ancient spring festival, Nowroz marks the first day of the Persian solar calendar, when people visit the graves of their relatives. People were forcibly stopped from doing so. They banned Labor Day on the 1st of May for being a communist holiday. For a time, they also banned Ashura, the Shia Islamic month of mourning, and even restricted any show of festivity at Eid, the principal Muslim celebration of the year. Most Afghans felt demoralized by the fact that the Islamic world declined to take up the task of condemning the Taliban's extremism. Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and the Arab Gulf states have never issued a single statement on the need for women's education or human rights in Afghanistan, nor did they ever question the Taliban's interpretation of Sharia. Asian Muslim countries were also silent. Surprisingly, Iran issued the toughest defense of women's rights under Islam. Through their fossilized policies, 
The Taliban stopped girls from attending school, stopped women working out of their homes, and all that in the name of Islam. What could be worse than committing violence, narrow-mindedness, and limiting women's rights and defaming Islam? said Ayatollah Ahmad Janati as early as 1996. Iranian criticism of Taliban policies escalated dramatically after the deaths of their diplomats in Mazar in 1998. In Mazar stands the tomb of Rabia Bolki, a beautiful, tragic medieval poetess. She was the first woman of her time to write love poetry in Persian, and died, tragically, after her brother slashed her wrists as punishment for sleeping with a slave lover. She wrote her last poem in her own blood as she lay dying. For centuries, young Uzbek girls and boys treated her tomb with saint-like devotion and would pray there for success in their love affairs. After the Taliban captured Mazar, they placed her tomb out of bounds. Love, even for a medieval saint, was now out of bounds. Chapter 9 High on Heroin, Drugs and the Taliban Economy Just two miles from Kandahar's city centre, poppy fields stretch as far as the horizon. In the spring of 1997, farmers were carefully tending the young, green, lettuce-like leaves of the plants, which had been planted a few weeks earlier. They meticulously hoed the soil to uproot weeds, sprinkled fertiliser, and repaired irrigation ditches destroyed by the Soviet army in the 1980s to provide water to the fields. In a few weeks, the leaves would sprout a bright red flower, which would bloom until its petals fell away to reveal a hardened capsule. Four months after sowing the poppy seeds, the capsules would be ready to be lanced with thin, homemade blades for their liquid gold. The farmer would squeeze each capsule with his fingers until a milky-white, gooey substance oozed out. By the next day, the opium would solidify into a brown gum, which would be scraped off with a trowel. This operation would be repeated every few days, until the plant stopped yielding any gum. The raw opium would be collected, slapped together in a cake, and kept wet in plastic bags until the dealers arrived. The best quality opium, generally obtained from well-irrigated land, has a dark brown colour and sticky texture. It is called tor the substance which lubricates the finances of all the Afghan warlords, but particularly the Taliban. "'We cannot be more grateful to the Taliban,' said Wali Jan, a toothless elderly farmer as he weeded his fields. "'The Taliban have brought us security so we can grow our poppy in peace. I need the poppy crop to support my fourteen family members,' he added. The Taliban objective of re-establishing peace and security in the countryside has proved to be an immense boon to opium farming. On his small plot of land, Walijan produces 45 kilograms of raw opium every year and earns about 1,300 US dollars, a small fortune for Afghan farmers. Walijan knows that refined heroin fetches 50 times that price in London or New York, but he's more than happy with what he gets. The results of this cash flow are evident everywhere, for there is more reconstruction going on in villages around Kandahar than anywhere else in Afghanistan. The Taliban have provided an Islamic sanction for farmers like Wali Jan to grow even more opium, even though the Quran forbids Muslims from producing or imbibing intoxicants. Abdul Rashid, the head of the Taliban's anti-drugs control force in Kandahar, spelled out the nature of his unique job. He is authorised to impose a strict ban on the growing of hashish because it is consumed by Afghans and Muslims. But, Rashid tells me without a hint of sarcasm, opium is permissible because it is consumed by kafirs, that is, unbelievers in the West, and not by Muslims or Afghans. There are other political imperatives for letting poppy farming flourish. We let people cultivate poppies because farmers get good prices. We cannot push the people to grow wheat, as there would be an uprising against the Taliban if we forced them to stop poppy cultivation. So we grow opium and get our wheat from Pakistan, he said. Governor Mohammed Hassan justifies this unique policy with another twist. Drugs are evil, and we would like to substitute poppies with another cash crop, but it is not possible at the moment because we do not have international recognition. 
Over the next two years, Mullah Omar was to periodically offer the U.S. and the U.N. an end to poppy cultivation if the Taliban were given international recognition. The first time a movement controlling 90% of a country had offered the international community such an option. The Taliban had quickly realized the need to formalize the drugs economy in order to raise revenue. When they first captured Kandahar, they had declared they would eliminate all drugs, and U.S. diplomats were encouraged enough by the announcement to make immediate contact with the Taliban. However, within a few months, the Taliban realized that they needed the income from poppies and would anger farmers by banning it. They began to collect an Islamic tax called zakat on all dealers moving opium. According to the Quran, Muslims should give 2.5% of their disposable income as zakat to the poor. But the Taliban had no religious qualms in collecting 20% of the value of a truckload of opium as zakat. Alongside this, individual commanders and provincial governors imposed their own taxes to keep their coffers full and their soldiers fed. Some of them became substantial dealers in opium or used their relatives to act as middlemen. Meanwhile, the Taliban crackdown against hashish, a staple part of Afghan truck drivers' diets, was extremely effective, demonstrating that any crackdown on opium could be just as strictly implemented. In two warehouses in Kandahar, hundreds of sacks of hashish were stored after being confiscated from growers and dealers. Ordinary people said they were too scared to take hashish after the Taliban had forbidden it. For those who continued to do so clandestinely, the Taliban had devised a novel approach to curing hashish addiction. When we catch hashish smugglers or addicts, we interrogate and beat them mercilessly to find out the truth, said Abdul Rashid. Then we put them in cold water for many hours, two or three times a day. It's a very good cure, he added. Rashid then strode into the jail and pulled out several terrified prisoner addicts to talk to me. They had no hesitation in agreeing that the Taliban shock therapy was effective. When I am beaten or in the cold water, I forget all about hashish, said Bakht Mohammed, a shopkeeper and hashish dealer who was serving three months in jail. Between 1992 and 1995, Afghanistan had produced a steady 2,200 to 2,400 metric tons of opium every year, rivaling Burma as the world's largest producer of raw opium. In 1996, Afghanistan produced 2,250 metric tons. Officials of the United Nations Drugs Control Program, UNDCP, said that in 1996, Kandahar province alone produced 120 metric tons of opium, harvested from 3,160 hectares of poppy fields, a staggering increase from 1995, when only 79 metric tons was produced from 2,460 hectares. Then in 1997, as Taliban control extended to Kabul and further north, Afghanistan's opium production rose by a staggering 25% to 2,800 metric tons. The tens of thousands of Pashtun refugees arriving in Taliban-controlled areas from Pakistan were farming their lands for the easiest and most lucrative cash crop available. According to the UNDCP, farmers received less than 1% of the total profits generated by the opium trade, Another 2.5% remained in Afghanistan and Pakistan in the hands of dealers, while 5% was spent in the countries through which the heroin passed while en route to the West. The rest of the profits were made by the dealers and distributors in Europe and the US. Even with this low rate of return, it is conservatively estimated that some 1 million Afghan farmers are making over 100 million US dollars a year on account of growing poppies. The Taliban were thus raking in at least 20 million US dollars in taxes and even more on the side. Ever since 1980, all the Mujahideen warlords had used drugs money to help fund their military campaigns and line their own pockets. They had bought houses and businesses in Peshawar, new jeeps and kept bank accounts abroad. Publicly, they refused to admit that they indulged in drugs trafficking but always blamed their Mujahideen rivals for doing so. 
but none had ever been so brazen or honest in declaring their lack of intention to control drugs as the Taliban. By 1997, UNDCP and the U.S. estimated that 96% of Afghan heroin came from areas under Taliban control. The Taliban had done more than just expand the area available for opium production. Their conquests had also expanded trade and transport routes significantly. Several times a month, heavily armed convoys in Toyota Land Cruisers left Helmand province, where 50% of Afghan opium is grown, for a long, dusty journey. Some convoys travelled south across the deserts of Baluchistan to ports on Pakistan's Makran coast. Others entered western Iran, skirted Tehran, and travelled on to eastern Turkey. Other convoys went northwest to Herat and Turkmenistan. By 1997, dealers began flying out opium on cargo planes from Kandahar and Jalalabad to Gulf ports such as Abu Dhabi and Sharjah. Central Asia was the hardest hit by the explosion in Afghan heroin. The Russian mafia, with ties to Afghanistan established during the Soviet occupation, used their networks to move heroin through Central Asia, Russia, the Baltics, and into Europe. Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan developed important opium routes and became significant opiate producers themselves. Whereas previously Afghan opium would be refined in laboratories in Pakistan, a crackdown in Pakistan and the new diversification in routes encouraged dealers to set up their own laboratories inside Afghanistan. Ascetic anhydride, a chemical necessary to convert opium into heroin, was smuggled into Afghanistan via Central Asia. The explosion in heroin production began ironically not in Afghanistan but in Pakistan. Pakistan had become a major opium producer during the 1980s, producing around 800 metric tons a year or 70% of the world's supply of heroin until 1989. An immense narcotics trade had developed under the legitimizing umbrella of the CIA ISI covert supply line to the Afghan Mujahideen. During the 1980s, corruption, covert operations and narcotics became intertwined in a manner which makes it difficult to separate Pakistan's narcotics traffic from more complex questions of regional security and insurgent warfare, said a landmark 1992 study on the failure of U.S. narcotics policy. As in Vietnam, where the CIA chose to ignore the trade in drugs by anti-communist guerrillas whom the CIA was financing, so in Afghanistan, the U.S. chose to ignore the growing collusion between the Mujahideen, Pakistani drugs traffickers, and elements in the military. Instances of this collusion that did come to light in the 1980s were only the tip of the iceberg. In 1983, the ISI chief, General Akhtar Abdul Rehman, had to remove the entire ISI staff in Quetta because of their involvement with the drugs trade and sale of CIA-supplied weapons that were meant for the Mujahideen. In 1986, Major Zahuruddin Afridi was caught while driving to Karachi from Peshawar with 220 kilograms of high-grade heroin, the largest drugs interception in Pakistan's history. Two months later, an Air Force officer, Flight Lieutenant Khalilua Rehman, was caught on the same route with another 220 kilograms of heroin. He calmly confessed that it was his fifth mission. The U.S. street value of just these two caches was 600 million U.S. dollars, equivalent to the total amount of U.S. aid to Pakistan that year. Both officers were held in Karachi until they mysteriously escaped from jail. The Afridi Rehman cases pointed to a heroin syndicate within the army and the ISI linked to Afghanistan, wrote Lawrence Lifschultz. The U.S. Drugs Enforcement Administration, the DEA, had 17 full-time officers in Pakistan during the 1980s who identified 40 major heroin syndicates, including some headed by top government officials. Not a single syndicate was broken up during that decade. There was clearly a conflict of interest between the CIA, which wanted no embarrassing disclosures about drug links between the heroic Mujahideen and Pakistani officials and traffickers, and the DEA. Several DEA officials asked to be relocated, and at least one resigned, because the CIA refused to allow them to carry out their duties. 
During the jihad, both the Mujahideen and officers in the communist army in Kabul seized the opportunity. The logistics of their operations were remarkably simple. The donkey, camel, and truck convoys which carried weapons into Afghanistan were coming back empty. Now they carried out raw opium. The CIA ISI bribes that were paid off to the Pashtun chiefs to allow weapons convoys through their tribal areas soon involved the same tribal chiefs allowing heroin runs along the same routes back to Pakistan. The National Logistics Cell, an army-run trucking company which transported CIA weapons from Karachi port to Peshawar and Quetta, was frequently used by well-connected dealers to transport heroin back to Karachi for export. The heroin pipeline in the 1980s could not have operated without the knowledge, if not connivance, of officials at the highest level of the army, the government and the CIA. Everyone chose to ignore it, for the larger task was to defeat the Soviet Union. Drugs control was on nobody's agenda. It was not until 1992, when General Asif Nawaz became Pakistan's army chief, that the military began a concerted effort to root out the narcotics mafia that had developed in the Pakistani armed forces. Nevertheless, heroin money had now penetrated Pakistan's economy, politics and society. Western anti-narcotics agencies in Islamabad kept track of drugs lords who became members of the National Assembly during the first governments of Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif. Drugs lords funded candidates to high office in both Bhutto's Pakistan People's Party and Sharif's Pakistan Muslim League. Industry and trade became increasingly financed by laundered drugs money, and the black economy, which accounted for between 30 and 50 percent of the total Pakistan economy, was heavily subsidized by drugs money. It was only after the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan that U.S. and Western pressure began to mount on Islamabad to curtail the production of opium in Pakistan. Over the following decade, 1989 to 99, some 100 million U.S. dollars of Western aid to combat narcotics was made available to Pakistan. Poppy cultivation was drastically reduced from a high of 800 tonnes to 24 tonnes in 1997 and 2 tonnes by 1999. Crop substitution projects in the northwest frontier province proved to be extremely successful. Nevertheless, the dealers and the transport mafia never went away, and they received a major boost with the arrival of the Taliban and the subsequent increase in Afghan heroin production. Pakistan was no longer a heroin producer, but it became a major transport route for Taliban heroin exports. The same dealers, truck drivers, madrasa and government contacts, and the arms, fuel and food supply chain that provided the Taliban with its supplies also funneled drugs, just as the arms pipeline for the Mujahideen had done in the 1980s. Pakistan was slipping back into bad habits. In February 1998, the Clinton administration accused Islamabad of doing little to curb production and exports of heroin. The U.S. refused to certify that Pakistan was curbing narcotics production, but gave a waiver on the grounds of U.S. national security interests. But the drugs problem was now no longer confined to Pakistan and Afghanistan. As export routes multiplied in all directions, there was a dramatic increase in drug consumption across the region. By 1998, 58% of opiates was consumed within the region itself, and only 42% was actually being exported. Pakistan, which had no heroin addicts in 1979, had 650,000 addicts in 1986, 3 million by 1992, and an estimated 5 million by 1999. Heroin addiction and drugs money fueled law and order problems and unemployment and allowed ethnic and sectarian extremist groups to arm themselves. In Iran, the government admitted to having 1.2 million addicts in 1998, but senior officials in Tehran told me the figure was nearly 3 million, even though Iran had one of the toughest anti-narcotics policies in the world, where anyone caught with a few ounces of heroin faced the death penalty automatically. And Iran had tried much harder than Pakistan to keep the drugs menace away. Since the 1980s, 
Iran had lost 2,500 men from its security forces in military operations to stop convoys carrying drugs from Afghanistan. After Iran closed its borders with Afghanistan during the tensions with the Taliban in September 1998, Iranian security forces caught five tons of heroin on the border in a few weeks. The Taliban faced a major financial crisis as the closed border led to a drop in heroin exports and tax revenue. Heroin addiction was also increasing in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Kyrgyzstan as they became part of the heroin export chain. In 1998, guards on the Tajikistan-Afghanistan border confiscated one tonne of opium and 200 kilograms of heroin. In January 1999, Tajikistan's president, Imomali Rahmanov, told an international conference that drugs were being smuggled into his country from Afghanistan at the rate of one ton a day, and addiction was increasing. Uzbekistan said there was an 11% increase of drugs from Afghanistan during 1998. I saw heroin being openly sold outside five-star hotels in Ashgabat, the capital of Turkmenistan, and inside the hotels, flashy Turkmen and Russian mafioso, with their even flashier girlfriends, spoke of their trips to the Afghan border to do business. In 1997, two tons of heroin and 38 tons of hashish were seized by the authorities. By 1999, Turkmenistan, with its conciliatory policy with the Taliban, had become the principal route of export for Afghan heroin, with corrupt Turkmen officials benefiting from the trade. President Askar Akeyev of Kyrgyzstan told me in January 1999 that his country was now a major route for drugs trafficking, and it is responsible for the growth of crime. Akeyev said the war against drugs could not be won unless there was peace in Afghanistan, and the civil war had become the most destabilizing factor in the region. The heroin explosion emanating from Afghanistan is now affecting the politics and economics of the entire region. It is crippling societies, distorting the economies of already fragile states, and creating a new narco elite which is at odds with the ever-increasing poverty of the population. Drugs is determining the politics of this region as never before, said a Western ambassador in Islamabad. We equate it now with other serious threats such as Islamic fundamentalism, terrorism and potential economic collapse in some of these countries, he added. This worsening situation prompted attempts by the international community to talk to the Taliban. After six months of secret negotiations, UNDCP concluded an agreement with the Taliban in October 1997. The Taliban agreed to eradicate poppy growing if the international community provided funds to help farmers with substitute crops. Pino Arlaki, the head of UNDCP, asked for 25 million US dollars from donors for a 10-year program to eliminate poppy farming in areas controlled by the Taliban. Afghan heroin supplies 80% of Europe's supply of heroin and 50% of the world's supply of heroin. We're talking about eliminating half the heroin of the world, Alaki said enthusiastically. UNDCP said it would introduce new cash crops, improve irrigation, build new factories and pay for law enforcement. But the agreement was never implemented by the Taliban, and after the pullout of UN agencies from Afghanistan in 1998, it simply fell apart. Six months later, Alaki was less optimistic when he told me, Afghanistan is one of the most difficult and crucial parts of the world, but a wider political settlement is needed before drugs production can be controlled. The record of wealthy countries supporting UNDCP initiatives was not particularly hopeful either. Between 1993 and 1997, UNDCP had asked for 16.4 million US dollars from international donors for anti-narcotics work in Afghanistan and received only half that amount. The taxes on opium exports became the mainstay of Taliban income and their war economy. In 1995, UNDCP estimated that Pakistan-Afghanistan drugs exports were earning some 50 billion rupees, 1.35 billion US dollars a year. By 1998, 
heroin exports had doubled in value to three billion U.S. dollars. Drugs money funded the weapons, ammunition, and fuel for the war. It provided food and clothes for the soldiers and paid the salaries, transport, and perks that the Taliban leadership allowed its fighters. The only thing that can be said in the Taliban's favor was that, unlike in the past, this income did not appear to line the pockets of their leaders as they continued to live extremely frugal lives. But it made the Afghan and Pakistani traffickers extremely rich. Alongside the drugs trade, the traditional Afghan smuggling trade from Pakistan and now the Gulf states expanded under the Taliban and created economic havoc for neighboring states. The Afghan transit trade, ATT, described in detail in Chapter 15, is the largest source of official revenue for the Taliban and generates an estimated three billion U.S. dollars annually for the Afghan economy. Customs officials in Kandahar, Kabul, and Herat refused to disclose their daily earnings, but with some 300 trucks a day passing through Kandahar on their way to Iran and Central Asia via Herat, and another 200 trucks passing through Jalalabad and Kabul to the north, daily earnings are considerable. The illegal trade in consumer goods, food, and fuel through Afghanistan is crippling industries, reducing state revenues, and creating periodic food shortages in all neighboring states, affecting their economies in a way that was never the case during the jihad. Taliban customs revenues from the smuggling trade are channeled through the State Bank of Afghanistan, which is trying to set up branches in all provincial capitals. But there is no bookkeeping to show what money comes in and where it goes. These official revenues do not account for the war budget, which is accumulated and spent directly by Mullah Omar in Kandahar, and is derived from drugs income, aid from Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, and other donations. We have revenues from customs, mining, and zakat, but there are some other sources of income for the war effort that do not come through the State Bank of Afghanistan, admitted Malvi Arifula Arif, the Deputy Minister of Finance. With the war being run directly by Mullah Omar, from his tin trunk stuffed full of money which he keeps under his bed, making a national budget is next to impossible, even if the expertise was available, which it is not. The finance ministry has no qualified economist or banker. The minister and his deputies are mullahs with a madrasa education, and knowledgeable bureaucrats were purged. The paucity of official funds can be judged by the fact that in 1997, the finance ministry had set a budget of the equivalent of 100,000 US dollars for the entire country's administration and development programs for the Afghan financial year, February 1997 to January 1998. In fact, this amount just covered salaries for officials. Some of the mullah traders within the Taliban are trying to encourage industry and foreign investment, but there appears to be no serious support from the Taliban leadership for these efforts. We want to develop Afghanistan as a modern state, and we have enormous mineral, oil and gas resources which should interest foreign investors, said Malvi Ahmed Jan, the Minister of Mines and Industries, who left his carpet business in Saudi Arabia to join the Taliban and run Afghanistan's industries. Before we took control of the South, there was no factory working in the country, now we've reopened mines and carpet factories with the help of Pakistani and Afghan traders, he added. He agreed that few members of the powerful Kandahar Shura were interested in economic issues as they were too involved with the war. As an investment incentive to foreigners, particularly Pakistani traders, Ahmed Jan was offering free land to anyone who would build a new factory. But with the collapse of the country's infrastructure, any investor would have to build his own roads and provide electricity and housing. Only a few Pakistani and Afghan transport traders based in Peshawar and Quetta, who were already involved in either smuggling or the lucrative illegal timber trade from Afghanistan, appear to be taking an interest in projects such as mining. There is no educated or professional class left in the country. In the several waves of refugees that have left the city since 1992, all the educated, trained professionals, even telephone operators, electricians and mechanics, have gone. 
Most of the Taliban running the departments of finance, economy and the social sector are mullah traders, businessmen, truck transporters and smugglers, for whom the rationale of nation-building is seen only in the perspective of expanding the market for smuggling and the trucking business across the region. One such is Mullah Abdul Rashid, a fierce-looking Taliban military commander from Helmand, who gained notoriety in April 1997 when he captured a Pakistani military patrol that had entered Afghan territory from Baluchistan province to chase a gang of drug smugglers. Rashid arrested the soldiers and sent them to Kandahar, sparking off a row with Pakistan. He also runs the Taliban-owned marble mines in Helmand. The mine, which employs 500 men with picks, has no mining engineers, no equipment, no electricity and no expertise. Rashid's mining techniques are limited to using explosives to blast and scar the marble. The Taliban's appetite for foreign investment had been first whetted by the competition between two oil companies, Bridas of Argentina and the U.S. company Unical, who were competing for influence with the Taliban in order to build a gas pipeline from Turkmenistan to Pakistan across southern Afghanistan. The pipeline attracted a few swashbuckling, risk-taking businessmen. These included Afghan and Pakistani traders who built regular petrol pumps in Kandahar and along the route to Herat. They also promised to build roads. A USA-based group provided the Taliban with a mobile telephone network between Kabul and Kandahar in 1999. Such activities did little for re-establishing a regular economy. They were solely aimed at improving the Taliban's smuggling business and making life easier for traders and transporters. Serious foreign investment and even aid to begin reconstruction is certainly not going to happen until there is an end to the war and a government which can ensure minimum stability and public loyalty. In the meantime, Afghanistan is like an economic black hole that is sending out waves of insecurity and chaos to a region that is already facing multiple economic crises. Afghanistan's infrastructure lies in ruins. Basic civic amenities available in any underdeveloped country are non-existent. There is no running water, little electricity, telephones, motorable roads or regular energy supplies. There are severe shortages of water, food and housing and other basic necessities. What is available is too expensive for most people to afford. The laying of millions of mines during the war has created severe resettlement problems in the cities and the countryside, where agriculture and irrigation in the most fertile areas is hampered by mines. Since 1979, 400,000 Afghans have been killed and another 400,000 injured in mine explosions. A staggering 13% of all Afghan families has had a relative killed or crippled in mine accidents, and over 300 people are killed or maimed every month. Although some 4,000 deminers working for the UN and other NGOs are trying to demine the country as fast as possible, it could take another decade before even the major cities are demined. In 1998, after six years of extensive work, Kabul still had some 200 square miles out of a total of 500 square miles of the city which had not been demined. Apart from mines, the daily battle for most Kabulis is to find enough of the grubby Afghani notes to pay for daily foodstuffs. Although the shops are full of smuggled foodstuffs from Iran and Pakistan, people do not have the money to buy them. Salaries, for those Afghan surgeons who have not fled Kabul, is the equivalent of five US dollars a month. They only survive because their salaries are subsidized by the ICRC. Average salaries are around one to three US dollars a month. As a result of grinding poverty and no jobs, a large percentage of the urban population is totally dependent on UN agencies for basic survival and subsidized food supplies. 50% of Kabul's 1.2 million people receive some kind of food aid from Western humanitarian agencies. This poses a continuing dilemma for the UN as to whether its humanitarian aid is only sustaining the war because it gives the warlords the excuse to absolve themselves of taking responsibility for the civilian population. 
The Taliban continuously insisted that they were not responsible for the population and that Allah would provide. However, the suffering of ordinary Afghans would only increase if the UN and NGOs were to cease their relief operations altogether and, in particular, stop feeding vulnerable groups such as widows and orphans. In 1998, the economic situation visibly worsened. Northern Afghanistan was hit by three devastating earthquakes. The Taliban siege of the Hazarajat led to widespread starvation in central Afghanistan, Floods in Kandahar submerged villages and crops, and the urban population was blighted by the pullout of aid agencies after the U.S. missile strikes in August 1998. There was visible malnutrition on the streets of Kabul during the freezing winter of 1998-99, to when few could afford to eat even one meal a day or heat their homes. However, there were signs of hope, if only peace would come. The WFP estimated that cereal production for 1998 would be 3.85 million tonnes, 5% more than 1997 and the best year of production since 1978. This reflected the improved law and order in rural areas under Taliban control, the lack of fighting and the return of refugees to farm their lands. Although there is still 1.2 million Afghan refugees in Pakistan and 1.4 million in Iran, more than 4 million refugees had returned home between 1992 and 1999. However, the Taliban and the UN agencies still had to import 750,000 tons of wheat in 1998 for the cities to make up the food shortfall. Clearly, the Taliban did not create the economic devastation in Afghanistan. Rather, they inherited it from the civil war which all the factions waged after 1992, but none of the factions, including the Taliban, have paid any attention to the needs of the civilian population. Thus, it is not surprising that Western countries are suffering from donor fatigue, the reluctance to come up with more money for humanitarian aid when the civil war continues unabated and the warlords are so irresponsible. The level of suffering experienced by the Afghan people is literally horrendous, said Alfredo Vitsky chesteri the UN coordinator for Afghanistan until 1998. As the years go by, funds trickle in slower and slower. We raise less than half the money we ask for. The warlords are not even remotely concerned with planning for the reconstruction of the country. Afghanistan's economic black hole is getting larger and wider, sucking more and more of its own population and the people of the region into it. Chapter 10 Global Jihad, the Arab Afghans and Osama bin Laden At Torkham, and the border post at the head of the Khyber Pass between Afghanistan and Pakistan, a single chain barrier separates the two countries. On the Pakistani side stand the smartly turned out frontier scouts, paramilitaries in their grey shalwa kameezes and turbans. It was April 1989, and the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan had just been completed. I was returning to Pakistan by road from Kabul, but the barrier was closed. Exhausted from my journey, I lay down on a grass verge on the Afghan side of the border and, and waited. Suddenly, along the road behind me, a truck full of mujahideen roared up and stopped. But those on board were not Afghans. Light-coloured Arabs, blue-eyed Central Asians and swarthy Chinese-looking faces peered out from roughly wound turbans and ill-fitting shalwa kameezes. They were swathed in ammunition belts and carried kalashnikovs. Except for one Afghan who was acting as interpreter and guide, not a single one of the thirty foreigners spoke Pushto, Dari, or even Urdu. As we waited for the border to open, we got talking. The group was made up of Filipino Moros, Uzbeks from Soviet Central Asia, Arabs from Algeria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait, and Uyghurs from Xinjiang in China. Their escort was a member of Gulbuddin Hikmetyar's Hizbe Islami, under training at a camp near the border, they were going on weekend leave to Peshawar and were looking forward to getting mail from home, changing their clothes and having a good meal. They had come to fight the jihad with the Mujahideen and to train in weapons, bomb-making and military tactics so they could take the jihad back home. That evening, Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto had hosted a dinner for journalists in Islamabad, among the guests was Lieutenant General Hamid Gul, the head of the ISI and the most fervent Islamic ideologue in the army after Zia's death. 
General Gaul was triumphant about the Soviet withdrawal. I asked him if he was not playing with fire by inviting Muslim radicals from Islamic countries who were ostensibly allies of Pakistan. Would these radicals not create dissension in their own countries, endangering Pakistan's foreign policy? We are fighting a jihad, and this is the first Islamic international brigade in the modern era. The communists have their international brigades, the West has NATO. Why can't the Muslims unite and form a common front? The general replied. It was the first and only justification I was ever given for what were already called the Arab Afghans, even though none were Afghans and many were not Arabs. Three years earlier, in 1986, CIA chief William Casey had stepped up the war against the Soviet Union by taking three significant, but at that time, highly secret measures. He had persuaded the U.S. Congress to provide the Mujahideen with American-made Stinger anti-aircraft missiles to shoot down Soviet planes and provide U.S. advisers to train the guerrillas. Until then, no U.S.-made weapons or personnel had been used directly in the war effort. The CIA, Britain's MI6, and the ISI also agreed on a provocative plan to launch guerrilla attacks into the Soviet Socialist Republics of Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, the soft Muslim underbelly of the Soviet state, from where Soviet troops in Afghanistan received their supplies. The task was given to the ISI's favorite Mujahideen leader, Gulbuddin Hikmatyar. In March 1987, Small units crossed the Amudaria River from bases in northern Afghanistan and launched their first rocket attacks against villages in Tajikistan. Casey was delighted with the news, and on his next secret trip to Pakistan, he crossed the border into Afghanistan with President Zia to review the Mujahideen troops. Thirdly, Casey committed the CIA support to a long-standing ISI initiative to recruit radical Muslims from around the world to come to Pakistan and fight with the Afghan Mujahideen. The ISI had encouraged this since 1982, and by now all the other players had their reasons for supporting the idea. President Zia aimed to cement Islamic unity, turn Pakistan into the leader of the Muslim world, and foster an Islamic opposition in Central Asia. Washington wanted to demonstrate that the entire Muslim world was fighting the Soviet Union alongside the Afghans and their American benefactors. And the Saudis saw an opportunity both to promote Wahhabism and get rid of its disgruntled radicals. None of the players reckoned on these volunteers having their own agendas, which would eventually turn their hatred against the Soviets on their own regimes and the Americans. Pakistan already had standing instructions to all its embassies abroad to give visas, with no questions asked, to anyone wanting to come and fight with the Mujahideen. In the Middle East, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Saudi-based World Muslim League, and Palestinian Islamic radicals organized the recruits and put them into contact with the Pakistanis. The ISI and Pakistan's Jamaat-e-Islami set up reception committees to welcome, house, and train the arriving militants, and then encouraged them to join the Mujahideen groups, usually the hizb islami The funds for this enterprise came directly from Saudi intelligence. French scholar Olivier Roy describes it as a joint venture between the Saudis, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Jamaat-e-Islami put together by the ISI. Between 1982 and 1992, some 35,000 Muslim radicals from 43 Islamic countries in the Middle East, North and East Africa, Central Asia and the Far East would pass their baptism under fire with the Afghan Mujahideen. Tens of thousands more foreign Muslim radicals came to study in the hundreds of new madrasas that Zia's military government began to fund in Pakistan and along the Afghan border. Eventually, more than 100,000 Muslim radicals were to have direct contact with Pakistan and Afghanistan and be influenced by the jihad. In camps near Peshawar and in Afghanistan, these radicals met each other for the first time and studied, trained and fought together. It was the first opportunity for most of them to learn about Islamic movements in other countries, and they forged tactical and ideological links that would serve them well in the future. The camps became virtual universities for future Islamic radicalism. 
None of the intelligence agencies involved wanted to consider the consequences of bringing together thousands of Islamic radicals from all over the world. What was more important in the world view of history, the Taliban or the fall of the Soviet Empire? A few stirred up Muslims or the liberation of Central Europe and the end of the Cold War, said Zbigniew Brzezinski, a former U.S. national security advisor. American citizens only woke up to the consequences when Afghanistan-trained Islamic militants blew up the World Trade Center in New York in 1993, killing six people and injuring a thousand. This war, wrote Samuel Huntington, left behind an uneasy coalition of Islamist organizations intent on promoting Islam against all non-Muslim forces. It also left a legacy of expert and experienced fighters, training camps and logistical facilities, elaborate trans-Islam networks of personal and organization relationships, a substantial amount of military equipment, including 300 to 500 unaccounted for Stinger missiles, and most important, a heady sense of power and self-confidence over what had been achieved, and a driving desire to move on to other victories. Most of these radicals speculated that if the Afghan Jihad had defeated one superpower, the Soviet Union, could they not also defeat the other superpower, the U.S., and their own regimes? The logic of this argument was based on the simple premise that the Afghan Jihad alone had brought the Soviet state to its knees. The multiple internal reasons which led to the collapse of the Soviet system, of which the Jihad was only one, were conveniently ignored. So while the USA saw the collapse of the Soviet state as the failure of the communist system, many Muslims saw it solely as a victory for Islam. For militants, this belief was inspiring and deeply evocative of the Muslim sweep across the world in the 7th and 8th centuries. A new Islamic Ummah, they argued, could be forged by the sacrifices and blood of a new generation of martyrs and more such victories. Amongst these thousands of foreign recruits was a young Saudi student, Osama bin Laden, the son of a Yemeni construction magnate, Mohammed bin Laden, who was a close friend of the late King Faisal, and whose company had become fabulously wealthy on the contracts to renovate and expand the holy mosques of Mecca and Medina. The ISI had long wanted Prince Turki bin Faisal, the head of Istak Barat, the Saudi intelligence service, to provide a royal prince to lead the Saudi contingent in order to show Muslims the commitment of the royal family to the jihad. Only poorer Saudis, students, taxi drivers and Bedouin tribesmen had so far arrived to fight. But no pampered Saudi prince was ready to rough it out in the Afghan mountains. Bin Laden, although not a royal, was close enough to the royals and certainly wealthy enough to lead the Saudi contingent. Bin Laden, Prince Turki, and General Gul were to become firm friends and allies in a common cause. The center for the Arab Afghans was the offices of the World Muslim League and the Muslim Brotherhood in Peshawar, which was run by Abdullah Azam, a Jordanian-Palestinian whom Bin Laden had first met at university in Jeddah and revered as his leader. Azam and his two sons were assassinated by a bomb blast in Peshawar in 1989. During the 1980s, Azam had forged close links with Hikmetyar and Abdul Rasul Sayaf, the Afghan Islamic scholar whom the Saudis had sent to Peshawar to promote Wahhabism. Saudi funds flowed to Azam, and the Maktab al-Kidmat, or Services Center, which he created in 1984, to service the new recruits and receive donations from Islamic charities. Donations from Saudi Intelligence, the Saudi Red Crescent, the World Muslim League, and private donations from Saudi princes and mosques were channeled through the Maktab. A decade later, the Maktab would emerge at the center of a web of radical organizations that helped carry out the World Trade Center bombing and the bombings of U.S. embassies in Africa in 1998. Until he arrived in Afghanistan, bin Laden's life had hardly been marked by anything extraordinary. He was born around 1957, the 17th of 57 children sired by his Yemeni father and a Saudi mother, one of Mohammed bin Laden's many wives. Bin Laden studied for a master's degree in business administration at King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, but soon switched to Islamic studies. Thin and tall, he is six feet five inches, with long limbs and a flowing beard, 
He towered above his contemporaries, who remembered him as a quiet and pious individual, but hardly marked out for greater things. His father backed the Afghan struggle and helped fund it, so when bin Laden decided to join up, his family responded enthusiastically. He first travelled to Peshawar in 1980 and met the Mujahideen leaders, returning frequently with Saudi donations for the cause, until 1982, when he decided to settle in Peshawar. He brought in his company engineers and heavy construction equipment to help build roads and depots for the Mujahideen. In 1986, he helped build the Khost Tunnel Complex, which the CIA was funding as a major arms storage depot, training facility and medical center for the Mujahideen, deep under the mountains close to the Pakistan border. For the first time in Khost, he set up his own training camp for Arab Afghans who now increasingly saw this lanky, wealthy and charismatic Saudi as their leader. To counter these atheist Russians, the Saudis chose me as their representative in Afghanistan, bin Laden said later. I settled in Pakistan in the Afghan border region. There I received volunteers who came from the Saudi kingdom and from all over the Arab and Muslim countries. I set up my first camp where these volunteers were trained by Pakistani and American officers, the weapons were supplied by the Americans, the money by the Saudis. I discovered that it was not enough to fight in Afghanistan, but that we had to fight on all fronts, communist or Western oppression, he added. Bin Laden later claimed to have taken part in ambushes against Soviet troops, but he mainly used his wealth and Saudi donations to build Mujahideen projects and spread Wahhabism amongst the Afghans. After the death of Azam in 1989, he took over Azam's organization and set up Al-Qaeda, or military base, as a service center for Arab Afghans and their families, and to forge a broad-based alliance amongst them. With the help of bin Laden, several thousand Arab militants had established bases in the provinces of Kunar, Nuristan, and Badakhshan, but their extreme Wahhabi practices made them intensely disliked by the majority of Afghans. Moreover, by allying themselves with the most extreme pro-Wahhabi Pashtun Mujahideen, the Arab Afghans alienated the non-Pashtuns and the Shia Muslims. Ahmed Shah Massoud later criticized the Arab Afghans. My jihad faction did not have good relations with the Arab Afghans during the years of jihad. In contrast, they had very good relations with the factions of Abdul Razul Sayyaf and Gulbuddin Hikmetyar, when my faction entered Kabul in 1992, the Arab Afghans fought in the ranks of Hikmetyar's forces against us. We will ask them, the Arabs, to leave our country. Bin Laden does more harm than good, Masoud said in 1997, after he'd been ousted from Kabul by the Taliban. By 1990, Bin Laden was disillusioned by the internal bickering of the Mujahideen, and he returned to Saudi Arabia to work in the family business. He founded a welfare organization for Arab-Afghan veterans, some 4,000 of whom had settled in Mecca and Medina alone, and gave money to the families of those killed. After Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, he lobbied the royal family to organize a popular defense of the kingdom and raise a force from the Afghan war veterans to fight Iraq. Instead, King Fahd invited in the Americans. This came as an enormous shock to bin Laden. As the 540,000 U.S. troops began to arrive, bin Laden openly criticized the royal family, lobbying the Saudi ulema to issue fatwas, religious rulings against non-Muslims being based in the country. Bin Laden's criticism escalated after some 20,000 U.S. troops continued to be based in Saudi Arabia after Kuwait's liberation. In 1992, he had a fiery meeting with Interior Minister Prince Naif, whom he called a traitor to Islam. Naif complained to King Fahd, and bin Laden was declared persona non grata. Nevertheless, he still had allies in the royal family, who also disliked Naif, while he maintained his links with both Saudi intelligence and the ISI. In 1992, bin Laden left for Sudan to take part in the Islamic Revolution underway there under the charismatic Sudanese leader Hassan Turabi. Bin Laden's continued criticism of the Saudi royal family eventually annoyed them so much that they took the unprecedented step of revoking his citizenship in 1994. It was in Sudan, with his wealth and contacts, 
that bin Laden gathered around him more veterans of the Afghan war, who were all disgusted by the American victory over Iraq and the attitude of the Arab ruling elites who allowed the U.S. military to remain in the Gulf. As U.S. and Saudi pressure mounted against Sudan for harboring bin Laden, the Sudanese authorities asked him to leave. In May 1996, bin Laden travelled back to Afghanistan, arriving in Jalalabad in a chartered jet with an entourage of dozens of Arab militants, bodyguards and family members, including three wives and 13 children. Here he lived under the protection of the Jalalabad Shura until the conquest of Kabul and Jalalabad by the Taliban in September 1996. In August 1996, he had issued his first declaration of jihad against the Americans, whom he said were occupying Saudi Arabia. The walls of oppression and humiliation cannot be demolished except in a rain of bullets, the declaration read. Striking up a friendship with Mullah Omar, in 1997 he moved to Kandahar and came under the protection of the Taliban. By now, the CIA had set up a special cell to monitor his activities and his links with other Islamic militants. A U.S. State Department report in August 1996 noted that bin Laden was one of the most significant financial sponsors of Islamic extremist activities in the world. The report said that bin Laden was financing terrorist camps in Somalia, Sudan, Yemen, Egypt and Afghanistan. In April 1996, President Clinton signed the Anti-Terrorism Act, which allowed the U.S. to block assets of terrorist organizations. It was first used to block bin Laden's access to his fortune of an estimated 250 to 300 million U.S. dollars. A few months later, Egyptian intelligence declared that bin Laden was training 1,000 militants, a second generation of Arab Afghans, to bring about an Islamic revolution in Arab countries. In early 1997, the CIA constituted a squad which arrived in Peshawar to try and carry out a snatch operation to get bin Laden out of Afghanistan. The Americans enlisted Afghans and Pakistanis to help them, but aborted the operation. The U.S. activity in Peshawar helped persuade bin Laden to move to the safer confines of Kandahar, on the 23rd of February 1998, at a meeting in the original Coast Camp, all the groups associated with al-Qaeda issued a manifesto under the aegis of the International Islamic Front for Jihad Against Jews and Crusaders. The manifesto stated, For more than seven years, the U.S. has been occupying the lands of Islam in the holiest of places, the Arabian Peninsula, plundering its riches, dictating to its rulers, humiliating its people, terrorizing its neighbors, and turning its bases in the peninsula into a spearhead through which to fight the neighboring Muslim peoples. The meeting issued a fatwa, the ruling to kill Americans and their allies, civilians and military, is an individual duty for every Muslim who can do it in any country in which it is possible to. Bin Laden had now formulated a policy that was not just aimed at the Saudi royal family or the Americans, but called for the liberation of the entire Muslim Middle East. As the American air war against Iraq escalated in 1998, Bin Laden called on all Muslims to confront, fight and kill Americans and Britons. However, it was the bombings in August 1998 of the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania that killed 220 people, which made bin Laden a household name in the Muslim world and the West. Just 13 days later, after accusing bin Laden of perpetrating the attack, the USA retaliated by firing 70 cruise missiles against bin Laden's camps around Coast and Jalalabad. Several camps, which had been handed over by the Taliban to the Arab Afghans and Pakistani radical groups, were hit. The al-Badra camp, controlled by bin Laden, and the Khalid bin Walid and Muawiyah camps, run by the Pakistani Harakat ul Ansar, were the main targets. Harakat used their camps to train militants for fighting Indian troops in Kashmir. Seven outsiders were killed in the strike, three Yemenis, two Egyptians, one Saudi and one Turk. Also killed were seven Pakistanis and 20 Afghans. In November 1998, the USA offered a $5 million reward for bin Laden's capture. The Americans were further galvanized when bin Laden claimed that it was his Islamic duty to acquire chemical and nuclear weapons to use against the USA. 
it would be a sin for Muslims not to try to possess the weapons that would prevent infidels from inflicting harm on Muslims. Hostility towards America is a religious duty, and we hope to be rewarded for it by God, he said. Within a few weeks of the Africa bombings, the Clinton administration had demonized bin Laden to the point of blaming him for every atrocity committed against the USA in the Muslim world in recent times. In the subsequent indictment against him by a New York court, bin Laden was blamed for the 18 American soldiers killed in Mogadishu, Somalia, in 1993, the deaths of five servicemen in a bomb attack in Riyadh in 1995, and the deaths of another 19 U.S. soldiers in Dharan in 1996. He was also suspected of having a hand in bombings in Aden in 1992, the World Trade Center bombing in 1993, a 1994 plot to kill President Clinton in the Philippines, and a plan to blow up a dozen U.S. civilian aircraft in 1995. There was a great deal of skepticism, even among U.S. experts, that he was involved in many of these latter operations. But the Clinton administration was desperately looking for a diversion as it wallowed through the mire of the Monica Lewinsky affair and also needed an all-purpose simple explanation for unexplained terrorist acts. Bin Laden became the center of what was promulgated by Washington as a global conspiracy against the USA. What Washington was not prepared to admit was that the Afghan Jihad, with the support of the CIA, had spawned dozens of fundamentalist movements across the Muslim world, which were led by militants who had grievances not so much against the Americans, but their own corrupt, incompetent regimes. As early as 1992-93, to 93, Egyptian and Algerian leaders at the highest level had advised Washington to re-engage diplomatically in Afghanistan in order to bring about peace so as to end the presence of the Arab Afghans. Washington ignored the warnings and continued to ignore Afghanistan even as the civil war there escalated. The Algerians were justified in their fears, for the first major eruption from the ranks of the Arab Afghans came in Algeria. In 1991, the Islamic Salvation Front, the FIS, won the first round of parliamentary elections, taking some 60% of the seats countrywide. The Algerian army cancelled the results, declared presidential rule in January 1992, and within two months a vicious civil war began which had claimed some 70,000 lives by 1999. FIS itself was outmaneuvered by the more extreme Islamic Jihad, which in 1995 changed its name to the Armed Islamic Group, the GIA. GIA was led by Algerian Afghans, Algerian veterans from the Afghan war, who were neo-Wahhabis and set an agenda that was to plunge Algeria into a bloodbath, destabilize North Africa, and lead to the growth of Islamic extremism in France. Algeria was only a foretaste of what was to come later. Bombings carried out in Egypt by Islamic groups were also traced back to Egyptian veterans trained in Afghanistan. Bin Laden knew many of the perpetrators of these violent acts across the Muslim world because they had lived and fought together in Afghanistan. His organization, focused around supporting veterans of the Afghan war and their families, maintained contacts with them. He may well have funded some of their operations, but he was unlikely to know what they were all up to or what their domestic agendas were. Bin Laden has always been insecure within the architecture of Islam. He is neither an Islamic scholar nor a teacher, and thus cannot legally issue fatwas, although he does so. In the West, his Death to America appeals have been read as fatwas, even though they do not carry moral weight in the Muslim world. Arab Afghans who knew him during the jihad say he was neither intellectual nor articulate about what needed to be done in the Muslim world. In that sense, he was neither the Lenin of the Islamic Revolution, nor was he the internationalist ideologue of the Islamic Revolution, such as Che Guevara was to revolution in the Third World. Bin Laden's former associates describe him as deeply impressionable, always in the need for mentors, men who knew more about both Islam and the modern world than he did. To the long list of mentors during his youth were later added Dr. Ayman al-Zawahiri, the head of the banned Islamic Jihad in Egypt, and the two sons of Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, the blind Egyptian preacher, now in a U.S. jail for the World Trade Center bombing, 
and who had led the band El Gama Islamiyah in Egypt. Through the Afghan Jihad, he also knew senior figures in the National Islamic Front in the Sudan, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and Hamas, the radical Islamic Palestinian movement in Gaza and the West Bank. In Kandahar, he had Chechens, Bangladeshis, Filipinos, Algerians, Kenyans, Pakistanis, and African-American Muslims with him, many of whom were widely read and better informed than bin Laden, but could not travel outside Afghanistan because they were on U.S. wanted lists. What they needed was financial support and a sanctuary, which bin Laden gave them. After the Africa bombings, the U.S. launched a truly global operation. More than 80 Islamic militants were arrested in a dozen different countries. Militants were picked up in a crescent running from Tanzania, Kenya, Sudan, Yemen, to Pakistan, Bangladesh, Malaysia and the Philippines. In December 1998, Indian authorities detained Bangladeshi militants for plotting to bomb the U.S. consulate in Calcutta. Seven Afghan nationals using false Italian passports were arrested in Malaysia and accused of trying to start a bombing campaign. According to the FBI, militants in Yemen, who kidnapped 16 Western tourists in December 1998, were funded by bin Laden. In February 1999, Bangladeshi authorities said bin Laden had sent one million U.S. dollars to the Hakat ul jihad the H.J., in Dhaka, some of whose members had trained and fought in Afghanistan. H.J. leaders said they wanted to turn Bangladesh into a Taliban-style Islamic state. Thousands of miles away, in Nouakchott, the capital of Mauritania in West Africa, several militants were arrested who had also trained under bin Laden in Afghanistan and were suspected of plotting bomb explosions. Meanwhile, during the trial of 107 al-Jihad members at a military court in Cairo, Egyptian intelligence officers testified that bin Laden had bankrolled al-Jihad. In February 1999, the CIA claimed that through monitoring bin Laden's communication network by satellite, they had prevented his supporters from carrying out seven bomb attacks against U.S. overseas facilities in Saudi Arabia, Albania, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan, Uganda, Uruguay and the Ivory Coast, emphasizing the reach of the Afghan veterans. The Clinton administration sanctioned 6.7 billion U.S. dollars to fight terrorism in 1999, while the FBI's counterterrorism budget grew from $118 million to $286 million, and the agency allocated 2,650 agents to the task, twice the number in 1998. But it was Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, the original sponsors of the Arab Afghans, who suffered the most as their activities rebounded. In March 1997, three Arab and two Tajik militants were shot dead after a 36-hour gun battle between them and the police in an Afghan refugee camp near Peshawar. Belonging to the Wahhabi radical Tafkir group, they were planning to bomb an Islamic heads of state meeting in Islamabad. With the encouragement of Pakistan, the Taliban and bin Laden, Arab Afghans had enlisted in the Pakistani party Hakat ul Ansar to fight in Kashmir against Indian troops. By inducting Arabs, who introduced Wahhabi-style rules in the Kashmir Valley, genuine Kashmiri militants felt insulted. The U.S. government had declared Ansar a terrorist organization in 1996, and it had subsequently changed its name to Harkat ul Mujahideen, all the Pakistani victims of the U.S. missile strikes on coast belonged to Ansar. In 1999, Ansar said it would impose a strict Wahhabi-style dress code in the Kashmir Valley and banned jeans and jackets. On 15th of February 1999, they shot and wounded three Kashmiri cable television operators for relaying Western satellite broadcasts. Ansar had previously respected the liberal traditions of Kashmiri Muslims, but the activities of the Arab Afghans hurt the legitimacy of the Kashmiri movement and gave India a propaganda coup. Pakistan faced a problem when Washington urged Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif to help arrest bin Laden. The ISI's close contacts with bin Laden and the fact that he was helping fund and train Kashmiri militants who were using the coast camps created a dilemma for Sharif when he visited Washington in December 1998. 
Sharif sidestepped the issue, but other Pakistani officials were more brazen, reminding their American counterparts how they'd both helped midwife bin Laden in the 1980s and the Taliban in the 1990s. Bin Laden himself pointed to continued support from some elements in the Pakistani intelligence services in an interview. As for Pakistan, there are some governmental departments which, by the grace of God, respond to the Islamic sentiments of the masses in Pakistan. This is reflected in sympathy and cooperation. However, some other governmental departments fell into the trap of the infidels. We pray to God to return them to the right path, said bin Laden. Support for bin Laden by elements within the Pakistani establishment was another contradiction in Pakistan's Afghan policy, explored fully in Chapter 14. The U.S. was Pakistan's closest ally, with deep links to the military and the ISI. But both the Taliban and bin Laden provided sanctuary and training facilities for Kashmiri militants who were backed by Pakistan, and Islamabad had little interest in drying up that support. Even though the Americans repeatedly tried to persuade the ISI to cooperate in delivering bin Laden, the ISI declined, although it did help the U.S. arrest several of bin Laden's supporters. Without Pakistan's support, the USA could not hope to launch a snatch by U.S. commandos or more accurate bombing strikes because it needed Pakistani territory to launch such raids. At the same time, the USA dared not expose Pakistan's support for the Taliban because it still hoped for ISI cooperation in catching bin Laden. The Saudi conundrum was even worse. In July 1998, Prince Turki had visited Kandahar, and a few weeks later, 400 new pickup trucks arrived in Kandahar for the Taliban, still bearing their Dubai license plates. The Saudis also gave cash for the Taliban's conquest of the north in the autumn. Until the Africa bombings, and despite U.S. pressure to end their support for the Taliban, the Saudis continued funding the Taliban and were silent on the need to extradite bin Laden. The truth about the Saudi silence was even more complicated. The Saudis preferred to leave bin Laden alone in Afghanistan because his arrest and trial by the Americans could expose the deep relationship that bin Laden continued to have with sympathetic members of the royal family and elements within Saudi intelligence, which could prove deeply embarrassing. The Saudis wanted bin Laden either dead or a captive of the Taliban. They did not want him captured by the Americans. After the August 1998 Africa bombings, U.S. pressure on the Saudis increased. Prince Turkey visited Kandahar again, this time to persuade the Taliban to hand over bin Laden. In their meeting, Mullah Omar refused to do so, and then insulted Prince Turkey by abusing the Saudi royal family. Bin Laden himself described what took place. He, that is Prince Turkey, asked Mullah Omar to surrender us home or to expel us from Afghanistan. It is none of the business of the Saudi regime to come and ask for the handing over of Osama bin Laden. It was as if Turkey came as an envoy of the American government. Furious about the Taliban insults, the Saudis suspended diplomatic relations with the Taliban and ostensibly ceased all aid to them, although they did not withdraw recognition of the Taliban government. By now, bin Laden had developed considerable influence with the Taliban, but that had not always been the case. The Taliban's contact with the Arab Afghans and their pan-Islamic ideology was non-existent until the Taliban captured Kabul in 1996. Pakistan was closely involved in introducing bin Laden to the Taliban leaders in Kandahar because it wanted to retain the coast training camps for Kashmiri militants, which were now in Taliban hands. Persuasion by Pakistan, the Taliban's better educated cadres, who also had pan-Islamic ideas, and the lure of financial benefits from bin Laden encouraged the Taliban leaders to meet with bin Laden and hand him back the coast camps. Partly for his own safety and partly to keep control over him, the Taliban shifted bin Laden to Kandahar in 1997. At first he lived as a paying guest. He built a house for Mullah Omar's family and provided funds to other Taliban leaders. He promised to pave the road from Kandahar Airport to the city and build mosques, schools and dams. But his civic works never got started as his funds were frozen. While bin Laden lived in enormous style in a huge mansion in Kandahar with his family, servants and fellow militants, 
The arrogant behavior of the Arab Afghans who arrived with him and their failure to fulfill any of their civic projects antagonized the local population. The Kandaharis saw the Taliban leaders as beneficiaries of Arab largesse rather than the people. Bin Laden endeared himself further to the leadership by sending several hundred Arab Afghans to participate in the 1997 and 1998 Taliban offensives in the north. These Wahhabi fighters helped the Taliban carry out the massacres of the Shia Hazaras in the north. Several hundred Arab Afghans, based in the Rishkor army garrison outside Kabul, fought on the Kabul front against Massoud. Increasingly, bin Laden's worldview appeared to dominate the thinking of senior Taliban leaders. All-night conversations between bin Laden and the Taliban leaders paid off. Until his arrival, the Taliban leadership had not been particularly antagonistic to the USA or the West, but demanded recognition for their government. However, after the Africa bombings, the Taliban became increasingly vociferous against the Americans, the UN, the Saudis and Muslim regimes around the world. Their statements increasingly reflected the language of defiance bin Laden had adopted, and which was not an original Taliban trait. As U.S. pressure on the Taliban to expel bin Laden intensified, the Taliban said he was a guest, and it was against Afghan tradition to expel guests. When it appeared that Washington was planning another military strike against bin Laden, the Taliban tried to cut a deal with Washington to allow him to leave the country in exchange for U.S. recognition. Thus, until the winter of 1998, the Taliban saw bin Laden as an asset, a bargaining chip over whom they could negotiate with the Americans. The U.S. State Department opened a satellite telephone connection to speak to Mullah Omar directly. The Afghanistan desk officers, helped by a Pushto translator, held lengthy conversations with Omar in which both sides explored various options, but to no avail. By early 1999, it began to dawn on the Taliban that no compromise with the U.S. was possible, and they began to see bin Laden as a liability. A U.S. deadline in February 1999 to the Taliban to either hand over bin Laden or face the consequences forced the Taliban to make him disappear discreetly from Kandahar. The move bought the Taliban some time, but the issue was still nowhere near being resolved. The Arab Afghans had come full circle. From being mere appendages to the Afghan Jihad and the Cold War in the 1980s, they'd taken center stage for the Afghans, neighboring countries, and the West in the 1990s. The USA was now paying the price for ignoring Afghanistan between 1992 and 1996, while the Taliban were providing sanctuary to the most hostile and militant Islamic fundamentalist movement the world faced in the post-Cold War era. Afghanistan was now truly a haven for Islamic internationalism and terrorism, and the Americans in the West were at a loss as to how to handle it. Part 3. The New Great Game Chapter 11. Dictators and Oil Barons, the Taliban and Central Asia, Russia, Turkey and Israel In Ashgabat, the capital of Turkmenistan, a massive new international airport was completed in 1996, the enormous, luxurious terminal building was built to meet the expected flow of Western airlines to this oil and gas-rich desert republic, but it echoes with the sounds of silence. Within months, half of it was closed down because it was too expensive to maintain, and the rest, with only a few weekly flights arriving, was barely used even in 1999. In 1995, at Saraks on the Turkmenistan-Iranian border, a spanking new railway station with marbled walls and ticket counters was completed. The howling red sand and shifting dunes of the Karakum or Black Sand Desert lapped the building and the heat was stifling. The station was the Turkmen end of a new railway line built by the Iranians, which connects Mashhad in northeastern Iran with Ashgabad, the first direct communications link between Central Asia and Muslim countries to the south, after 70 years of being cut off from each other. Yet with only two goods and passenger trains arriving from Iran every week, the station is closed for much of the week. Communication links with the outside world were a top priority for all the Central Asian republics after they achieved independence in December 1991. But nearly a decade later, it appeared that there was more camel traffic on the fabled Silk Route than today. 
These monuments to extravagance, grandiose ambition, and unrealized dreams were the handiwork of Turkmen President Sapa Murad Nizayov, who spends little of his country's dwindling finances on the upkeep of his country's 4.2 million people, but much on his thriving personality cult. But these desert mirages also represent the still unfulfilled hopes of Turkmenistan becoming, as Nizayov put it to me as early as December 1991, the new Kuwait. Since independence, Turkmenistan, like other oil-rich CARs, has waited in vain for its oil and gas riches to reach outside markets. Landlocked and surrounded by potentially jealous and hostile powers, Russia, Iran, Afghanistan, and Uzbekistan, the Central Asian states have maneuvered relentlessly for pipelines to be built that would end their isolation, free them from economic dependence on Russia. And earn hard currency to refloat their economies after the devastation wrought by the breakup of the Soviet Union. For seventy years, all their communication links, roads, railways, and pipelines were built heading east to Russia. Now they wanted to build links with the Arabian Sea, the Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean, and China. The energy resources of the Caspian Sea and Central Asia, which we shall now call the Caspian region. And includes Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and Uzbekistan, have been described with breathless hyperbole over the past few years. In the early 1990s, the USA estimated that Caspian oil reserves were between 100 to 150 billion barrels. That figure was highly inflated, and possible reserves are now estimated to be less than half that, or even as low as 50 billion barrels. The Caspian region's proven oil reserves are between 16 and 32 billion barrels, which compares to 22 billion barrels for the USA and 17 billion barrels for the North Sea, giving the Caspian 10 to 15 times less than the total reserves of the Middle East. Nevertheless, the Caspian represented possibly the last unexplored and unexploited oil-bearing region in the world, and its opening up generated huge excitement amongst international oil companies. Western oil companies have shifted their interest first to Western Siberia in 1991 to 92, then to Kazakhstan in 1993 to 94, Azerbaijan in 95 to 97, and finally Turkmenistan in 97 to 99. Between 1994 and 1998, 24 companies from 13 countries signed contracts in the Caspian region. Kazakhstan has the largest oil reserves, with an estimated 85 billion barrels, but only 10 to 6 billion barrel proven reserves. Azerbaijan has possible oil reserves of 27 billion barrels, and only 4 to 11 billion barrels proven reserves, while Turkmenistan has 32 billion possible oil reserves, but only 1.5 billion proven reserves. Uzbekistan's possible oil reserves are estimated at 1 billion barrels. Proven gas reserves in the Caspian region are estimated at 236 to 337 trillion cubic feet (TFCs), compared to reserves of 300 TFC in the USA. Turkmenistan has the 11th largest gas reserves in the world, with 159 TCF of possible gas reserves. Uzbekistan 110 TCF, Kazakhstan 88 TCF, while Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan have 35 TCF each. Central Asian leaders became obsessed with projected pipelines, potential routes, and the geopolitics that surrounded them. In 1996, the Caspian region produced one million barrels per day of oil, of which only 300,000 barrels a day was exported, mainly from Kazakhstan. However, only half that, 140,000 barrels a day, was exported outside the former Soviet Union. Caspian production still represented only about four percent of total world oil production. The region's natural gas production in 1996 totaled 3.3 TCF, but only 0.8 TCF was exported outside the former Soviet Union, mostly from Turkmenistan. There was an urgent, almost desperate need for pipelines. The scramble for oil and influence by the big powers in the Caspian has been likened to the Middle East in the 1920s. But Central Asia today is an even larger complex quagmire of competing interests. Big powers such as Russia, China, and the USA, the neighbors Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Turkey, the Central Asian states themselves, 
and the most powerful players of all, the oil companies, compete in what I called, in a 1997 seminal magazine article, the new great game. The name seemed to stick and was taken up by governments, experts and the oil companies. I had first visited Central Asia in 1989 during President Mikhail Gorbachev's perestroika reform program. Convinced that the ethnic issue in Afghanistan was going to become explosive after the withdrawal of Soviet troops, I wanted to understand the ethnic origins of the Afghan Uzbeks, Turkmens and Tajiks and see their original homelands. I returned to the region frequently, exploring the vast vistas and the ethnic and political soup in the region that became more complex and volatile as the Soviet Union fell apart. By chance, I was in Ashgabat, where the Central Asian leaders gathered on the 12th of December 1991 to discuss the dismemberment of the Soviet Union and their independence. They were all reluctant nationalists, full of fear at the prospects of losing the security and support of the Soviet state system and the prospects of facing the outside world on their own. Within a few months, as their economies crumbled, the importance of their oil resources and the need for pipelines became evident. They began to hold talks with Western oil companies, on the back of ongoing negotiations between Kazakhstan and the US company Chevron. My subsequent visits resulted in a book on Central Asia, but with Afghanistan disintegrating into civil war, I concluded that its repercussions would rebound on Central Asia and the issue of pipelines would determine the future geopolitics of the region. The label, The New Great Game, resonated with history. In the late 19th century, the British in India and Tsarist Russia fought an undeclared war of competition and influence to contain each other in Central Asia and Afghanistan. Turkestan, Afghanistan, Transcaspia, Persia. To many, these words breathe only a sense of utter remoteness or a memory of strange vicissitudes and of moribund romance. To me, I confess, they are pieces on a chessboard, upon which is being played out a game for the domination of the world, wrote Lord Curzon, before he became the Viceroy of India in 1898. These were expanding empires, the British pushing across India into Afghanistan and the Tsar's armies conquering Central Asia. The centre of gravity for both powers was Afghanistan. The British feared that a Russian thrust on Herat from the Turkmen region could threaten British Baluchistan, while Moscow Gold could turn Kabul's rulers against the British. The Russians feared that the British would undermine them in Central Asia by supporting revolts by the Muslim tribes and the rulers of Bukhara and Kokand. As it is today, the real battle was over communication links, as both empires indulged in massive railway projects. The Russians built railway lines across Central Asia to their borders with Afghanistan, Persia and China, while the British built railway lines across India to their border with Afghanistan. Today's great game is also between expanding and contracting empires. As a weakened and bankrupt Russia attempts to keep a grip on what it still views as its frontiers in Central Asia and control the flow of Caspian oil through pipelines that traverse Russia, the USA is thrusting itself into the region on the back of proposed oil pipelines which would bypass Russia. Iran, Turkey and Pakistan are building their own communication links with the region and want to be the preferred route of choice for future pipelines heading east, west or south. China wants to secure stability for its restive Xinjiang region, populated by the same Muslim ethnic groups that inhabit Central Asia, secure the necessary energy to fuel its rapid economic growth and expand its political influence in a critical border region. The Central Asian states have their own rivalries, preferences and strategic imperatives. Looming above this is the fierce competition between American, European and Asian oil companies. But, as in the 19th century, Afghanistan's instability and the advancing Taliban were creating a new dimension to this global rivalry and becoming a significant fulcrum for the new great game. The states and the companies had to decide whether to confront or woo the Taliban and whether the Taliban would impede or help pipelines from Central Asia to new markets in South Asia. Afghanistan had held Central Asia in a tight embrace for centuries. 
The territory comprising modern-day Tajikistan, southern Uzbekistan, and northern Afghanistan was one contiguous territory for centuries, ruled intermittently by amirs or kings in Bukhara or Kabul. The Amir of Bukhara depended on Afghan mercenaries for his army. Persecuted tribal chiefs, bandits, and mullahs sought sanctuary in each other's territories, crossing a non-existent border. Thus, Tajikistan's decision in 1997 to hand over the Kuliab Air Base in southern Tajikistan to Ahmed Shah Massoud so he could receive military supplies from Iran and Russia was but a continuation of these past linkages. Afghanistan's contiguity with Central Asia came to an end after the 1917 Russian Revolution when the Soviet Union sealed its borders with its southern Muslim neighbours. The reopening of these borders in 1991 heralded the start of the new great game. Afghanistan today borders Turkmenistan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, but only Turkmenistan has large energy resources. Along the Pamir Mountains, Tajikistan's five million people share a rugged 640-mile border with Afghanistan, which is divided by the Amu Darya River. A quarter of Afghanistan's population is Tajik. More Tajiks are scattered throughout the other CARs, and another 200,000 live in China's Xinjiang province. The only major ethnic group in Central Asia which is not of Turkic origin, the Tajiks are descended from the first Persian tribes who inhabited Central Asia between 1500 and 1000 BC, but were later pushed to the peripheries by a series of Turkic invasions from Mongolia. In ancient times, Tajikistan was the military and economic center of the region. It acted as a gateway for the Silk Route and for Turkic invaders who rode west into Iran, Russia and Europe, and south into Afghanistan and India. Russia annexed the northern part of present-day Tajikistan in 1868, and it became a part of the province of Russia-controlled Turkestan. As the Great Game intensified, the British and Russians demarcated the border between Afghanistan and Central Asia in 1884, when Russia annexed southern Tajikistan. After Stalin created the five CARs in 1924-25 by arbitrarily drawing lines on a map, he handed over Bukhara and Samarkand, the two major centers of Tajik culture and history, to Uzbekistan, creating a rivalry between the two republics, which has simmered ever since. Modern-day Tajikistan represents none of the population or economic centers of ancient Tajik glories. Stalin also created the autonomous region of gorno badakhshan in the Pamir Mountains, which contains 44% of the land area of Tajikistan, but only 3% of the population. While the Tajiks are Sunni Muslims, gorno badakhshan contains various Pamiri ethnic groups, many of whom are Shia Muslims. They include the Ismailis, a Shia sect and followers of the Aga Khan, who also inhabit the contiguous Badakhshan region of Afghanistan. A few months after the 1917 revolution, Muslim guerrilla groups sprang up across Central Asia to resist the Bolsheviks. These rebels were called Basmachis by the Bolsheviks, a derogative term meaning bandit. The movement stood for Islam, nationalism and anti-communism. Sixty years later, the same inspiration motivated the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Determined to undermine Soviet power, the British helped the Basmachis in 1919 by paying Kabul's rulers to send camel caravans of arms and ammunition to the Basmachis. Thousands of Tajik Basmachis took refuge in northern Afghanistan as their struggle continued until 1929, when they were finally crushed by the Bolsheviks. In another replay in the 1980s, the USA encouraged the Afghan Mujahideen to cross into Central Asia and attack Soviet army posts. And in reply, Soviet troops in Afghanistan frequently called the Mujahideen Basmachis. Tajikistan remained an underdeveloped, poverty-stricken republic on the Soviet Union's periphery. Its budget depended on subsidies from Moscow. After 1991, tensions between Uzbeks and Tajiks and intra-clan rivalries within the Tajiks erupted. The resulting civil war, 1992-97, between the neo-communist government and an array of Islamicist forces, devastated the country. 
Once again, thousands of Tajik rebels and refugees found refuge in northern Afghanistan, while Tajik government forces were backed by Russian troops. President Boris Yeltsin declared in 1993 that the Tajik-Afghan border was in effect Russia's border, and the 25,000 Russian troops stationed there would be defending Russia. It was a reassertion of Moscow's role in Central Asia. Ultimately, the neo-communist government and the Islamicist opposition in Tajikistan agreed to a UN-brokered peace settlement. But neither side had been able to promote a national identity for the fragmented Tajik clans. These internal cleavages, and the fact that it lacked an indigenous intelligentsia to elaborate a nationalism linking the people to the land and each other, left the country vulnerable to influences from Afghanistan. Both sides in the civil war eventually cooperated with Massoud, who to many Tajiks became a symbol of Tajik nationalism as he battled the Taliban. The Taliban added to Massoud's image by accusing him of trying to divide Afghanistan and create a greater Tajikistan by joining Afghanistan's Badakhshan province with Tajikistan. Massoud denies such aims. For Tajikistan, the Taliban represented an Islamic fundamentalism at odds with the moderate Sufi spiritualism of Central Asia, while Pashtun expansionism was at direct odds with Tajik aspirations. In Uzbekistan, Islamic militancy, partly fueled by Afghanistan, is the most serious challenge to President Islam Karimov. The Uzbeks, the most numerous, aggressive and influential race in the region, occupy today's Islamic heartland and the political nerve centre of Central Asia. Uzbekistan has borders with all the CARs and Afghanistan. Its principal cities of Samarkand and Bukhara have played host to countless civilizations over 2,500 years and became the second center for Islamic learning after Arabia. Medieval Bukhara contained 360 mosques and 130 madrasas, and even in 1900 there were 10,000 students studying at 100 active madrasas. The 250-mile-long Fegana Valley, with its long associations with Islamic learning and militancy, such as the Basmachis, is the richest agricultural region in Central Asia and the centre of Islamic opposition to Karimov. The Uzbeks trace their genealogy to Genghis Khan's Mongols, one branch of which, the Shebani clan, conquered modern-day Uzbekistan and northern Afghanistan in 1500. Mahmud ibn Wali, a 16th-century historian, described the early Uzbeks as famed for their bad nature, swiftness, audacity and boldness, and reveling in their outlaw image. Little has changed in the Uzbek desire for power and influence since then. Uzbekistan is the largest CAR, with a population of 22 million. And with some six million Uzbeks living in the other CARs, forming substantial minorities in three of them, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan, Karimov has ethnic allies to pursue his agenda of dominating the region. Some two million Uzbeks live in northern Afghanistan, the result of migrations before and during the Basmachi Rebellion. Another 25,000 Uzbeks live in China's Xinjiang province. Well before Soviet troops withdrew from Afghanistan, Moscow and Tashkent were cultivating Afghan Uzbeks to create a secular Uzbek-controlled cordon sanitaire in northern Afghanistan that would resist any Mujahideen takeover. For nearly a decade, that policy was successful. General Rashid Dostum controlled six provinces and, with military aid from Moscow and Tashkent, held off the Mujahideen and later the Taliban. Karimov, meanwhile, led the attempt to forge an anti-Taliban alliance amongst the CARs and Russia after 1994. However, with the fall of Mazar in 1998, Karimov's policy collapsed, and the Taliban were now Uzbekistan's immediate neighbours. Since then, Uzbekistan's influence in Afghanistan has waned considerably, as Karimov was unwilling to back Massoud, a Tajik. Karimov has also tried unsuccessfully at throwing his weight around in Tajikistan, where 24% of the population is Uzbek. In 1992, Karimov gave military support to the Tajik government in its crackdown on Islamic rebels. By 1996, when peace talks were underway between the antagonists, 
Karimov attempted to force both sides to give a greater role to the Uzbek minority by supporting local Uzbek uprisings in northern Tajikistan. Karimov remains opposed to the Tajik attempt to make a coalition administration between the government and the rebels because it would show the Islamicists in a good light, a lesson that would percolate down to Uzbekistan's own frustrated population. Karimov runs a tightly controlled authoritarian police state and cites the civil wars in Afghanistan and Tajikistan as justification for repression at home. The most significant opposition to Karimov has come from underground radical Islamic groups, some of them Wahhabis, entrenched in the Fergana Valley. Many of these Uzbek militants studied secretly in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan or trained in Afghan Mujahideen camps in the 1980s. Subsequently, they developed links with the Taliban. Karimov has passed the most stringent laws of all the CARs against Islamic fundamentalism, from restricting madrasa education to the growth of beards, and has blamed all unrest on the Wahhabis, a blanket term which Uzbek authorities increasingly use to describe all Islamic activism. But with half of Uzbekistan's population under 18 years of age and widespread unemployment and inflation, unrest among Uzbek youth is growing. The social and economic dissatisfaction amongst young people is unrecognized by the regime. Even though Uzbekistan may be the most powerful state in Central Asia, it faces the most intense political and religious polarization. Karimov's failed forays into Afghanistan and Tajikistan have only encouraged Islamic militancy. Nevertheless, Uzbekistan is a major player in the new great game. It produces sufficient oil and gas for domestic consumption and will soon be an exporter. Initially, Uzbekistan was ignored by the oil companies who scrambled to sign contracts with Tashkent's neighbors. Karimov was both jealous and envious of their success in attracting foreign investment, even as he refused to loosen state controls on the economy to attract Western investors. As Tashkent becomes an energy exporter, it will have a vested interest in trying to influence routes for pipelines that benefit Uzbekistan, but it will also act as a spoiler in its determination not to see its neighbours prosper and thus become more influential in the region. Afghanistan's 500,000 Turkmen population also arrived as a result of the 1920s civil war in the Soviet Union. The first migration into Afghanistan was by the Asari tribe in the early 19th century, who were followed by the Teke tribe after their revolt against the Bolsheviks failed. Turkmenistan is a desolate land of desert and mountains inhabited by the nomadic Turkmen tribes, who fiercely resisted, but eventually succumbed, to Persian, Turkic, and finally Russian conquerors. Before the 19th century, borders were meaningless for the Turkmen, who migrated freely across the region. Some 300,000 Turkmen still live in Iran, 170,000 in Iraq, 80,000 in Syria, and several thousand in Turkey. The Teke, the largest Turkmen tribe, began to resist Russian advances into their territory in 1870 and wiped out a Russian army at the oasis fort of Georg Tepe in 1881. 6,000 Turkmen horsemen were killed a year later by a Russian retaliatory force. In 1916, the Turkmen, under the charismatic leadership of Mohammad Kurban Junayed Khan, began another long and bloody resistance against first Tsarist Russia and then the Bolsheviks, which continued until his defeat in 1927, when he took refuge in Afghanistan. Throughout the Soviet era, Turkmenistan was ignored by Moscow. The Republic had the highest unemployment rate, the highest infant mortality rate, and the lowest industrialization of any Soviet Republic apart from Tajikistan. As Moscow invested in the oil and gas industry in Siberia, Turkmenistan's potential oil reserves were ignored. Nevertheless, 47% of Turkmenistan's revenue in 1989 came from the sale of 3.2 TCF of natural gas to other Soviet republics. The breakup of the Soviet Union turned Turkmenistan's customers into impoverished independent states who could not pay their bills. We have no idea now who will buy our gas and how they will pay for it, 
Foreign Minister Avde Kuliev told me in December 1991. Turkmenistan's dilemma was that it was sandwiched between Iran, which was unacceptable to the USA as a pipeline route, Afghanistan, which was trapped in civil war, and Russia, which wanted to limit Turkmenistan's gas exports to the West because they competed with Russia's own exports of Siberian gas. By 1992, Ukraine, Armenia, and then even Russia refused to pay their bills for Turkmen gas imports. Moscow had a stranglehold, as all Turkmen gas was pumped through the vast former Soviet pipeline network that was now owned by Russia. President Niyazov shut down gas supplies to his neighbors after Turkmenistan accumulated over one billion U.S. dollars in unpaid bills, and Turkmen gas production slipped to 0.73 TCF in 1994, less than a quarter of what it was five years earlier. Although the USA was determined to isolate Iran, Turkmenistan could not afford to do so, as Iran offered the nearest and most accessible outlet to the south and the sea. Adroitly, Niyazov wooed the USA while seeking Tehran's help in developing road and rail links. In December 1997, the Iranians completed construction of a 119-mile-long gas pipeline between the Korpeje gas field in western Turkmenistan and Kort Kui in northern eastern Iran. The Turkmen gas that flows through it is consumed in northern Iran. This pipeline is still the only new pipeline built between Central Asia and the outside world after nearly a decade of trying. Niyazov also courted Western oil companies to build gas pipelines that would free him from the Russian pipeline network. In April 1992, Turkmenistan, Turkey and Iran agreed to build a gas pipeline to Turkey and on to Europe, which would cost 2.5 billion US dollars. That pipeline never got built and subsequently saw several variations as the U.S. tried to block any route through Iran. Finally, in February 1999, Turkmenistan signed another agreement, this time with a U.S. consortium, to build a Turkmenistan-Turkey gas pipeline which would go under the Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan and avoid Iran. As Niyazov saw his economy crumble, he sought alternative export routes. On the drawing boards in 1994 were plans for a 5,000-mile-long oil and gas pipeline eastwards to China that would cost over 20 billion U.S. dollars, but the project is still only in the feasibility stage. Also in 1994, Bridas, the Argentinian oil company which had concessions in Turkmenistan, proposed building a gas pipeline that would cross Afghanistan and deliver gas to Pakistan and India. The U.S. company Unical, with support from Washington, proposed a similar pipeline in 1995. The battle between the two companies to build this pipeline, which is explored in the next two chapters, sucked in the Taliban and the other Afghan warlords. Thus, Afghanistan became the fulcrum of the first battle of the new great game. Weak and impoverished, and with no military force to defend its long borders with Iran, Afghanistan and its rival Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan opted for a foreign policy of neutrality. This gave the Turkmens the justification to keep their distance from Russia and avoid being sucked into the economic and military pacts that arose out of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Neutrality also allowed Ashgabat to avoid taking sides in the Afghan conflict, which angered Moscow and Tashkent, as Turkmenistan refused to join the anti-Taliban alliance. Ashgabat had provided the communist regime in Afghanistan with diesel fuel until Kabul fell in 1992. It proceeded to do the same for Ismail Khan, who controlled Herat until 1995, and later the Taliban. While the Turkmen consulate in Herat maintained good relations with the Taliban, its consulate in Mazar did the same with the anti-Taliban alliance. Turkmenistan was the only CAR that wooed the Taliban rather than confronted them. Like his Central Asian counterparts, Niyazov was a severe autocratic ruler, allowing no political opposition, censoring the media, and maintaining state control over the economy. He developed a crude personality cult in the Stalinist mode, with his portraits and statues on display everywhere. 
An entire government department was set up to disseminate the president's pictures. Niazov, like his rival Karimov, was an orphan. Both were brought up in communist orphanages and joined their respective communist parties at an early age, rising to become secretary-general well before independence. Their education, upbringing, and loyalties lay with the defunct communist system, but they both learned to play the new great game with skill. No country in the region has benefited more from the breakup of the Soviet Union than Turkey. Russia has been Turkey's most potent enemy for centuries. From the late 17th century to World War I, Turkey and Russia fought over a dozen wars, and this rivalry had prompted Turkey to join NATO and try and become a member of the EU. However, the independence of the CARs suddenly awakened Turkey to its much older historical legacy. Until 1991, Pan-Turkism, the idea of a Turkic homeland stretching from the Mediterranean to China, was a romantic dream espoused by a few Turkish scholars and barely figured in Turkey's foreign policy agenda. Suddenly, after 1991, Pan-Turkism became an achievable reality and an integral part of Turkey's foreign policy. Turkish dialects were now spoken by an accessible and vast contiguous belt that stretched from Istanbul across the Caucasus and Central Asia to Xinjiang in China. The CAR saw Turkey as a model for their economic development, Muslim but secular, while Turkey desired to expand its influence in the region and become a major player on the world stage. Turkey began to send massive aid to the CARs and the Caucasus, starting direct flights to their capitals, beaming TV programs by a satellite, offering thousands of scholarships to students, training their diplomats, soldiers and bankers, and initiating an annual Pan-Turkic summit. Between 1992 and 1998, Turkish companies invested more than 1.5 billion US dollars in the region, becoming the single largest state investor. Turkey also realized that to be effective in Central Asia, it had to placate Russia, which it did by buying Russian gas and expanding trade with Russia, which rose from 1.9 billion US dollars in 1990 to 4.1 billion in 1997. In 1997, the EU's rejection of Turkey's membership angered the Turks, but also pushed them into forging closer ties with the USA, Russia, Israel and Central Asia. Turkey has become a major player in the new great game. Its need for energy and desire to expand its influence prompted successive Turkish governments to push for becoming the principal route for Central Asian energy exports. In the summer of 1997, the USA and Turkey jointly sponsored the idea of a transportation corridor for a main oil pipeline from Baku in Azerbaijan through Georgia and the Caucasus to Turkey's Jehan port on the Mediterranean. Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan would be encouraged to feed their oil into this pipeline. This, the USA argued, would give the expensive and lengthy baku jehan route the necessary oil volumes to make the project financially viable. The USA wanted Turkmenistan to build a gas pipeline under the Caspian Sea, which would then run along the baku jehan corridor to Europe. The USA also urged Kazakhstan to commit to building a similar under-the-sea Caspian oil pipeline so that Kazakh oil could be pumped along the baku jehan corridor. Kazakhstan's vast oil reserves were being exploited by two major Western oil consortiums in Tengiz and Karagnak, while China was developing a third oil-bearing region around Uzen. Kazakhstan already had one planned oil pipeline route from Tengiz to the Russian port of Novorossiysk on the Black Sea, which was being developed by Chevron, but the baku jehan route would offer an alternative that avoided Russia. The Azerbaijan International Operating Company, the AIOC, made up of nearly a dozen of the world's oil companies and which dominated Azerbaijan's oil development, was averse to the baku jehan route because it was too expensive, too long, and would cross Turkey's volatile Kurdish region. By 1998, it was clear that U.S. plans to develop the Afghanistan route would be delayed, 
and so the Baku Jehan corridor became the main plank of Washington's policy towards the Caspian region. The controversy over Baku Jehan raged on for two years until late 1998, when international oil prices crashed because of the slump in demand due to the Asian economic crisis. Oil prices sank to a record low of 13 US dollars a barrel compared to 25 dollars in 1997 making it uneconomical to immediately exploit Central Asian oil, which was both expensive to produce and transport. The break-even price for Central Asian oil was around 18 US dollars a barrel. Even though the Baku-Jehan route was no longer viable commercially, Washington continued to pursue its construction as it became the main plank of US policy in Central Asia. Turkey had backed the Afghan Mujahideen in the 1980s, but its role remained limited. However, as it developed a pan-Turkic foreign policy, Ankara began to actively support the Turkic minorities in Afghanistan, such as the Uzbeks. Ankara provided financial support to General Dostum and twice gave him a home in exile. Turkey became vehemently opposed to the Taliban, which had created new tensions with its close ally Pakistan. Moreover, the Taliban threat had also pushed Turkey into a greater understanding with its regional rival Iran. Turkey also played a role in turning around Israel's policy in Afghanistan. Turkey and Israel had developed close military and strategic ties after the 1993 Oslo Accords. The Israelis, and more significantly some Jewish lobbies in the USA, were not initially critical of the Taliban. In line with the U.S. State Department, Israel saw the Taliban as an anti-Iranian force which could be used to undermine Iranian influence in Afghanistan and Central Asia. Moreover, the Unical pipeline across Afghanistan would impede Iran from developing its own pipelines from Central Asia. Israel's intelligence agency, Mossad, developed a dialogue with the Taliban through Taliban liaison offices in the USA and with the oil companies. Pakistan's ISI supported this dialogue. Even though Pakistan did not recognize Israel, the ISI had developed links through the CIA with Mossad during the Afghan Jihad. With initial support from Turkey, Israel also developed close diplomatic and economic links with Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Israeli companies invested in agriculture, the oil industry, and communications. But as U.S. policy towards the Taliban shifted, so did Israel's, as the Taliban gave refuge to bin Laden and encouraged the drugs trade. Turkey convinced Israel that the Taliban were a security threat to the region and could export Islamic fundamentalism to Central Asia. As the Unical project evaporated, and Israel realized the aversion its Central Asian allies and Turkey had towards the Taliban, Mossad opened contacts with the anti-Taliban alliance. Israel now had an interest in seeing that the Taliban did not take control of the whole of Afghanistan, even though it remained suspicious of Ahmad Shah Massoud's support from Iran. Both the Taliban and the Northern Alliance were to accuse each other of receiving Israeli support. With oil prices crashing in 1999, Iran remained the wild card in the new great game. Iran sits on the second largest gas reserves in the world and has over 93 billion barrels of proven oil reserves, with current oil production at 3.6 million barrels a day. As pipeline projects waned due to low oil prices, Iran stepped in to urge the CARs to export their oil through a direct north-south pipeline to the Gulf via Iran. This could be built at a fraction of the cost of new pipelines across Turkey, because Iran already had an extensive pipeline network and only needed to add pipeline spurs to connect Iran with Azerbaijan. The Iranian route for Central Asian oil is the safest, most economic and easiest. The total cost for Iran would be 300,000 US dollars. How does that compare with 3 billion US dollars for a pipeline through Turkey? Ali Majida, Iran's deputy minister of oil, said in Tehran. Moreover, Iran was also in competition with Turkmenistan to build a gas export pipeline to India and Pakistan, a much more attractive route because it would avoid Afghanistan.
In the first phase of its program, Iran proposed swapping its crude oil with Central Asian crude. Since 1998, crude from Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan has been transported across the Caspian Sea to Iran's Caspian port of Neca, where it is refined and consumed in Iran. In exchange, Iran allowed companies to lift oil from Iranian ports on the Gulf. With pipeline projects indefinitely delayed, this appeal to the oil companies, who, despite U.S. pressure not to do so, began to negotiate further swaps with Iran. Two U.S. companies, Chevron and Mobil, who have oil concessions in Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, applied to the Clinton administration in May 1998 for a license to carry out swaps with Iran, a move that created a major policy headache for Washington and would become a test case for the future of U.S. sanctions against Iran. Ultimately, the security needed to build pipelines from Central Asia to South Asia rested on ending the Afghan civil war. The CARs have two problems with Afghanistan. One is fear and the other is opportunity, the UN mediator for Afghanistan, Lakhda Brahimi, told me. Fear is the realization by these new and still fragile countries that the Afghan conflict cannot be contained forever within its borders. Either it is resolved or it will spill over into the CARs, they want to avoid adventures of any kind from Kabul, be it Islamic fundamentalism, terrorism or drugs. The opportunity is that as landlocked countries who want to break their dependence on Russia, they're looking south for oil and gas pipelines and communication routes. They want a government in Kabul which is responsible and is a good neighbor. They want to open their borders, not close them, Brahimi added. Despite declining oil prices and Russia's desperate economic plight, the battle of wills between the USA and Russia will dominate future pipeline competition. Russia remains adamant in keeping the USA out of its Central Asian backyard. We cannot help seeing the uproar stirred up in some Western countries over the energy resources of the Caspian. Some seek to exclude Russia from the game and undermine its interests. The so-called pipeline war in the region is part of this game, said President Boris Yeltsin in 1998. By keeping the conflict in Afghanistan on the boil, Russia keeps the region unstable and has the excuse to maintain a military presence in the CARs. The U.S. now wants stability, for it is concerned about the repercussions of the continuing Afghan war on its own policies in Central Asia. Throughout Central Asia, leaders are on edge about instability in Afghanistan and Tajikistan. They fear an expansion of Iranian influence and the rise of violent extremism in their countries, said Stephen Sestanovich, special advisor to the U.S. State Department on the states of the former Soviet Union, in March 1999. Only an end to the Afghan civil war would give the CARs and oil companies the confidence to go ahead with pipeline projects to South Asia, and that does not appear likely any time soon. Chapter 12. Romancing the Taliban 1. The Battle for Pipelines, 1994-96. to Carlos Bulgaroni was the Taliban's first introduction to the outside world of high finance, oil politics, and the new great game. An Argentinian and chairman of Bridas, he visualized connecting his company's gas fields in Turkmenistan to Pakistan and India, thereby creating a swath of infrastructure connections that could allow peace to break out in Afghanistan and even between India and Pakistan. Like American and British oil magnates in the early part of the century, who saw the oil business as an extension of global politics and thereby demanded the right to influence foreign policy, Bulgaroni was a man possessed by an idea. Between 1995 and 1996, he left his business in South America and spent nine months in his executive jet flying from warlord to warlord in Afghanistan and to Islamabad, Ashgabat, Moscow and Washington to convince leaders that his pipeline was a realistic possibility. Those around him were equally driven, if not by the same dream, then by the workaholic Bulgaroni. Bulgaroni is descended from a close-knit family of Italian immigrants to Argentina. Charming, erudite, a philosopher, captain of industry, 
He could talk for hours about the collapse of Russia, the future of the oil industry, or Islamic fundamentalism. His father, Alejandro Ankale, had set up Bridas in 1948 as a small service company for Argentina's new oil industry. Carlos and his brother Alejandro Bulgeroni, who was vice chairman of Bridas, took the company international in 1978, and Bridas became the third largest independent oil and gas company in Latin America. But until Turkmenistan, Bridas had no experience of operating in Asia. What had brought these Argentinians halfway across the world to ride around Afghanistan? After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Bridas had first ventured into western Siberia. But there were too many problems there with pipelines and taxes, so we arrived in Turkmenistan when it opened up, Bulgaroni told me in the only interview he has given on Bridas's role in Afghanistan. In 1991, Bridas took a huge risk when it became the first Western company to bid for leases in Turkmenistan. At the time, Western oil companies called the decision crazy. Turkmenistan was distant, landlocked, and had passed no legislation to protect foreign investors. Other oil companies shied away from Turkmenistan because they thought it a gas place and had no idea where to market it, said Bulgaroni. Our experience in discovering gas and transporting it through cross-border pipelines to multiple markets in Latin America convinced me that the same could be done in Turkmenistan. President Niazov was flattered by the attention Bulgaroni paid him when no other Western oil executive even appeared at his door, and the two men struck up a warm friendship. In January 1992, Bridas was awarded the Yashla block in eastern Turkmenistan, close to the Afghan border and northeast of the massive Daulatabad gas field discovered by the Soviets. A year later, in February 1993, Bridas was awarded the Kemir block in the west of the country near the Caspian Sea. As the first and only entrant to Turkmenistan, Bridas received favourable terms, a 50-50 split in profits in Yashlar and a 75-25 split in profits in Bridas' favour in Kemir. We wanted to develop new oil and gas deposits because then Russia could not object to new fines as they would if we just developed old Soviet-era fields, said Bulgaroni. Bridas invested some 400 million U.S. dollars in exploring its leases, a staggering sum in those early days for a small oil company where not even the oil majors were involved in Central Asia. Bridas began to export oil from its Kemir field in 1994, with production rising to 16,800 barrels a day. Then in July 1995, in the hot, arid Karakum Desert, Bridas struck gold, a massive new gas field at Yashla, with estimated reserves of 27 trillion cubic feet, more than double Pakistan's total gas reserves. Unlike oil, gas needs an immediate accessible market, so we set about devising one, said José Luis Sureda, Bridas' gas transportation manager, a tough, stout engineer who was to crisscross Afghanistan in the months ahead, surveying possible routes. After discovering Yashlar, we wanted part of the gas to go north through old Russian pipelines, but we wanted to find alternative markets, and these were either China or South Asia, said Bulgaroni. A pipeline through Afghanistan could become a peacemaking business, difficult but possible, he added. In November 1994, just as the Taliban captured Kandahar, Bulgaroni persuaded Niazov to set up a working group to study the feasibility of a gas pipeline through Afghanistan to Pakistan. Four months later, he had persuaded Pakistan's Prime Minister, Benazir Bhutto, to join forces with Niazov. On the 16th of March 1995, Pakistan and Turkmenistan signed a memorandum allowing Bridas to prepare a pre-feasibility study of the proposed pipeline. This pipeline will be Pakistan's gateway to Central Asia. It will open up huge possibilities, Bhutto's husband, Azif Zardari, told me. Zardari said the Taliban's control of the pipeline route made the pipeline viable. Behind the desk in his office, Zardari had a huge map of the route, which he proudly pointed to. 
By now, the Pakistani military and the ISI were backing the Taliban to open up a southern transportation route via Kandahar and Herat to Turkmenistan. At the same time, Pakistan was also negotiating with Qatar and Iran to obtain gas supplies through two separate pipelines. But in geostrategic terms, with Islamabad's abiding interests in Afghanistan and Central Asia, the Bridas proposal offered the greatest opportunities. Bridas proposed building an 870-mile-long pipeline from its Yashlar field, crossing southern Afghanistan to Sui in Baluchistan province, where Pakistan's gas reserves and pipeline network originates. The pipeline could later be extended to the even bigger market of India via Multan. Bridas proposed an open-access pipeline so that other companies and countries could eventually feed their own gas into it. This was particularly appealing to the Afghan warlords, as Afghanistan had gas fields in the north, which once supplied Uzbekistan but had been shut down. Bulgaroni arrived to woo the Afghan warlords. I met with all the leaders, Ismail Khan in Herat, Burhanuddin Rabani and Masood in Kabul, Dostum in Mazar and the Taliban in Kandahar. I was very well received everywhere because the Afghans understood they needed to rebuild the country and they needed foreign investment, said Bulgaroni. By February 1996, Bulgaroni reported to Bhutto and Niazov that agreements have been reached and signed with the warlords which assure us a right of way. That month, Bulgaroni signed a 30-year agreement with the Afghan government, then headed by President Burhanuddin Rabani, for the construction and operation of a gas pipeline by Bridas and an international consortium which it would create. Bridas opened negotiations with other oil companies, including Unical, the 12th largest oil company in the USA, which had considerable experience in Asia and had been involved in Pakistan since 1976. Turkmen officials had met with Unical for the first time in Houston in April 1995 on an invitation from Bridas, and a Unical delegation had visited Ashgabad and Islamabad, apparently to discuss joining Bridas to build the pipeline. But Bridas was now facing major problems in Turkmenistan. Niazov had been convinced by his advisers that Bridas was exploiting Turkmenistan, and in September 1994, the government blocked oil exports from Kemir and demanded a renegotiation of its contract with Bridas. By January 1995, the issue appeared to be resolved when Bridas agreed to reduce its take by 10% to 65%. When Bridas discovered gas at Yashlar, Niazov and his aides refused to join Bridas' celebrations and instead demanded to renegotiate both the Lashla and Kemir contracts once again. Niazov stopped Bridas from developing the Ashla field and again stopped its oil exports from Kemir. This time, Bridas said it would not budge from the original contracts, which Turkmenistan was obliged to respect. Niazov was a communist-style dictator who had little understanding of or interest in international law and contracts. But there were other reasons for Niazov to turn the screws on Bridas at that precise moment. With Unical expressing interest in building its own pipeline, using Turkmenistan's existing gas fields at Daulatabad, the profit of which would all accrue to Turkmenistan, Niazov saw that Unical could become the means to engage a major U.S. company and the Clinton administration in Turkmenistan's development. Niazov needed the Americans and began an intensive dialogue with U.S. diplomats. The Americans needed to support him if they were to prevent him from becoming dependent on Iran. Niazov visited the UN and summoned both Bridas and Unical to New York. There, on the 21st of October 1995, in front of shocked Bridas executives, Niazov signed an agreement with Unical and its partner, the Saudi Arabia-owned Delta Oil Company, to build a gas pipeline through Afghanistan. We were shocked and when we spoke to Niazov, he just turned around and said, Why don't you build a second pipeline? said a Bridas executive. Looking on at the signing ceremony was Henry Kissinger, the former U.S. Secretary of State and then a consultant for Unical. As Kissinger pondered a route through Afghanistan, he quipped that the deal looked like the triumph of hope over experience. However, Bridas was not about to give up.
and the first battle of the new great game had begun. We are just an oil company trying to develop a country's resources, but we got involved in somebody else's great game, where the big powers are battering each other. Ario Lopez Olasi Regul, Bridas's managing director, said later. Unical proposed a gas pipeline from Dalautabad, with gas reserves of 25 trillion cubic feet, to Multan in central Pakistan. Unical set up the Cent Gas Consortium, holding a 70% stake, giving Delta 15%, Russia's state-owned gas company Gazprom 10%, and the state-owned company Turkmen Rosgas 5%. Unical signed a second, even more ambitious agreement with wide appeal across the region. Unical's Central Asian Oil Pipeline Project, CAOPP, envisaged a 1,050-mile oil pipeline from Charjou in Turkmenistan to an oil terminal on Pakistan's coast, delivering one million barrels a day of oil for export. Existing Soviet-era oil pipelines from Sirgut and Omsk in Russia's Siberian fields to Chimkent in Kazakhstan and Bukhara in Uzbekistan could feed into CAOPP, delivering oil from all of Central Asia to Karachi. The strategy is to take advantage of the extensive existing pipeline network to extend the entire regional system to the coast, allowing producers of Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan to access the growing markets of Asia. There would be a commerce corridor across Central Asia, said Robert Todor, Unical's executive vice president. To avoid a repetition of Chevron's problems with Russia in Kazakhstan, Unical wooed Moscow from the start. Russia's Siberian oil would have a new southern outlet to the sea, while Gazprom had a stake in the gas pipeline. We don't have a Russian problem, just an Afghan problem. For everyone, it's a win-win situation, Henry de la Rosa, Unical's manager in Turkmenistan, told me. The Clinton administration and Unical's sudden interest in Turkmenistan and Afghanistan was not accidental. It was preceded by a significant change in U.S. policy towards Central Asia. Between 1991 and 1995, Washington had strategically supported Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan as the two states which would swiftly bring about economic and political liberalization, thereby making it easier for U.S. companies to invest there. Kazakhstan still held nuclear weapons left over from the Soviet era, and with huge oil, gas and mineral reserves, Kazakh President Nur Sultan Nazarbayev was personally courted by Presidents Bush and Clinton. But by 1995, Nazarbayev was increasingly seen as a failure, as massive corruption riddled his administration and he became increasingly dictatorial. Kazakhstan had surrendered its nuclear weapons to Russia by 1993, and with 40% of its population made up of ethnic Russians who were openly hostile to the government, Nazarbayev was forced to bend to Russia's security and economic demands. For four years, Kazakhstan was unable to persuade Russia to allow Chevron to transport Tengiz oil through Russian pipelines to Europe. A frustrated Chevron, which in 1991 had promised to invest five billion U.S. dollars in Tengiz, had cut back its commitment and had invested only seven hundred million dollars by 1995. During this period, 1991 to 95, the USA ignored Tajikistan, which was involved in a civil war while Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, ruled by two dictators, were considered beyond the pale by the U.S. State Department. Moreover, with the Russo-centric Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbot in the driving seat of U.S. policy towards the FSU, Washington was not keen to antagonize Moscow and challenge its abiding interests in Central Asia. Talbot's agenda was to enlist Russia in NATO and not create problems in U.S.-Russia relations by encroaching on Russia's backyard. However, as Russia slipped into chaos, Talbot's pro-Russian policy came under bitter attack from within the U.S. foreign policy establishment, the Jewish and Israeli lobbies in Washington, and U.S. oil companies, who all wanted the U.S. to embrace a more multidimensional foreign policy towards the FSU one that would allow them to exploit the Caspian's resources, help the Caspian states assert their independence from Russia, and enlist them in the Western camp. 
U.S. oil companies, who had spearheaded the first U.S. forays into the region, now wanted a greater say in U.S. policymaking. In early 1995, major U.S. oil companies formed a private foreign oil companies group in Washington to further their interest in the Caspian. The group included Unical, and they set about hiring former politicians from the Bush and Carter era to lobby their case in Washington. The group met with Sheila Heslin, the energy expert at the National Security Council, the NSC, and later in the summer of 1995, with her boss, the NSC advisor Samuel Berger. Berger had set up an interagency government committee on formulating policy towards the Caspian, which included several government departments and the CIA. The strategic interest of Washington and the U.S. oil companies in the Caspian was growing, and Washington began to snub Russia. The immediate beneficiaries were Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. Washington had scotched one attempt by U.S. lobbyists to promote Niyazov. In March 1993, a former NSC adviser, Alexander Haig, had been hired by Niyazov and brought him to Washington to try and persuade U.S. companies to invest in Turkmenistan and soften the U.S. position on pipelines through Iran. The visit was a failure, and Niyazov was unable to meet U.S. leaders. But by 1995. Washington realized that if it kept Niyazov at arm's length, he would have no choice but to fall back on Iran. Turkmenistan's economic plight was worsening due to its inability to sell its gas. For the USA, the prospects of a gas pipeline through Afghanistan were not only attractive because it avoided Iran, but it would signal support to Turkmenistan, Pakistan, and the Taliban, while clearly snubbing Russia and Iran. The USA could not develop strategic clout in Central Asia without Uzbekistan, the largest and most powerful state, and the only one capable of standing up to Russia. Both cautiously wooed each other. Karimov became supportive of NATO plans to build a Central Asian NATO battalion, a move that was vehemently opposed by Russia. We don't accept NATO in our backyard. The U.S. must recognize that Central Asia will remain within the near abroad Russia sphere of influence. An angry Russian diplomat told me in Ashgabat in 1997. U.S. companies took an interest in Uzbekistan's mineral deposits, and trade between Uzbekistan and the U.S.A. suddenly blossomed, increasing by eight times between 1995 and 1997. Karimov made his first trip to Washington in June 1996. By late 1995, the West and most notably the U.S. had clearly chosen Uzbekistan as the only viable counterweight both to renewed Russian hegemonism and to Iranian influence. Wrote Dr. Shirin Hunter. Thus, there were the makings of two coalitions emerging in the region. The U.S. lining up alongside Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Azerbaijan, and encouraging its allies, Israel, Turkey, and Pakistan, to invest there, while Russia retained its grip on Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. The U.S. was now prepared to confront Russia as the battle for the Caspian resources escalated. While U.S. policymakers certainly do not want to see a hegemonic Russia. The potential costs of such hegemony become far greater if Russia is able to dictate the terms and limit Western access to the world's last known oil and gas reserves. Even minimum U.S. involvement here provides for maximum Russian suspicion," said Dr. Martha Brill Olcott, a leading U.S. academic on Central Asia. I did not begin to investigate this unfolding story until the summer of 1996. The sudden capture of Kabul by the Taliban in September 1996 prompted me to try and unravel two unanswered questions, which many Western journalists were grappling with but failed to answer: Were the Americans supporting the Taliban, either directly or indirectly through Unical or their allies Pakistan and Saudi Arabia? And what was prompting this massive regional polarization? Between the USA, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and the Taliban on one side, and Iran, Russia, the Central Asian states, and the anti-Taliban alliance on the other. While some focused on whether there was a revival of the old CIA-ISI connection from the Afghan jihad era, 
It became apparent to me that the strategy over pipelines had become the driving force behind Washington's interest in the Taliban, which in turn was prompting a counter-reaction from Russia and Iran. But exploring this was like entering a labyrinth where nobody spoke the truth or divulged their real motives or interests. It was the job of a detective rather than a journalist, because there were few clues. Even gaining access to the real players in the game was difficult, because policy was not being driven by politicians and diplomats, but by the secretive oil companies and intelligence services of the regional states. The oil companies were the most secretive of all, a legacy of the fierce competition they indulged in around the world. To spell out where they would drill next, or which pipeline route they favoured, or even whom they had lunch with an hour earlier, was giving the game away to the enemy, rival oil companies. Bredos executives never spoke to the press, and only issued very occasional statements from a discreet public relations company in London. Unocal was more approachable, but their executives were primed to give bland answers which gave nothing away. But there was a marked difference between the two companies, which was to affect their future relations with the Taliban. Breeders was a small family company whose executives, brought up in the European tradition, were interested in the politics, culture, history and the personal relations of where and with whom they were dealing. Breeders' executives were knowledgeable about all the convolutions of the game, and they took the trouble to explore the ethnic, tribal and family linkages of the leaders they were meeting. Unical was a huge corporation which hired executives to run its global oil business. Those sent out to the region were, with a few exceptions, interested in the job rather than the political environment they were living in. While breeders' engineers would spend hours sipping tea with Afghan tribesmen in the desert as they explored routes, Unical would fly in and out and take for granted what they were told by the notoriously fickle Afghan warlords. Afghans had long ago mastered the art of telling an interlocutor what he wanted to hear, and then saying exactly the opposite to their next guest. Unical was also at a disadvantage because its policy towards the Taliban did not deviate from the U.S. line, and consequently Unical lectured the Taliban on what they should be doing. Breeders had no such compunctions and was ready to sign a deal with the Taliban, even though they were not recognized as the legitimate government by any state. Unocal tended to depend more on the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad and Pakistani and Turkmen intelligence for information on what was happening or about to happen, rather than gathering their own information. As my stories were published on the Bredas unocal rivalry and the twists and turns of the new great game, both companies at first thought I was a spy secretly working for the other company. Unocal persisted in this belief, even after Breeders had realized that I was just a very curious journalist who had covered Afghanistan far too long to be satisfied with bland statements. It took me seven months of traveling, over one hundred interviews, and total immersion in the literature of the oil business, of which I knew nothing, to eventually write the cover story for the Far Eastern Economic Review, which appeared in April 1997. In July 1997, Strobe Talbot gave a speech that was to become the benchmark for U.S. policy in the region. It has been fashionable to proclaim, or at least to predict, a replay of the great game in the Caucasus and Central Asia. The implication, of course, is that the driving dynamic of the region, fueled and lubricated by oil, will be the competition of the great powers. Our goal is to avoid and actively to discourage that atavistic outcome. Let's leave Rudyard Kipling and George MacDonald Fraser where they belong on the shelves of history. The great game, which starred Kipling's Kim and Fraser's Flashman, was very much of the zero-sum variety. But Talbot also knew the game was on, and issued a grim warning to its players, even as he declared that Washington's top priority was conflict resolution. If internal and cross-border conflicts simmer and flare... The region could become a breeding ground of terrorism, a hotbed of religious and political extremism, and a battleground for outright war. On the ground, Niazov's decision to sign with Unical infuriated Bulgaroni. 
in February 1996, he moved to the courts, filing a case against Unical and Delta in Fort Bend County near Houston, Texas. Breeders demanded 15 billion U.S. dollars in damages, alleging tortuous interference with prospective business relations, and that Unical, Delta, and Unical Vice President Marty Miller, and possibly others, engaged in a civil conspiracy against Breeders. In its court deposition, Breeders said it had disclosed to Miller its strategic planning for the pipeline construction and operation. Breeders invited Unical to consider joining a joint venture arrangement. In short, Breeders charged Unical with stealing its idea. Later, Bulgaroni explained how he felt. Unical came to this region because we invited them. There was no reason why we and Unical could not get together. We wanted them in and took them with us to Turkmenistan, he told me. In the beginning, the U.S. considered this pipeline a ridiculous idea, and they were not interested in either Afghanistan or Turkmenistan, he added. Breeders also began arbitration against Turkmenistan with the International Chamber of Commerce for breach of contract in three separate cases regarding Turkmenistan's blockade of its Yashlar and Kemir fields. Unical maintained that its proposal was different because it involved Daulautabad rather than Yashlar gas field. In a letter later submitted to court, John Imley, president of Unical, had written to Bulgaroni saying that Turkmenistan had told him that the government had no agreements with Breeders, so Unical was free to do what it liked. We maintain that the scent gas project was separate and unique from Breeders. We were proposing to purchase gas from existing natural gas reserves and to transport the gas through an export gas pipeline. Breeders was proposing to transport gas from their Yashlar field. The scent gas project does not prevent Breeders from developing a pipeline to transport and market its own gas, said Imley. The Clinton administration now weighed in on behalf of Unical. In March 1996, the U.S. ambassador to Pakistan, Tom Simmons, had a major row with Bhutto when he asked her to switch Pakistan's support from Breeders to Unical. Bhutto supported Breeders, and Simmons accused Bhutto of extortion when she defended Breeders. She was furious with Simmons, said a senior aide to Bhutto present in the meeting. Bhutto demanded a written apology from Simmons, which she got, added a cabinet minister. During two trips to Pakistan and Afghanistan in April and August 1996, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia, Robin Raffel, also spoke in favour of the Unical project. We have an American company which is interested in building a pipeline from Turkmenistan through to Pakistan, said Rafael at a press conference in Islamabad on the 21st of April 1996. This pipeline project will be very good for Turkmenistan, for Pakistan and for Afghanistan, as it will not only offer job opportunities but also energy in Afghanistan, she added. In August, Rafael visited Central Asian capitals and Moscow, where she pitched the same message. Open U.S. support for the Unical project aroused an already suspicious Russia and Iran, which became even more convinced that the CIA was backing the Taliban. In December 1996, a senior Iranian diplomat told me in hushed tones that the Saudis and the CIA had channeled two million USA dollars to the Taliban, even though there was no evidence for such suspicions. But accusations multiplied on all fronts after the USA and Unical committed several blunders. When the Taliban captured Kabul in September 1996, Chris Taggart, a Unical executive, told wire agencies that the pipeline project would be easier to implement now that the Taliban had captured Kabul, a statement that Unical quickly retracted because it implied that Unical favoured a Taliban conquest. Just a few weeks earlier, Unical had announced it would give humanitarian aid as bonuses to the Afghan warlords once they agreed to form a joint council to supervise the pipeline project. Again, the implication was that Unical was ready to dish out money to the warlords. Then, within hours of Kabul's capture by the Taliban, the U.S. State Department announced it would establish diplomatic relations with the Taliban by sending an official to Kabul, an announcement it also quickly retracted. 
State Department spokesman Glyn Davies said the U.S. found nothing objectionable in the steps taken by the Taliban to impose Islamic law. He described the Taliban as anti-modern rather than anti-Western. U.S. congressmen weighed in on the side of the Taliban. The good part of what has happened is that one of the factions at last seems capable of developing a government in Afghanistan, said Senator Hank Brown, a supporter of the UNICAL project. Embarrassed U.S. diplomats later explained to me that the over-hasty U.S. statement was made without consulting the U.S. embassy in Islamabad. But the damage done was enormous. UNICAL's gaffes and the confusion in the State Department only further convinced Iran, Russia, the CARs, the anti-Taliban alliance, and most Pakistanis and Afghans that the U.S. UNICAL partnership was backing the Taliban and wanted an all-out Taliban victory even as the U.S. and UNICAL claimed they had no favourites in Afghanistan. Some Pakistani cabinet ministers, anxious to show that the USA supported the Taliban and Pakistan's stance, leaked to Pakistani journalists that Washington backed the Taliban. The entire region was full of rumours and speculation. Even the ever-neutral wire agencies weighed in with their suspicions. Certainly, the Taliban appeared to serve the U.S. policy of isolating Iran by creating a firmly Sunni buffer on Iran's border and potentially providing security for trade routes and pipelines that would break Iran's monopoly on Central Asia's southern trade routes, wrote Reuters. Breeders still faced an uphill climb to ensure that they were still in the race. Its gas and oil fields in Turkmenistan were blocked, it had no agreement with Turkmenistan to buy gas for a pipeline and none with Pakistan to sell gas. With U.S. and Pakistani support, the Taliban were now being courted by UNICAL. Nevertheless, Breeders continued to maintain its offices in Ashgabat and Kabul, even though Niazov was trying to force them out. Breeders is out. We've given the Afghan pipeline to UNICAL. Our government does not work with Breeders anymore. Murad Najdanov, Turkmen Minister for Oil and Gas, told me in Ashgabat. Breeders had one advantage with the Taliban. Breeders told them it did not need to raise finances for the project through international lending institutions, which would first demand an internationally recognized government in Kabul. Instead, Breeders had set up TAP Pipelines, a 50-50 partnership with the Saudi company Ningacho, which was extremely close to Prince Turkey, the Saudi intelligence chief. Breeders said it could raise 50% of the funding from the Saudis to build the Afghan portion of the pipeline and the rest from an international consortium it would put together, which would build the less risky Pakistan and Turkmenistan ends of the pipeline. We will do a complete separation between our problems with the Turkmenistan government and the Afghan pipeline contract, we will make two consortiums, one to build the Afghan line and one to build the Pakistan and Turkmenistan ends of the line, said a Breeders executive. Breeders was thus offering to start work on the pipeline immediately without preconditions. It only needed some agreement between the Afghan factions. But even that was to remain unobtainable. On the other hand, UNICAL's position was closely linked to U.S. policy on Afghanistan that it would not construct the pipeline or discuss commercial terms with the Taliban until there was a recognized government in Kabul, so that the World Bank and others could lend money for the project. We made it clear to all parties from the beginning that the ability to obtain financing for the project was critical, that the Afghan factions would have to get together and develop a functioning government that was recognized by lending institutions before the project could succeed, said John Imley. UNICAL's real influence with the Taliban was that their project carried the possibility of U.S. recognition, which the Taliban were desperately anxious to secure. Both Breeders and UNICAL now courted regional powers with influence over the Taliban, particularly the Saudis. In their discussions with the Taliban, Breeders made much of their strong links to Prince Turkey. The Saudis had many years of investment in the Afghan Jihad, and they really thought this pipeline would help the peace process, said Bulgaroni. Not to be outdone, UNICAL had their own Saudi connection. Delta Oil's president, Badra al is close to the Saudi royal family, 
particularly to Crown Prince Abdullah in Abdul Aziz, while Badra's brother Mosayed Al-Aiban was a member of King Fahd's court. Thus the competition between Unical and Breeders also reflected competition within the Saudi royal family. The USA and UNICAL had also won over Pakistan. After the dismissal of the Bhutto government in 1996, the newly elected Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, his oil minister Chowdhury Nisar Ali Khan, the army and the ISI fully backed UNICAL. Pakistan wanted more direct US support for the Taliban and urged UNICAL to start construction quickly in order to legitimize the Taliban. Basically, the USA and UNICAL accepted the ISI's analysis and aims that a Taliban victory in Afghanistan would make UNICAL's job much easier and quicken U.S. recognition. Apart from wanting U.S. recognition for the Taliban, Pakistan also desperately needed new sources of gas supply. Gas accounts for 37% of Pakistan's energy consumption, and the largest fields at Sui in Baluchistan were running out. Pakistan's proven gas reserves of 22 trillion cubic feet faced current consumption of 0.7 trillion cubic feet per year and an annual increase in demand of another 0.7 TCF per year. By 2010, Pakistan would face an annual 0.8 TCF per year shortfall in gas. Islamabad's other options, a gas pipeline from Iran or one from Qatar, were stalled for lack of funding. Pakistan was also desperate for assured supplies of cheaper oil. In 1996, it imported two billion U.S. dollars worth of oil, equivalent to 20% of its total imports. Domestic oil production had dropped from 70,000 barrels a day in the early 1990s to just 58,000 barrels a day in 1997. The proposed Unical oil pipeline would not only supply Pakistan, but also turn the country into a major hub for Central Asian oil exports to Asian markets. President Niyazov also wanted UNICAL to start construction immediately and urged Pakistan to force the Taliban to accept the UNICAL proposal. Niyazov's wooing of the US began to pay dividends. In January 1997, Turkmenistan signed an agreement with the US oil giant Mobil and Monument Oil of Britain to explore for oil over a large tract of western Turkmenistan. It was the first oil contract Turkmenistan had signed with a major U.S. company, as Unical had still made no direct investment in Turkmenistan. In November 1996, Breeders said it had signed an agreement with the Taliban and General Dostum to build the pipeline, while Burhanuddin Rabani had already agreed. That panicked Unical and Pakistan. On the 9th of December 1996, Pakistan's Foreign Secretary Najmuddin Sheikh visited Mullah Omar in Kandahar to persuade him to accept the Unical proposal, but Omar gave no firm commitment. In the classic Afghan manner, the Taliban played their cards adroitly, remaining elusive and non committal, thereby forcing both Unical and Breedas to up their bids. The Taliban were not just interested in receiving rent for the pipeline route, which could be 100 million US dollars a year, but also to involve the oil companies in building roads, water supplies, telephone lines and electricity power lines. Privately, several Taliban leaders said that they preferred Breedus, because Breedus made no demands upon them, while Unical was urging them to improve their human rights image and to open talks with the anti-Taliban alliance the main plank of U.S. policy. Moreover, UNICAL was facing the growing feminist movement in the U.S., which demanded that the USA and UNICAL suspend negotiations with the Taliban. The UN was also critical. The outside interference in Afghanistan is now all related to the battle for oil and gas pipelines. The fear is that these companies and regional powers are just renting the Taliban for their own purposes, Yasuki Akashi, the UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, told me. Both companies insisted that their pipeline would bring peace, but no Western bank would finance a pipeline in a country at war with itself. The players in the game of pipeline politics must remind themselves that peace can bring a pipeline, 
that a pipeline cannot bring peace, said Robert A. Bell. The great game had entered a new dimension. Chapter 13. Romancing the Taliban 2. The Battle for Pipelines and the USA and the Taliban, 1997-99. The attractive, mini-skirted Argentinian secretaries at Breeders' headquarters in Buenos Aires had been told to cover up long dresses and long-sleeved blouses to show as little of their limbs as possible. A Taliban delegation was expected in Buenos Aires. When they arrived in February 1997, Breeders treated them royally, taking them sightseeing, flying them across the country to see Breeders' drilling operations and gas pipelines, and visiting the icy, snow-capped southern tip of the continent. At the same time, another Taliban delegation was experiencing a different kind of culture shock. They were in Washington, where they met with State Department officials and UNICAL, and lobbied for U.S. recognition for their government. On their return, the two delegations stopped off in Saudi Arabia, visiting Mecca and meeting with the Saudi intelligence chief, Prince Turkey. The Taliban said they'd not yet decided which companies offer to accept. They'd quickly learned how to play the great game from all angles. Both companies stepped up their efforts to woo the Taliban. Breeders received a boost in January 1997 when the International Chamber of Commerce issued an interim court order telling Turkmenistan to allow Breeders to resume its oil exports from the Kamir field, but President Niyazov ignored the decision, refusing to compromise with Breeders. In March 1997, Breeders opened an office in Kabul and Bulgaroni arrived to meet Taliban leaders. Breeders actually began to negotiate a contract with the Taliban. It took weeks of painstaking work through the summer for three Breeders executives to negotiate the 150-page document with 12 Taliban mullahs, who had no technical experts amongst them, apart from an engineering graduate who had never practised engineering. The Taliban had no oil and gas experts, and few who spoke adequate English, so the contract was translated into diary. We're going through it line by line, so that nobody can accuse us of trying to dupe the Taliban. We will get the same contract approved by the opposition group, so it will be an all-Afghan agreement, a senior Bridas executive told me. Unical had declined to negotiate a contract until there was a recognised government in Kabul. Meanwhile, Unical had donated 900,000 US dollars to the Centre of Afghanistan Studies at the University of Omaha, Nebraska, which was headed by Thomas Gutierre, a veteran Afghanistan academic. The centre set up a training and humanitarian aid programme for the Afghans, opening a school in Kandahar, which was run by Gerald Boardman, who in the 1980s had run the Peshawar office of the U.S. Agency for International Development, providing cross-border assistance to the Mujahideen. The school began to train some 400 Afghan teachers, electricians, carpenters and pipe fitters to help Unical lay the pipeline. Unical gave the Taliban other gifts, such as a fax and a generator, which caused a scandal when the story broke later in the year. Whatever Unical gave to the Taliban only further convinced the anti-Taliban alliance and Iran and Russia that the company was funding the Taliban. Unical vehemently denied the charges. Later, Unical specified to me what it had spent on the project. We have estimated that we spent approximately 15 to 20 million dollars on the scent gas project. This included humanitarian aid for earthquake relief, job skill training, and some new equipment like a fax machine and a generator, Unical's president John Imley told me in 1999. Delta's role also increased external suspicions. Initially, Unical had encouraged Delta Oil, with its Saudi origins and Taliban contacts, to woo the Afghan factions. Rather than hiring eminent Saudis to do the job, Delta had an American, Charles Santos, to liaise with the Afghans. Santos had worked on and off for the UN mediation effort for Afghanistan since 1988, despite criticism from two subsequent UN mediators that he was too close to the US government and had a personal agenda. Santos had become the political advisor to the UN mediator Mehmud Mestiri, 
who led the disastrous UN mediation effort in 1995 when the Taliban were at the gates of Kabul. Santos was already intensely disliked by all the Afghan leaders, especially the Taliban, when Delta hired him, and nobody trusted him. It was a mistake, and Unical later regretted the decision, after Santos failed to make any headway with the Afghans, despite repeated trips into the country. As tensions developed between Unical and Delta, because of Delta's inability to woo the Afghans, Unical set up its own team of experts to advise the company on Afghanistan. It hired Robert Oakley, the former U.S. ambassador to Pakistan and later the U.S. special envoy to Somalia. Oakley had played a critical role in providing U.S. support to the Mujahideen in the 1980s, but that did not endear him to the Afghans, as the USA subsequently walked away from Afghanistan. Many Afghans and Pakistanis considered him arrogant and overbearing. His nickname in Islamabad, during his tenure as ambassador, was the Viceroy. Oakley travelled to Moscow and Islamabad to win support for the project and helped Unical hire other experts. These include Gutier, Boardman, Zalme Khalilzad, an Afghan-American who worked for the Rand Corporation, and the Central Asian expert Martha Brill Olcott. For a U.S. corporation to hire ex-U.S. government officials or academics was not unusual. All the U.S. oil companies playing the great game were doing the same in order to lobby Washington, and they were hiring even bigger names from the Reagan and Bush administrations than Unical was. But this was not understood in the region and was viewed with enormous suspicion, reinforcing speculation that Unical was a policy arm of the U.S. government, and that the 1980s network of U.S. CIA Afghan experts was being revived. Unocal now also faced immense problems with President Niazov, who was as far removed from reality as ever. Refusing to accept the problems posed by the constant fighting in Afghanistan, he urged Unocal to start work as quickly as possible, when his terrified foreign ministry officials tried to explain that construction could not start in the middle of a civil war, he would shout them down. We want the pipeline. We link all of our largest projects to peace and stability in Afghanistan, Niazov told me angrily. Subsequently, Turkmen officials were too afraid to even inform their boss of the bad news from the Afghan front, and Niazov became more isolated from reality. Despite these problems, Unical pushed ahead. In May 1997, at an annual regional summit in Ashgabad, Pakistan, Turkmenistan and Unical signed an agreement which committed Unical to raising the finances and reaching financial closure for the project by December 1997, starting construction by early 1998. The USA and Turkmenistan had been informed by the ISI that the Taliban were on the verge of capturing the northern opposition stronghold of mazar -e sharif However, two weeks later, the Taliban were driven out of Mazar with hundreds of casualties, and fighting intensified across Afghanistan. Once again, over-dependence on ISI analysis had embarrassed the U.S. At the first meeting of the Scent Gas Working Group in Islamabad, after the debacle in Mazar, Unical Vice President Marty Miller expressed grave doubts that Unical could meet its December 1997 deadline. It's uncertain when this project will start. It depends on peace in Afghanistan and a government we can work with. That may be the end of this year, next year or three years from now. Or well, this may be a dry hole if the fighting continues, Miller told a press conference on the 5th of June 1997. Pakistan and Turkmenistan were forced to sign a new contract with Unical, extending the company's deadline by another year to start the project by December 1998. To most observers, even that was considered overly optimistic. By now there was growing scepticism in Washington that Pakistan and the Taliban could deliver a unified Afghanistan. As a result, the USA began to explore other options to help Turkmenistan deliver its gas. In a dramatic reversal of policy, the USA announced in July 1997 that it would not object to a Turkmenistan-Turkey gas pipeline which would cross Iran. 
Washington maintained that its decision was not a U-turn on its sanctions regime against Iran. Nevertheless, as European and Asian oil companies scrambled to enter the Iranian market, U.S. companies saw a window of opportunity and intensified pressure on the Clinton administration to ease U.S. sanctions on Tehran. The opportunity to transport Caspian oil and gas through Iran made an unpredictable Afghan pipeline even less viable. Washington's decision came as a blow to UNICAL and a sharp reminder to Islamabad that U.S. support was fickle at the best of times and that time was running out for the Taliban to unify the country through conquest. Moreover, Iran and Australia's BHP Petroleum announced they would sponsor a 2.7 billion U.S. dollar, 1,600 mile long Iran-Pakistan gas pipeline that would deliver 2 billion cubic feet per day of gas from southern Iran to Karachi and later to India. The advantage of this pipeline, which was in direct competition to UNICAL, was that it would run through territory not devastated by a civil war. On the 16th of October 1997, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif paid a one-day visit to Ashgabat to talk to Niazov about the UNICAL project. As a result, UNICAL, Pakistan and Turkmenistan signed a tentative pricing agreement for the import of Turkmen gas, in which the Taliban were given 15 cents per 1,000 cubic feet as a transit fee for the pipeline across their territory. By now, there was an air of distinct unreality surrounding the decisions by Sharif and Niazov, who were ignoring the fighting. The Taliban were incensed because they were not consulted about the gas price, and they demanded a larger transit fee. Unical Company announced an enlarged scent gas consortium on the 25th of October 1997, which included oil companies from Japan, South Korea, and Pakistan. However, Unical's attempt to woo the Russians had failed, Although 10% shares in scent gas were reserved for Gazprom, the Russian gas giant refused to sign, as Moscow criticized U.S. sponsorship of the Taliban and the undermining of Russian influence in Central Asia. Gazprom's chief executive, Rem Vyakirov, declared that Russia would not allow Turkmenistan or Kazakhstan to export its oil and gas through non-Russian pipelines. To give up one's market would be at the very least a crime before Russia, Vyakirov said. U.S. officials had already made their anti-Russia policy clear. U.S. policy was to promote the rapid development of Caspian energy. We did so specifically to promote the independence of these oil-rich countries to, in essence, break Russia's monopoly control over the transportation of oil from that region and, frankly, to promote Western energy security through diversification of supply, said Sheila Heslin, the energy expert at the NSC. Breedus remained in the running, this time with a powerful partner which even Washington could not object to. In September 1997, Breeders sold 60% of its company's stake in Latin America to the U.S. oil giant Amoco, raising the possibility that Amoco could influence Niazov to ease off on Breeders' frozen assets in Turkmenistan. Breeders invited a Taliban delegation headed by Mullah Ahmed Jan, the former carpet dealer and now Minister for Industries, to Buenos Aires for a second visit in September. Pakistani authorities refused to let the Taliban fly out from Peshawar until they'd also agreed to visit Unical. Another Taliban delegation, headed by the one-eyed Mullah Mohammed Gauss, arrived in Houston to meet with Unical in November 1997, where they were put up in a five-star hotel, visited the zoo, supermarkets and the NASA Space Center. They had dinner at the home of Marty Miller, admiring his swimming pool and large, comfortable house. The Taliban met with officials at the State Department, where, once again, they asked for U.S. recognition. After the winter lull in Afghanistan, fresh fighting broke out in the spring of 1998, and for both companies the project appeared as distant as ever. In March, Marty Miller said in Ashgabat that the project was on indefinite hold because it was not possible to finance while the war continued. As Niazov fumed with impatience, Unical asked for another extension beyond December 1998 to reach financial closure. Unical was also facing increasing problems at home. At its annual shareholders' meeting in June 1998, some shareholders objected to the project because of the Taliban's treatment of Afghan women. American feminist groups began to muster American public support against the Taliban and UNICAL. 
Throughout 1998, the feminist pressure on UNICAL intensified. In September 1998, a group of green activists asked California's Attorney General to dissolve UNICAL for crimes against humanity and the environment and because of UNICAL's relations with the Taliban. UNICAL described the charges as ludicrous. UNICAL first attempted to counter the feminists and then became distant in trying to answer their charges. It was a losing battle because these were American women and not foreigners, wanting answers to an issue that the Clinton administration now supported. We disagree with some U.S. feminist groups on how UNICAL should respond to this issue. We are guests in countries who have sovereign rights and their own political, social and religious beliefs. No company, including ours, can solve these issues alone. Walking away from Afghanistan, either from the pipeline project or our humanitarian projects, would not help solve the problem, said John Imley. The U.S. bombing of bin Laden's camps in August 1998 forced UNICAL to pull out its staff from Pakistan and Kandahar, and finally, in December 1998, it formally withdrew from the Scent Gas Consortium, which it had struggled so hard to set up. The plunge in world oil prices, which had hit the world's oil industry, also hit UNICAL hard. UNICAL withdrew from a pipeline project in Turkey, closed its offices in Pakistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, and announced a 40% drop in its capital spending plan for 1999 due to low oil prices. UNICAL's only victory in these difficult days was over Breedas. On the 5th of October 1998, the Texas District Court dismissed Breedus's 15 billion U.S. dollar suit against UNICAL on the grounds that the dispute was governed by the laws of Turkmenistan and Afghanistan, not Texas law. With the USA now preoccupied with capturing bin Laden, it seemed for the moment that one phase of the great game was now over. It was clear that no U.S. company could build an Afghan pipeline with issues such as the Taliban's gender policy, bin Laden, and the continuing fighting. That should have been clearer to UNICAL much earlier on, but it never was, as the Taliban and Pakistan kept promising them a quick victory. Breedus remained in the running, but kept a low profile during the following difficult months. Even though the project was all but over, Pakistan persisted in trying to keep it alive. In April 1999, at a meeting in Islamabad, Pakistan, Turkmenistan and the Taliban tried to revive the project and said they would look for a new sponsor for scent gas. But by now, nobody wanted to touch Afghanistan and the Taliban, and foreign investors were staying clear of Pakistan. U.S. strategy in Central Asia was a cluster of confusions, according to Paul Starobin, and arrogant, muddled, naive and dangerous, according to Martha Brill Olcott. Author Robert Kaplan described the region as a frontier of anarchy. Yet the USA, now fervently rooting for the baku Jehan pipeline, despite crashing oil prices and a refusal by oil companies to invest, persisted in the belief that pipelines could be built without a strategic vision or conflict resolution in the region. After providing billions of dollars worth of arms and ammunition to the Mujahideen, the USA began to walk away from the Afghan issue after Soviet troops completed their withdrawal in 1989. That walk became a run in 1992 after the fall of Kabul. Washington allowed its allies in the region, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, free reign to sort out the ensuing Afghan civil war. For ordinary Afghans, the U.S. withdrawal from the scene constituted a major betrayal, while Washington's refusal to harness international pressure to help broker a settlement between the warlords was considered a double betrayal. Other Afghans were furious at the USA for allowing Pakistan a free hand in Afghanistan. The U.S. strategic absence allowed all the regional powers, including the newly independent Central Asian republics, to prop up competing warlords, thereby intensifying the civil war and guaranteeing its prolongation. The pipeline of U.S. military aid to the Mujahideen was never replaced by a pipeline of international humanitarian aid that could have been an inducement for the warlords to make peace and rebuild the country. After the end of the Cold War, Washington's policy to the Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Central Asia region was stymied by the lack of a strategic framework. The USA dealt with issues as they came up in a haphazard piecemeal fashion, rather than applying a coherent strategic vision to the region. 
There are several distinct phases of U.S. policy towards the Taliban, which were driven by domestic American politics or attempted quick-fix solutions rather than a strategic policy. Between 1994 and 1996, the USA supported the Taliban politically through its allies Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, essentially because Washington viewed the Taliban as anti-Iranian, anti-Shia, and pro-Western. The USA conveniently ignored the Taliban's own Islamic fundamentalist agenda, its suppression of women, and the consternation they created in Central Asia, largely because Washington was not interested in the larger picture. Between 1995 and 1997, U.S. support was even more driven because of its backing for the Unical project. Even though at the time the USA had no strategic plan towards accessing Central Asian energy, and thought that pipelines could be built without resolutions to regional civil wars, the U.S. policy turnaround from late 1997 to today was first driven exclusively by the effective campaign of American feminists against the Taliban. As always with the Clinton agenda, domestic political concerns outweighed foreign policy making and the wishes of allies. Clinton only woke up to the Afghanistan problem when American women knocked on his door. President and Mrs. Clinton had relied heavily on the American female vote in the 1996 elections, and on female support during the Monica Lewinsky saga. They could not afford to annoy liberal American women. Moreover, once Hollywood got involved. Its liberal stars were key financiers and supporters of the Clinton campaign, and Vice President Albert Gore was anxious to retain their support for his own election bid. There was no way the U.S. could be seen as soft on the Taliban. In 1998 and 1999, the Taliban's support for Bin Laden, their refusal to endorse the Unical project or compromise with their opponents, and the new moderate government in Iran, provided additional reasons for the USA to get tough with the Taliban. In 1999, getting Bin Laden was Washington's primary policy objective, even as it ignored the new Islamic radicalism Afghanistan was fostering, which would in time only throw up dozens more Bin Ladens. Nevertheless, late as it was, for the first time the USA was genuinely on the peace train and gave full support to UN mediation efforts to end the war. U.S. policy has been too preoccupied with wrong assumptions. When I first spoke to diplomats at the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad after the Taliban emerged in 1994, they were enthusiastic. The Taliban had told the stream of U.S. diplomats who visited Kandahar that they disliked Iran, that they would curb poppy cultivation and heroin production, that they were opposed to all outsiders remaining in Afghanistan, including the Arab Afghans, and they had no desire to seize power or rule the country. Some U.S. diplomats saw them as messianic do-gooders, like born-again Christians from the American Bible Belt. U.S. diplomats believed that the Taliban would meet essential U.S. aims in Afghanistan, eliminating drugs and thugs. One diplomat said, "It was a patently naive hope, given the Taliban's social base, and because they themselves did not know what they represented nor whether they wanted state power." There was not a word of U.S. criticism. After the Taliban captured Herat in 1995 and threw out thousands of girls from schools, in fact, the USA, along with Pakistan's ISI, considered Herat's fall as a help to Unical and tightening the noose around Iran. Washington's aim of using the Taliban to blockade Iran was equally short-sighted because it was to pitch Iran against Pakistan, Sunni against Shia, and Pashtun against non-Pashtun. Whatever the merits of the isolation policy towards Iran in the fight against terrorism, they incapacitate the U.S. in Afghanistan," wrote Barnett Rubin. Iran, already paranoid about CIA plots to undermine it, went into overdrive to demonstrate CIA support for the Taliban while stepping up its own arming of the anti-Taliban alliance. U.S. policy is forcing us to join Russia and the anti-Taliban alliance against Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the Taliban. An Iranian diplomat said, "Some U.S. diplomats, concerned with the lack of direction in Washington on Afghanistan, have admitted that there was no coherent U.S. policy except to go along with what Pakistan and Saudi Arabia wanted." In a confidential 1996 State Department memo written just before the Taliban captured Kabul, parts of which I read. 
Analysts wrote that if the Taliban expanded, Russia, India, and Iran would support the anti-Taliban alliance, and the war would continue. That the USA would be torn between supporting its old ally Pakistan and trying to prevent antagonizing India and Russia, with whom the USA was trying to improve relations. In such a situation, the State Department surmised, the USA could not hope to have a coherent policy towards Afghanistan. In a U.S. election year, a coherent Afghan policy was not particularly necessary either. There was another problem. Few in Washington were interested in Afghanistan. Robin Raphael, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia and the key policymaker for Washington's Afghan policy at the time, privately admitted that there was little interest in her initiatives on Afghanistan higher up the chain of command in Washington. Secretary of State Warren Christopher never mentioned Afghanistan once during his entire tenure. Raphael's attempts to float the idea of an international arms embargo on Afghanistan through the UN Security Council drew little support from the White House. In May 1996, she managed to push through a debate on Afghanistan in the UN Security Council, the first in six years. And in June, Senator Hank Brown, with support from Raphael, held Senate hearings on Afghanistan and conducted a three-day conference in Washington between leaders of the Afghan factions and U.S. legislators, which UNICAL helped fund. Rafael recognized the dangers emanating from Afghanistan. In May 1996, she told the U.S. Senate, Afghanistan has become a conduit for drugs, crime and terrorism that can undermine Pakistan, the neighboring Central Asian states, and have an impact beyond Europe and Russia. She said extremist training camps in Afghanistan were exporting terrorism. But Rafael's perseverance turned into patchwork diplomacy because it was not underpinned by a serious U.S. commitment towards the region. When the Taliban captured Kabul in September 1996, the CIA, again encouraged by ISI analysis, considered that a Taliban conquest of the country was now possible and that the UNICAL project could reach fruition. The USA was silent on the Taliban's repression of Kabul's women and the dramatic escalation in fighting, and in November, Rafael urged all states to engage the Taliban and not isolate them. The Taliban control more than two-thirds of the country. They are Afghan. They are indigenous. They've demonstrated staying power. The real source of their success has been the willingness of many Afghans, particularly Pashtuns, to tacitly trade unending fighting and chaos for a measure of peace and security, even with severe social restrictions, said Rafael. It is not in the interests of Afghanistan or any of us here that the Taliban be isolated, she added. Several concerned American commentators noted the inconsistency of U.S. policy at the time. The U.S., although vocal against the ongoing human rights violations, has not spelled out a clear policy towards the country and has not taken a strong and forthright public stand against the interference in Afghanistan by its friends and erstwhile allies, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, whose aid, financial and otherwise, enabled the Taliban to capture Kabul. The U.S. and UNICAL wanted to believe that the Taliban would win and went along with Pakistan's analysis that they would. The most naive U.S. policymakers hoped that the Taliban would emulate U.S.-Saudi Arabia relations in the 1920s. The Taliban will probably develop like the Saudis did. There will be a Ramco, pipelines, an emir, no parliament, and lots of Sharia law. We can live with that, said one U.S. diplomat. Given their suspicions, it was not unexpected that the anti-Taliban alliance, Iran and Russia, should view the UNICAL project as an arm of U.S. CIA foreign policy and as the key to U.S. support for the Taliban. UNICAL's links with the U.S. government became a subject of massive speculation. U.S. commentator Richard McKenzie wrote that UNICAL was being regularly briefed by the CIA and the ISI. UNICAL neither admitted nor denied receiving State Department support, as any U.S. company would have in a foreign country, but it denied links with the CIA. Since UNICAL was the only U.S. company involved in the Scent Gas Consortium, State Department support for that route became, de facto, support for Scent Gas and UNICAL. At the same time, UNICAL's policy of political neutrality 
was well known to the U.S. government, Unical President John Imley told me. Unical's failure was that it never developed a relationship with the Afghan factions, which were independent of the U.S. and Pakistan governments. There was a bigger problem. Until July 1997, when Strobe Talbot made his speech in Washington, the USA had no strategic plan for accessing Central Asia's energy. U.S. oil companies were faced with what they could not do, rather than what they could do, since they were forbidden to build pipelines through Iran and Russia. When Washington finally articulated its policy of a transport corridor from the Caspian to Turkey, avoiding Russia and Iran, the oil companies were reluctant to oblige, given the costs and the turbulence in the region. The essential issue, which the USA declined to tackle, was peacemaking in the region. Until there was an end to the civil wars in Central Asia and the Caspian, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Georgia, Chechnya, Nagorno-Karabakh, the Kurdish issue, and there was a broad consensus with Iran and Russia, pipelines would neither be safe to build nor commercially feasible, as every step of the way Iran and Russia would block or even sabotage them. It was in the interest of Iran and Russia to keep the region unstable by arming the anti-Taliban alliance so that U.S. pipeline plans could never succeed. Even today, the USA is muddled on the critical question of whether it wants to save Central Asia's depressed economies by letting them export energy any way they like, or to keep Iran and Russia under blockade as far as pipelines are concerned. The USA and UNICAL were essentially faced with a simple question in Afghanistan. Was it preferable to rely on Pakistan and Saudi Arabia to deliver the Taliban and obtain a temporary Afghan consensus in the old-fashioned way by reconquering the country? Or was it preferable for the USA to engage in peacemaking and bring the Afghan ethnic groups and factions together to form a broad-based government which might ensure lasting stability? Although Washington's broad-brush policy was to support a widely-based multi-ethnic government in Kabul, the USA for a time believed in the Taliban, and when it ceased to do so, it was not willing to rein in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Although there was no CIA budget for providing arms and ammunitions to the Taliban, and UNICAL did not channel military support to the Taliban, the USA did support the Taliban through its traditional allies Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, accepting their provision of arms and funding to the Taliban. The U.S. acquiesced in supporting the Taliban because of our links to the Pakistan and Saudi governments who backed them, but we no longer do so, and we have told them categorically that we need a settlement, the highest-ranking U.S. diplomat dealing with Afghanistan said in 1998. In Washington, it was perhaps not so much a covert policy as no policy. A covert policy involves planning, funding, and taking decisions, but there was no such process taking place at the highest levels in Washington on Afghanistan. Washington's change of heart over the Taliban in late 1997 also arose because of the deteriorating political and economic crisis in Pakistan. U.S. officials began to voice fears that the drugs, terrorism and Islamic fundamentalist threat which the Taliban posed could overwhelm its old and now decidedly fragile ally Pakistan. The USA warned Pakistan of the increasing dangers it faced, but became frustrated with the ISI's refusal to pressurize the Taliban to be more flexible on the political and gender fronts. The first public expression of the U.S. change was made by Secretary of State Madeleine Albright when she visited Islamabad in November 1997. On the steps of Pakistan's foreign office, she called the Taliban despicable for their gender policies. Inside, she warned Pakistani officials that Pakistan was becoming isolated in Central Asia, which weakened U.S. leverage in the region. But the Sharif regime remained at odds with itself, wanting to become an energy conduit for Central Asia, wanting peace in Afghanistan, but insisting this would be best achieved by a Taliban victory. Pakistan could not have a Taliban victory, access to Central Asia, friendship with Iran, and an end to bin Laden-style terrorism all at the same time. It was a self-defeating, deluded and contradictory policy, which Pakistan refused even to acknowledge. The shift in U.S. policy was also because of major changes in Washington. The doer, hapless Warren Christopher was replaced by Albright as Secretary of State in early 1997, 
Her own experience as a child in Central Europe ensured that human rights would figure prominently on her agenda. A new team of U.S. diplomats began to deal with Afghanistan in both Washington and Islamabad, and the new U.S. Assistant Secretary for South Asia, Carl Inderfirth, knew Afghanistan as a former journalist and was much closer to Albright than Rafael was to Christopher. Albright's private criticism of Pakistan's policies and public criticism of the Taliban was followed up by the visit of the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Bill Richardson, to Islamabad and Kabul in April 1998. But with Pakistan exerting no real pressure on the Taliban, except advising them to give Richardson full protocol, the trip turned into little more than a public relations exercise. Richardson's agreements with the Taliban were rescinded hours later by Mullah Omar, the only positive spin from the trip was that it convinced Iran that the USA now saw Tehran as a dialogue partner in future Afghan peace talks, thereby reducing US-Iranian tensions over Afghanistan. As with Rafael's initiatives in 1996, the USA appeared to be dipping its fingers into the Afghan quagmire but wanted no real responsibility. The USA wished to avoid taking sides or getting involved in the nuts and bolts of peacemaking. The Pakistanis realized this weakness and tried to negate U.S. pressure. Foreign Minister Gohar Ayub blasted the Americans just before Richardson arrived. The Americans are thinking of putting puppets there in Kabul. These are people who hover around in Pakistan from one cocktail party to the other. They do not cut much ice because they have no support in Afghanistan, Ayub said on a visit to Tokyo. U.S. tensions with Pakistan increased substantially after bin Laden's attacks against U.S. embassies in Africa in August 1998. The fact that the ISI had helped introduce bin Laden to the Taliban in 1996 and had maintained contacts with him but now declined to help the Americans catch him created major difficulties in the relationship. The American tone became much harsher. There appears to be a pervasive and dangerous interplay between the politics of Pakistan and the turmoil inside Afghanistan. With the emergence of the Taliban, there is growing reason to fear that militant extremism, obscurantism and sectarianism will infect surrounding countries. None of those countries has more to lose than Pakistan if Talibanization were to spread further, said U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbot in January 1999. But the Americans were not prepared to publicly criticize Saudi support to the Taliban, even though they privately urged Saudi Arabia to use its influence on the Taliban to deliver bin Laden. Even U.S. congressmen were now raising the self-defeating contradictions in U.S. policy. I have called into question whether or not this administration has a covert policy that has empowered the Taliban and enabled his brutal movement to hold on to power, said Congressman Dana Rohrbacher in April 1999. The U.S. has a very close relationship with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, but unfortunately, instead of providing leadership, we're letting them lead our policy, he said. The problem for Pakistan was that Washington had demonized bin Laden to such an extent that he'd become a hero for many Muslims, particularly in Pakistan. U.S. policy was again a one-track agenda, solely focused on getting bin Laden, rather than tackling the wider problems of Afghanistan-based terrorism and peacemaking. Washington appeared to have a bin Laden policy, but not an Afghanistan policy. From supporting the Taliban, the USA had now moved to the other extreme of rejecting them completely. The U.S. rejection of the Taliban was largely because of the pressure exerted by the feminist movement at home, Afghan women activists, such as Ziba Shores Shamli, had persuaded the feminist majority to spearhead a signature campaign to mobilize support for Afghan women and force Clinton to take a tougher stance against the Taliban. 300 women's groups, trade unions and human rights groups signed up. The campaign got a major propaganda boost when Mavis Leno, the wife of comedian Jay Leno, pledged $100,000 to it. The U.S. bears some responsibility for the conditions of women in Afghanistan. For years, our country provided weapons to the Mujahideen groups to fight the Soviets, Ms. Lino told a congressional hearing in March 1998. With Lino's help, the feminist majority organized a massive star-studded party after the 1999 Oscars to honor Afghan women. 
The Taliban's war on women has become the latest cause célèbre in Hollywood. Tibet is out, Afghanistan is in, wrote the Washington Post. As a celebrity in a celebrity-dominated culture, Lino and her opinions went far. Hillary Clinton, anxious to secure feminist support for her future political career, weighed in with statement after statement condemning the Taliban. When women are savagely beaten by so-called religious police for not being fully covered or for making noises while they walk, we know that it is not just the physical beating that is the objective. It is the destruction of the spirit of these women said Mrs. Clinton in a speech in 1999. U.S. policy appeared to have come full circle from unconditionally accepting the Taliban to unconditionally rejecting them. Chapter 14 Master or Victim Pakistan's Afghan War In the last days of June 1998, there was pandemonium in Pakistan's finance and foreign ministries, Senior bureaucrats scuttled between the two ministries and the Prime Minister's Secretariat with bulging briefcases full of files that needed signatures from various ministers. In a few days, on the 30th of June, the 1997-98 financial year expired and the new financial year began. Every ministry was trying to use up its funds for the present year and procure higher allocations for the coming year from the Finance Ministry. A few weeks earlier, on the 28th of May, Pakistan had tested six nuclear devices following India's tests, and the West had slapped punitive sanctions on both countries, creating a major foreign currency crisis for Pakistan and worsening the deep recession that had gripped the economy since 1996. Nevertheless, on the 28th of June, the cash-strapped finance ministry authorized 300 million rupees, 6 million US dollars, in salaries for the Taliban administration in Kabul. The allocation would allow the foreign ministry to dispense 50 million rupees every month for the next six months to pay the salaries of Afghanistan's rulers. The foreign ministry needed to hide this money in its own budget and that of other ministries so that it would not appear on the 1998-99 budget record and be kept away from the prying eyes of international donors who were demanding massive cuts in government spending to salvage the crisis-hit economy. In 1997-98, Pakistan provided the Taliban with an estimated 30 million US dollars in aid. This included 600,000 tons of wheat, diesel, petroleum and kerosene fuel, which was partly paid for by Saudi Arabia, arms and ammunition, aerial bombs, maintenance and spare parts for its Soviet-era military equipment, such as tanks and heavy artillery, repairs and maintenance of the Taliban's air force and airport operations, road building, electricity supply in Kandahar and salaries. Pakistan also facilitated the Taliban's own purchases of arms and ammunition from Ukraine and Eastern Europe. The money given for salaries was seldom used for that purpose and went directly into the war effort. Taliban officials in Kabul were not paid for months at a time. Officially, Pakistan denied it was supporting the Taliban. This flow of aid was a legacy from the past. During the 1980s, the ISI had handled the billions of U.S. dollars which had poured in from the West and Arab states to help the Mujahideen. With encouragement and technical support from the CIA, that money had also been used to carry out an enormous expansion of the ISI. The ISI inducted hundreds of army officers to monitor not just Afghanistan, but India and all of Pakistan's foreign intelligence, as well as domestic politics, the economy, the media and every aspect of social and cultural life in the country. The CIA provided the latest technology, including equipment that enabled the ISI to monitor every telephone call in the country. The ISI became the eyes and ears of President Zia's military regime, and by 1989 it was the most powerful political and foreign policy force in Pakistan, repeatedly overriding later civilian governments and parliament in policy areas it concluded were critical to the country's national security interests. Primarily those areas were India and Afghanistan. Through the 1990s, the ISI tried to maintain its exclusive grip on Pakistan's Afghan policy. However, the end of the Cold War deprived the ISI of its funds, and due to Pakistan's severe economic crisis, its secret budget was drastically cut. 
More significantly, the ISI's dwindling resources were now directed towards another war of attrition, this one for the hearts and minds of the Kashmiri people, who had risen up in revolt against India in 1989. During Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto's second term of office, 1993 to 96, the retired Interior Minister General Nazirullah Babar promoted the Taliban. He wanted to free Afghan policy from the ISI. Both Bhutto and Babar were deeply suspicious of the ISI's power and resources, which it had used to fuel discontent against Bhutto in her first term in office, leading to her removal in 1990. Moreover, the ISI was initially doubtful about the Taliban's potential, as it was still wedded to backing Gulbuddin Hikmetyar and had few funds to back a movement of Afghan students. Babar civilianized support to the Taliban. He created an Afghan trade development cell in the Interior Ministry, which ostensibly had the task of coordinating efforts to facilitate a trade route to Central Asia, although its principal task was to provide logistical backing for the Taliban, not from secret funds, but from the budgets of government ministries. Barber ordered Pakistan Telecommunications to set up a telephone network for the Taliban, which became part of the Pakistan telephone grid. Kandahar could be dialed from anywhere in Pakistan as a domestic call under the prefix 081, the same as Quetta's prefix. Engineers from the Public Works Department and the Water and Power Development Authority carried out road repairs and provided an electricity supply to Kandahar City. The paramilitary Frontier Corps, directly under the control of Babur, helped the Taliban set up an internal wireless network for their commanders. Pakistan International Airlines, PIA, and the Civil Aviation Authority sent in technicians to repair Kandahar Airport and the fighter jets and helicopters the Taliban had captured. Radio Pakistan provided technical support to Radio Afghanistan, now renamed Radio Shariat. After the Taliban capture of Herat in 1995, Pakistani efforts intensified. In January 1996, the Director General of the Afghan Trade Development Cell travelled by road from Quetta to Turkmenistan, accompanied by officials from Civil Aviation, Pakistan Telecom, PIA, Pakistan Railways, Radio Pakistan and the National Bank of Pakistan. Ministries and government corporations took on further projects to help the Taliban with budgets that were supposedly for developing Pakistan's economy. Despite these efforts to help and control the Taliban, they were nobody's puppets and they resisted every attempt by Islamabad to pull their strings. Throughout Afghan history, no outsider has been able to manipulate the Afghans, something the British and the Soviets learned to their cost. Pakistan, it appeared, had learned no lessons from history, while it still lived in the past, when CIA and Saudi funding had given Pakistan the power to dominate the course of the jihad. Moreover, the Taliban's social, economic and political links to Pakistan's Pashtun borderlands were immense, forged through two decades of war and life as refugees in Pakistan. The Taliban were born in Pakistani refugee camps, educated in Pakistani madrasas, and learnt their fighting skills from Mujahideen parties based in Pakistan. Their families carried Pakistani identity cards. The Taliban's deep connections to Pakistani state institutions, political parties, Islamic groups, the Madrasa network, the drugs mafia, and business and transport groups, came at a time when Pakistan's power structure was unravelling and fragmented. This suited the Taliban, who were not beholden to any single Pakistani lobby such as the ISI. Whereas in the 1980s, Mujahideen leaders had exclusive relationships with the ISI and the jamaat e islami they had no links with other political and economic lobbies. In contrast, the Taliban had access to more influential lobbies and groups in Pakistan than most Pakistanis. This unprecedented access enabled the Taliban to play off one lobby against another and extend their influence in Pakistan even further. At times, they would defy the ISI by enlisting the help of government ministers or the transport mafia. At other times, they would defy the federal government by gaining support from the provincial governments in Baluchistan and the northwest frontier province. As the Taliban movement expanded, it became increasingly unclear as to who was driving whom, 
Pakistan, rather than being the master of the Taliban, was instead becoming its victim. Pakistan's security perceptions were initially shaped by Afghanistan's territorial claims on parts of the northwest frontier province and Baluchistan, and there were border clashes between the two states in the 1950s and 1960s. Afghanistan insisted that Pakistan's Pashtun tribal belt should be allowed to opt either for independence or join Pakistan or Afghanistan. Diplomatic relations were severed twice, in 1955 and 1962, as Kabul advocated a greater Pashtunistan, which was supported by left-wing Pakistani Pashtuns. The Zia regime saw the Afghan jihad as a means to end these claims forever by ensuring that a pliable pro-Pakistan Pashtun Mujahideen government came to power in Kabul. Military strategists argued that this would give Pakistan strategic depth against its primary enemy, India. Pakistan's elongated geography, the lack of space, depth and hinterland, denied its armed forces the ability to fight a prolonged war with India. In the 1990s, an addition to this was that a friendly Afghanistan would give Kashmiri militants a base from where they could be trained, funded and armed. In 1992-93, under Indian pressure, the USA had come close to declaring Pakistan a state sponsor of terrorism, as Kashmiri militants based in Pakistan carried out guerrilla attacks in Indian Kashmir. Pakistan tried to resolve this problem in 1993, by moving many of the Kashmiri group's bases to eastern Afghanistan and paying the Jalalabad Shura and later the Taliban to take them under their protection. The government also privatized its support to the Kashmir Mujahideen by making Islamic parties responsible for their training and funding. Bin Laden was encouraged to join the Taliban in 1996 as he too was sponsoring bases for Kashmiri militants in Khost. Increasingly, the Kashmir issue became the prime mover behind Pakistan's Afghan policy and its support to the Taliban. The Taliban exploited this adroitly, refusing to accept other Pakistani demands, knowing that Islamabad could deny them nothing as long as they provided bases for Kashmiri and Pakistani militants. We support the jihad in Kashmir, said Mullah Omar in 1998. It is also true that some Afghans are fighting against the Indian occupation forces in Kashmir, but these Afghans have gone on their own, he added. To many, the concept of strategic depth was riddled with fallacies and misconceptions, as it ignored obvious ground realities that political stability at home, economic development, wider literacy and friendly relations with neighbours ensured greater national security than imaginary mirages of strategic depth in the Afghan mountains. The attainment of strategic depth has been a prime objective of Pakistan's Afghanistan policy since General Zia-ul-Haq, in military thought, it is a non-concept, unless one is referring to a hard-to-reach place where a defeated army might safely cocoon, wrote Pakistani scholar Iqbal Ahmad. The outcome is a country caught in an iron web of wrong assumptions, maginotic concepts, failed policies, fixed postures and sectarian violence. Far from improving it, a Taliban victory is likely to augment Pakistan's political and strategic predicament, he added. The military assumed that the Taliban would recognize the Durand Line, the disputed boundary line between the two countries created by the British and which no Afghan regime has recognized. The military also assumed that the Taliban would curb Pashtun nationalism in the northwest frontier province and provide an outlet for Pakistan's Islamic radicals, thus forestalling an Islamic movement at home. In fact, just the opposite occurred. The Taliban refused to recognize the Durand Line or drop Afghanistan's claims to parts of the northwest frontier province. The Taliban fostered Pashtun nationalism, albeit of an Islamic character, and it began to affect Pakistani Pashtuns. Worse still, the Taliban gave sanctuary to and armed the most violent Sunni extremist groups in Pakistan, who killed Pakistani Shias, wanted Pakistan declared a Sunni state, and advocated the overthrow of the ruling elite through an Islamic revolution. The apparent victor, Pakistan, could pay dearly for its success. The triumph of the Taliban has virtually eliminated the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, 
On both sides, Pashtun tribes are slipping towards fundamentalism and becoming increasingly implicated in drug trafficking. They're gaining autonomy. Already, small fundamentalist tribal emirates are appearing on Pakistani soil. The de facto absorption of Afghanistan will accentuate centrifugal tendencies within Pakistan, predicted Olivier Roy in 1997. In fact, the backwash from Afghanistan was leading to the Talibanization of Pakistan. The Taliban were not providing strategic depth to Pakistan, but Pakistan was providing strategic depth to the Taliban. Pakistan became a victim not only of its strategic vision, but of its own intelligence agencies. The ISI's micromanagement of the Afghan Jihad was only possible because under a military regime and with lavish funding from abroad, the ISI was able to subdue political opposition at home. Zia and the ISI had the power to formulate Afghan policy and implement it, something which no other intelligence agency, not even the CIA, had the power to do. This gave the ISI enormous unity of purpose and scope for operations. The ISI then faced no independent powerful lobbies or political rivals, as in the Taliban era, when they had to compete with an array of Pakistani lobbies which independently supported the Taliban and had their own agendas. By running both Afghan policy and operations, the ISI had no room for critical reappraisals, accommodating dissent from the status quo, nor the imagination or flexibility to adapt to changing situations and the ever-evolving geopolitical environment. The ISI became a victim of its own rigidity and inflexibility, even as its power to actually control the Taliban dwindled. The agency's operatives in Afghanistan were all Pashtun officers, while many were also motivated by strong Islamic fundamentalist leanings. Working closely with Hikmet Yar, and later the Taliban, this Pashtun cadre developed its own agenda, aimed at furthering Pashtun power and radical Islam in Afghanistan at the expense of the ethnic minorities and moderate Islam. In the words of one retired ISI officer, these officers became more Taliban than the Taliban. Consequently, their analysis of the anti-Taliban alliance and pipeline politics became deeply flawed, riddled with rigidity, clichés and false assumptions, which were driven more by their strong Islamic ideological assumptions than by objective facts. But by now the ISI was too powerful for the government of the day to question and too intrusive for any army chief of staff to clean up. When the Taliban emerged, the ISI was initially sceptical about their chances. It was a period when the ISI was in retreat, with the failure of Hikmet Yar to capture Kabul and a shortage of funds. The ISI retreat gave the Bhutto government the opportunity to devise their own support for the Taliban. During 1995, the ISI continued to debate the issue of support for the Taliban. The debate centered around the Pashtun Islamic field officers inside Afghanistan who advocated greater support for the Taliban and those officers involved in long-term strategic planning who wished to keep Pakistan's support to a minimum so as not to worsen relations with Central Asia and Iran. By the summer of 1995, the Pashtun network in the army and the ISI determined to back the Taliban, especially as President Burhanuddin Rabbani sought support from Pakistan's rivals, Russia, Iran and India. But by now the ISI faced all the other Pakistani lobbies, which the Taliban were plugged into, from radical mullahs to drug barons. The fierce competition between the ISI, the government and these lobbies only further fragmented Islamabad's decision-making process on Afghanistan. Pakistan's foreign ministry was so weakened by this confusion that it became virtually irrelevant to Afghan policy and unable to counter the worsening diplomatic environment as every neighbor, Russia, Iran, the Central Asian states, accused Islamabad of destabilizing the region. Efforts to defuse the criticism, such as secret trips to Moscow, Tehran, Tashkent and Ashgabat by successive ISI chiefs proved a failure. As international criticism increased, the newly elected Nawaz Sharif government and the ISI became more adamant in backing the Taliban. 
In May 1997, when the Taliban tried to capture Mazar, the ISI calculated that by recognizing the Taliban government, it would force hostile neighbors to deal with the Taliban and need Islamabad to improve their own relationships with the Taliban. It was a high-stakes gamble that badly misfired when Pakistan prematurely recognized the Taliban, who were then driven out of Mazar. Pakistan reacted by lashing out at its critics, including the UN, which was now openly critical of all external support for the Afghan factions. Pakistan accused UN Secretary General Kofi Annan of being partisan. The UN has gradually marginalized itself in Afghanistan and lost credibility as an impartial mediator, said Ahmad Kamal, Pakistan's ambassador to the UN in January 1998. Later, Kamal told a conference of Pakistani envoys in Islamabad that it was not Pakistan which was isolated in Afghanistan, but that the rest of the world was isolated from Pakistan, and they would have to come round to accepting Pakistan's position on the Taliban. As Pakistan advocated the Taliban's policies in the teeth of widespread international criticism, the government lost sight of how much the country was losing. The smuggling trade to and from Afghanistan became the most devastating manifestation of these losses. This trade, which now extends into Central Asia, Iran and the Persian Gulf, represents a crippling loss of revenue for all these countries, but particularly Pakistan, where local industry has been decimated by the smuggling of foreign consumer goods. What is euphemistically called the Afghan Transit Trade, ATT, has become the biggest smuggling racket in the world and has enmeshed the Taliban with Pakistani smugglers, transporters, drug barons, bureaucrats, politicians and police and army officers. This trade became the main source of official income for the Taliban, even as it undermined the economies of neighboring states. The border post between Chaman in Baluchistan province and Spinbaldak in Afghanistan is a prime location for watching the racket at work. On a good day, some 300 trucks pass through. Truck drivers, Pakistani customs officials and Taliban mix in a casual, friendly way, guzzling down endless cups of tea as long lines of trucks wait to cross. Everybody seems to know everybody else, as drivers tell stories which would make the World Trade Organization's hair stand on end. Many of the huge Mercedes and Bedford trucks are stolen and have false number plates. The goods they carry have no invoices. The drivers may cross up to six international frontiers on false driving licenses and without route permits or passports. The consignments range from Japanese camcorders to English underwear and Earl Grey tea, Chinese silk to American computer parts, Afghan heroin to Pakistani wheat and sugar, East European Kalashnikovs to Iranian petroleum, and nobody pays customs duties or sales tax. This wild west of free trade expanded due to the civil war in Afghanistan, the drugs business, and the collapse and corruption of Pakistani, Iranian, and Central Asian state institutions along their borders with Afghanistan. It coincided with a hunger for consumer goods throughout the region. Pakistani and Afghan transport and drugs mafias merged to fuel this need. It's completely out of control. An official of Pakistan's Central Board of Revenue told me as early as 1995, the Taliban are funded by transporters to open the roads for smuggling, and this mafia is now making and breaking governments in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. Pakistan will face a 30% shortfall in revenues this year because of customs duties lost to the ATT, he said. Trade has always been critical to the Islamic heartland. The Silk Route, which linked China to Europe in the Middle Ages, passed through Central Asia and Afghanistan and was run by the same tribesmen and nomads who are the truck drivers of today. The Silk Route influenced Europe almost as much as the Arab conquests, for these caravans transported not just luxury goods, but ideas, religion, new weapons and scientific discoveries. A camel caravan might consist of five or six thousand camels, its total capacity equaling that of a very large merchant sailing ship. A caravan travelled like an army, with a leader, a general staff, strict rules, compulsory staging posts, and routine precautions against marauding nomads. 
wrote French historian Fernand Brodel. Little seems to have changed in nearly two thousand years. Today's smugglers operate with a similar military-type infrastructure, even though trucks have replaced camels. In 1950, under international agreements, Pakistan gave landlocked Afghanistan permission to import duty-free goods through the port of Karachi, according to an ATT agreement. Truckers would drive their sealed containers from Karachi, cross into Afghanistan, sell some goods in Kabul, and then turn around to resell the rest in Pakistani markets. It was a flourishing but limited business, giving Pakistanis access to cheap, duty-free foreign consumer goods, particularly Japanese electronics. The ATT expanded in the 1980s, servicing Afghanistan's communist-controlled cities. The fall of Kabul in 1992 coincided with new markets opening up in Central Asia and the need for foodstuffs, fuel and building materials as Afghan refugees returned home, a potential bonanza for the transport mafias. However, the transporters were frustrated with the civil war and the warlords, who taxed their trucks dozens of times along a single route. Although the Peshawar-based transport mafia were trading between Pakistan, northern Afghanistan and Uzbekistan, despite the continuing war around Kabul, the Quetta-based mafia were at a loss with the rapacious Kandahar warlords, who'd set up dozens of toll chains along the highway from Pakistan. The Quetta-based transport mafia were keen to open up safe routes to Iran and Turkmenistan, just as the Bhutto government were advocating a similar policy. Taliban leaders were well connected to the Quetta Mafia, who were the first to provide financial support to the Taliban movement. Initially, the Quetta Mafia gave the Taliban a monthly retainer, but as the Taliban expanded westwards, they demanded more funds. In April 1995, witnesses I spoke to in Quetta said the Taliban collected 6 million rupees, 130,000 US dollars, from transporters in Charman in a single day and twice that amount the next day in Quetta as they prepared for their first attack on Herat. These donations were quite apart from the single all-inclusive customs duty the Taliban now charged trucks crossing into Afghanistan from Pakistan, which became the Taliban's main source of official income. With routes now safe and secure, the volume and area of smuggling expanded dramatically. From Quetta, truck convoys travelled to Kandahar, then southwards to Iran, westwards to Turkmenistan and to other CARs, even Russia. Soon the Quetta transport mafia were urging the Taliban to capture Herat in order to take full control of the road to Turkmenistan. Even though the ISI initially advised the Taliban not to attack Herat, the Quetta mafia had more influence with the Taliban. In 1996, the transporters urged the Taliban to clear the route north by capturing Kabul. After taking the capital, the Taliban levied an average of 6,000 rupees, 150 US dollars, for a truck travelling from Peshawar to Kabul, compared to 30,000 to 50,000 rupees, which truckers paid before. The transport mafia gave Taliban leaders a stake in their business by encouraging them to buy trucks or arranging for their relatives to do so. And with the drugs mafia now willing to pay a zakat, tax to transport heroin, the transit trade became even more crucial to the Taliban exchequer. Pakistan was the most damaged victim of this trade. The Central Board of Revenue, the CBR, estimated that Pakistan lost 3.5 billion rupees, 80 million US dollars in customs revenue in the financial year 1992-3, 11 billion rupees in 1993 to 4, 20 billion rupees during 1994 to 5, and 30 billion rupees, 600 million US dollars in 1997 to 8. A staggering increase every year that reflected the Taliban's expansion. An enormous nexus of corruption emerged in Pakistan due to the ATT. All the Pakistan agencies involved were taking bribes, customs, customs intelligence, CBR, the frontier constabulary, and the administrators in the tribal belt. Lucrative customs jobs on the Afghan border were bought by applicants who paid bribes to senior bureaucrats to get the posting. 
These bribes, considered an investment, were then made up by the newly appointed officials who extracted bribes from the ATT. This nexus extended to politicians and cabinet ministers in Baluchistan and the northwest frontier province. The chief ministers and governors of the two provinces issued route permits for trucks to operate and wheat and sugar permits for the export of these commodities to Afghanistan. Senior army officers complained to me in 1995 and again in 1996 that the competition between the chief ministers and governors of the two provinces in issuing route permits was a major source of corruption paralyzing the entire administrative machinery interfering, and often at odds with, the ISI's policy on Afghanistan and creating widespread Taliban control over Pakistani politicians. As the Mafia extended their trade, they also stripped Afghanistan bare. They cut down millions of acres of timber in Afghanistan for the Pakistani market, denuding the countryside, as there was no reforestation. They stripped down rusting factories, destroyed tanks and vehicles, and even electricity and telephone poles for their steel, and sold the scrap to steel mills in Lahore. Carjacking in Karachi and other cities flourished as the Mafia organized local car thieves to steal vehicles and then shifted the vehicles to Afghanistan. The Mafia then resold them to clients in Afghanistan and Pakistan. 65,000 vehicles were stolen from Karachi alone in 1992-98, to with the majority ending up in Afghanistan, only to reappear in Pakistan with their number plates changed. The transport mafia also smuggled in electronic goods from Dubai, Sharjah and other Persian Gulf ports, while exporting heroin hidden in Afghan dried fruit and seasoned timber on Ariana, the national Afghan airline now controlled by the Taliban. Flights from Kandahar, Kabul and Jalalabad took off directly for the Gulf, moving the Taliban into the jet age and giving Silk Route smuggling a modern commercial edge. The ATT fueled the already powerful black economy in Pakistan. According to an academic study, the underground economy in Pakistan has snowballed from 15 billion rupees in 1973 to 1,115 billion rupees in 1996, with its share in GDP increasing from 20% to 51%. During the same period, tax evasion, including customs duty evasion, has escalated from 1.5 billion to 152 billion rupees, accelerating at a rate of 88 billion rupees per year. The smuggling trade contributed some 100 billion rupees to the underground economy in 1993, which had escalated to over 300 billion rupees in 1998. That is equivalent to 30% of the country's total imports of 10 billion US dollars, or equal to the entire revenue collection target for 1998 to 9, 300 billion rupees. In addition, the Afghanistan-Pakistan drugs trade was estimated to be worth an annual 50 billion rupees. In the northwest frontier province, smugglers' markets, or baras, were flooded with important consumer goods, causing massive losses to Pakistani industry. For example, in 1994, Pakistan, which manufactured its own air conditioners, imported just 30 million rupees worth of foreign air conditioners. Afghanistan, a country then totally bereft of electricity, imported through the ATT one billion rupees worth of air conditioners, which all ended up in Pakistani baras, thus crippling local manufacturers. When duty-free Japanese TV sets or dishwashers were available at virtually the same price as Pakistani manufactured ones, consumers would naturally buy Japanese products. The bara at Hayatabad, outside Peshawar, set up brand name shops to attract customers, such as Britain's Marks and & Spencer and Mothercare in Japan's Sony, where the original products were available duty-free. The ATT has destroyed economic activity in the province, and people have given up the idea of honest earnings and consider smuggling as their due right, said Northwest Frontier Province Chief Minister Mahtab Ahmed Khan in December 1998. A similar undermining of the economy and widespread corruption was taking place in Iran. 
The transport mafia's smuggling of fuel and other goods from Iran to Afghanistan and Pakistan led to revenue losses, crippled local industry, and corrupted people at the highest level of government. Iranian officials privately admitted to me that the Bunyads, or the state-run industrial foundations, as well as the Revolutionary Guards, were among the beneficiaries from the smuggling of petroleum products, whose sale in Afghanistan earned two to three thousand percent profit compared to Iran. Fuel was devoured in huge quantities by the war machines of the Afghan warlords, and soon petrol pump owners in Baluchistan were ordering cheap fuel from Iran through the mafia, bypassing Pakistani companies and customs duties altogether. Pakistan made several half-hearted attempts to rein in the ATT by stopping the import of items such as electronics, but the government always backed down as the Taliban refused to comply with the new orders and the mafia pressurized government ministers. There were no lobbies in Islamabad willing to point out the damage being inflicted upon Pakistan's economy or prepared to force the Taliban to comply. The ISI was unwilling to use the threat of withholding support to the Taliban until they complied. To bewildered foreign and Pakistani investors, the government appeared willing to undermine Pakistan's own economy for the sake of the Taliban, as Islamabad was allowing a de facto transfer of revenues from the Pakistan state to the Taliban. It was a form of unofficial aid which benefited the Taliban and made those Pakistanis involved extremely rich. They created the most powerful lobby to continue Pakistan's support to the Taliban. The backlash from Afghanistan added fuel to the spreading fire of instability in Pakistan. In the 1980s, the fallout from the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan had created the heroin and Kalashnikov culture that undermined Pakistan's politics and economy. Ten years of active involvement in the Afghan war has changed the social profile of Pakistan to such an extent that any government faces serious problems in effective governance. Pakistani society is now more fractured, inundated with sophisticated weapons, brutalized due to growing civic violence, and overwhelmed by the spread of narcotics, wrote American historian Paul Kennedy. In the late 1990s, the repercussions were much more pervasive, undermining all the institutions of the state. Pakistan's economy was being crippled by the ATT, its foreign policy faced isolation from the West and immediate neighbors, law and order broke down as Islamic militants enacted their own laws, and a new breed of anti-Shia Islamic radicals, who were given sanctuary by the Taliban, killed hundreds of Pakistani Shias between 1996 and 1999. This sectarian bloodshed is now fueling a much wider rift between Pakistan's Sunni majority and Shia minority and undermining relations between Pakistan and Iran. At the same time, over 80,000 Pakistani Islamic militants have trained and fought with the Taliban since 1994. They form a hard core of Islamic activists ever ready to carry out a similar Taliban-style Islamic revolution in Pakistan. Tribal groups imitating the Taliban sprang up across the Pashtun belt in the northwest frontier province and Baluchistan. As early as 1995, Maulana Sufi Mohammed had led his Tanzim Nifaz Shariat i Mohammedi in Bajar Agency in an uprising to demand Sharia law. The revolt was joined by hundreds of Afghan and Pakistani Taliban before it was crushed by the army. The Tanzim leaders then sought refuge in Afghanistan with the Taliban. In December 1998, the Tariki Tuleba, or Movement of Taliban in the Oraz Kai Agency, publicly executed a murderer in front of 2,000 spectators in defiance of the legal process. They promised to implement Taliban-style justice throughout the Pashtun belt and banned TV, music and videos in imitation of the Taliban. Other pro-Taliban Pashtun groups sprang up in Quetta. They burned down cinema houses, shot video shop owners, smashed satellite dishes, and drove women off the streets. Yet after the Taliban captured Mazar in 1998, Pakistan declared victory, demanding that the world recognize the movement, which now controlled 80% of Afghanistan. 
Pakistan's military and civilian leaders insisted that the Taliban's success was Pakistan's success and that its policy was correct and unchangeable. Pakistan considered Iranian influence in Afghanistan to be over and that Russia and the Central Asian states would be obliged to deal with the Taliban through Islamabad, while the West would have no choice but to accept the Taliban's interpretation of Islam. Even though there was mounting public concern about the Talibanization of Pakistan, the country's leaders ignored the growing internal chaos. Outsiders increasingly saw Pakistan as a failing or failed state, like Afghanistan, Sudan or Somalia. A failed state is not necessarily a dying state, although it can be that too. A failed state is one in which the repeated failure of policies, carried out by a bankrupt political elite, is never considered sufficient reason to reconsider them. Pakistan's elite showed no inclination to change its policy in Afghanistan. General Zia had dreamed, like a Mughal emperor, of recreating a Sunni Muslim space between infidel Hindustan, heretic, because Shia, Iran, and Christian Russia. He believed that the message of the Afghan Mujahideen would spread into Central Asia, revive Islam, and create a new Pakistan-led Islamic bloc of nations. What Zia never considered was what his legacy would do to Pakistan. Chapter 15 Shia versus Sunni, Iran and Saudi Arabia. There was a sense of change and renewal in Tehran in the spring of 1999. For nearly 20 years since the Islamic Revolution, Tehran's women had shrouded themselves in the dictated garb of hijab, the uniform black tents. Now suddenly the hijab was sprouting faux leopard skin trimmings and fur. Some women were wearing raincoats or donning the hijab like a cape, revealing short skirts, tight jeans, black silk stockings and high heels. Rather than an imposed dress code, female modesty now appeared to be up to the individual. The loosening up of the hijab was only one sign of the transformation of Iranian society after the election of Syed Mohammad Khatami to the presidency in May 1997, when he took 70% of the popular vote in a stunning victory against a more hardline conservative candidate. Khatami had garnered the votes of the youth, who were fed up with 25% unemployment and high inflation, and hopeful that he would usher in economic development and a more open society. Khatami's victory created an immediate thaw in Iran's relations with the outside world, as it opened up to the West, wooed its old enemy the USA with the need for a dialogue between civilizations, and sought an improvement in relations with the Arab world. Afghanistan was to become the primary issue in helping thaw relations between Iran, the USA, and the Arab world. During his visit to Kabul in April 1998, U.S. Ambassador Bill Richardson had already signaled that the USA saw Iran as a dialogue partner to help resolve the Afghan crisis. Iran was also talking to an old foe, Saudi Arabia. The positive climate between Iran and Saudi Arabia is encouraging, and both sides are ready to cooperate for the resolution of the conflict in Afghanistan, Iran's new foreign minister, Kamal Karazi, said in May 1998. A suave, English-speaking diplomat, who for 11 years had represented Iran at the UN, Karazi's soft diplomatic manner and style were representative of a revolution that had mellowed. Iran's new leaders were deeply antagonistic to the Taliban, but they were pragmatic enough to realize that peace in Afghanistan was necessary for economic development and political liberalization in Iran. Stability in their neighborhood would also help Iran end its international isolation. Khatami was far from looking for a fight with the Taliban, yet just six months later, after the Taliban killed nine Iranian diplomats in Mazar, Iran had mobilized a quarter of a million soldiers on its border with Afghanistan and was threatening to invade. As tensions with the Taliban escalated, the new relationship between Iran and Saudi Arabia took on even more importance. Afghanistan has been just one area of conflict in the intense rivalry between the Persians and the Arabs. Both peoples have conquered and ruled one another against a background of dispute between Sunni Arabia and Shia Persia. 
In 1501, Shah Ismail of the Safavid dynasty turned Iran into the first and only Shia state in the Islamic world. Both the Persians and the Arabs had ruled over Central Asia and Afghanistan, although Persian rule and its culture and language was much more long-standing and left a permanent mark. In the 20th century, the long war between revolutionary Iran and Iraq, 1981 to 88, which led to some one and a half million casualties, only deepened this rivalry, as all the Arab states had supported Saddam Hussein's Iraq. As that war began, another was just beginning in Afghanistan, and here too the age-old rivalries would continue. This time, in the context of the Cold War, and the U.S. aimed to isolate Iran with the help of the Arab states. Ostensibly, both Iran and Saudi Arabia were on the same side in the Afghan conflict. They strongly opposed the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, supported the Mujahideen, and backed international measures to isolate the Afghan regime and the Soviet Union. But they supported opposing factions of the Mujahideen, and Iran never severed its diplomatic links with the Kabul regime. Saudi support to the Mujahideen was in line with the U.S. and Pakistani strategy of providing the bulk of funds and weapons to the most radical Sunni Pashtun groups and ignoring the Shia Afghans. The Saudis also separately funded Afghans who promoted Wahhabism. Dollar for dollar. Saudi aid matched the funds given to the Mujahideen by the U.S. The Saudis gave nearly four billion U.S. dollars in official aid to the Mujahideen between 1980 and 1990, which did not include unofficial aid from Islamic charities, foundations, the private funds of princes, and mosque collections. There were also direct funds given to the ISI, as in 1989, when the Saudis handed over 26 million U.S. dollars to bribe Afghan leaders during the negotiations to form the Mujahideen interim government in exile in Islamabad. The Mujahideen leaders were obliged to appoint an Afghan Wahhabi as interim prime minister. In March 1990. The Saudis came up with an additional 100 million dollars for Hikmetyar's Hizb-e-Islami party, who were backing an abortive coup attempt from within the Afghan army against President Najibullah by Hikmetyar and General Shahnawaz Tanai in Kabul. After 1992, the Saudis continued to provide funds and fuel to the Mujahideen government in Kabul. The fuel, channeled through Pakistan, became a major source of corruption and patronage for successive Pakistani governments and the ISI. Due to the estranged relations between Iran and the USA, the Afghan Mujahideen groups based in Iran received no international military assistance. Nor did the two million Afghan refugees who fled to Iran receive the same humanitarian aid which their three million counterparts in Pakistan received. Tehran's own support to the Mujahideen was limited on account of budgetary constraints because of the Iraq-Iran war. Thus, throughout the 1980s, the USA effectively blocked off Iran from the outside world on Afghanistan. It was a legacy which only further embittered the Iranians against the USA, and it would ensure much greater Iranian assertiveness in Afghanistan once the Cold War had ended and the Americans had left the Afghan stage. Iran's initial support to the Mujahideen only went to the Afghan Shias, in particular the Hazaras. It was the era in which Iran's revolutionary guards funded Shia militants worldwide, from Lebanon to Pakistan. By 1982, Iranian money and influence had encouraged a younger generation of Iran-trained radical Hazaras to overthrow the traditional leaders who had emerged in the Hazarajat in 1979 to oppose the Soviet invasion. Later, eight Afghan Shia groups were given official status in Tehran, but Iran could never arm and fund them sufficiently. As a result, the Iran-backed Hazaras became marginal to the conflict inside Afghanistan and fought more amongst themselves than against the Soviets. Hazara factionalism was exacerbated by Iran's short-sighted ideological policies, in which the Hazaras' loyalty to Tehran was viewed as more important than unity amongst themselves. By 1988, with the Soviet withdrawal now imminent, Iran saw the need to strengthen the Hazaras. They helped unite the eight Iran-based Hazara groups into the single Hizb-e-Wahhabat party. 
Iran now pressed for Wahadat's inclusion in international negotiations to form a new Mujahideen government, which was to be dominated by the Peshawar-based Mujahideen parties. Even though the Hazaras were a small minority and could not possibly hope to rule Afghanistan, Iran demanded first a 50% and then a 25% share for the Hazaras in any future Mujahideen government. As the rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia intensified, with the Saudis importing more Arabs to spread Wahhabism and anti-Shiism inside Afghanistan, Pakistan kept the balance between them. A close ally of both states, Pakistan stressed the need to maintain a united front against the Kabul regime. The Iran-Saudi rivalry escalated after the 1989 withdrawal of Soviet troops when Iran drew closer to the Kabul regime. Iran considered the Kabul regime as the only force now capable of resisting a Sunni Pashtun takeover of Afghanistan. Iran rearmed Wahadat, and by the time Kabul fell to the Mujahideen in 1992, Wahadat controlled not only the Hazarajat, but a significant part of western Kabul. The Saudis, meanwhile, suffered a major setback as their two principal neo-Wahhabi protégés, Gulbuddin Hikmetyar and Abdul Rasul Sayaf, split. Hikmetyar opposed the newly constituted Mujahideen government in Kabul and joined up with the Hazaras to bombard the city. Sayaf supported the Mujahideen government. This division was an extension of the much larger Saudi foreign policy debacle after Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. For 20 years, the Saudis had funded hundreds of neo-Wahhabi parties across the Muslim world to spread Wahhabism and gain influence within the Islamic movements in these countries. But when Riyadh asked these Islamic groups for a payback and to lend support to Saudi Arabia and the USA-led coalition against Iraq, the majority of them backed Saddam Hussein, including Hikmetyar and most Afghan groups. Years of Saudi effort and billions of dollars were wasted because Saudi Arabia had failed to evolve a national, interest-based foreign policy. The Saudi predicament is having a westernized ruling elite, whose legitimacy is based on conservative fundamentalism, while those not part of the elite are radically anti-Western. The elite has promoted radical Wahhabism, even as this undermined its own power at home and abroad. Ironically, only the moderate Afghan groups whom the Saudis had ignored helped out the kingdom in its hour of need. As the Afghan war intensified between 1992 and 1995, so did the rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The Saudis and the Pakistanis made frequent attempts to bring all the factions together. However, they also made every effort to keep Iran and the Hazaras out of any potential agreements. In the 1992 Peshawar Accord, which Pakistan and Saudi Arabia negotiated between the Mujahideen on how to share power in Kabul, and in the subsequent but abortive 1993 Islamabad and Jalalabad Accords to end the civil war, Iran and the Hazaras were sidelined. The exclusion of Iran in the 1990s by Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, similar to treatment by the USA of Iran in the 1980s, was to further embitter Tehran. The Iranians had also become more pragmatic, backing not just the Afghan Shias, but all the Persian-speaking ethnic groups who were resisting Pashtun domination. Iran had a natural link with the Tajiks. They originate from the same ancient race and speak the same language. But the Iranians had been incensed by Ahmad Shah Massoud's brutal attacks on the Hazaras in Kabul in 1993. Nevertheless, Tehran now realized that unless it backed the non-Pashtuns, Pashtun Sunnis would dominate Afghanistan. In 1993, for the first time, Iran began to give substantial military aid to the President Burhanuddin Rabbani in Kabul and the Uzbek warlord General Rashid Dostum and urged all the ethnic groups to join with Rabbani. Iran's new strategy intensified its conflict of interest with Pakistan. Islamabad was determined to get its Pashtun protégés into Kabul, and both the Pakistanis and the Saudis were determined to keep the Hazaras out of any power-sharing arrangement. Pakistan's adroit diplomacy in the 1980s in providing a balance between Saudi and Iranian interests was now abandoned in favor of the Saudis. 
The collapse of the Soviet Union and the opening up of Central Asia had given Iran a new impetus to end its international isolation. Iran moved swiftly into Central Asia with a path-breaking trip by Foreign Minister Ali Akbar Velayti in November 1991, who signed an agreement to build a railway line between Turkmenistan and Iran. But here, too, the USA tried to block Iran with U.S. Secretary of State James Baker declaring in 1992 that Washington would do everything to block Iranian influence in Central Asia. The neo-communist rulers in Central Asia were initially deeply suspicious of Iran, fearing it wanted to spread Islamic fundamentalism. But Iran resisted this temptation and also forged close ties with Russia, following the 1989 ice-breaking visit to Tehran by Soviet Foreign Minister Eduard Shevardnadze when he met with Ayatollah Khomeini. The Ayatollah's sanction of closer Iranian-Soviet ties just before his death gave the new Russia a legitimacy in Iranian eyes. Also, between 1989 and 1993, Russia provided Iran with 10 billion U.S. dollars worth of weapons to rebuild its military arsenal. Iran improved its standing in the region by forging links with other non-Muslim former Soviet states, such as Georgia, Ukraine and Armenia. Tehran declined to support Azerbaijan in its war with Armenia, even though 20% of the Iranian population is Azeri, and helped Russia and the UN to end the civil war in Tajikistan. Crucially, Iran and the Central Asian republics shared a deep suspicion of Afghan Pashtun fundamentalism and the support it received from Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Thus, an alliance between Iran, Russia and the CARs in support of the non-Pashtun ethnic groups existed well before the Taliban emerged. In contrast, Saudi Arabia made few state-to-state -state attempts to improve relations with Russia or the CARs. The Saudis took nearly four years before they established embassies in Central Asian capitals. Instead, the Saudis sent millions of Korans to Central Asia, funded Central Asian Muslims on the Hajj, and gave scholarships for their mullahs to study in Saudi Arabia, where they imbibed Wahhabism. These measures only perturbed Central Asia's rulers. Within a few years, the rulers of Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan were to call Wahhabism the biggest political threat to stability in their countries. Saudi Arabia viewed the Taliban as an important asset to their dwindling influence in Afghanistan. The first Saudi contacts with the Taliban were through princely hunting trips. Maulana Fazlur Rehman, head of Pakistan's JUI, organized the first busted hunting trips for Saudi and Gulf princes to Kandahar in the winter of 1994-95. The Arab hunting parties flew into Kandahar on huge transport planes, bringing dozens of luxury jeeps, many of which they left behind along with donations for their Taliban hosts after the hunt. Saudi intelligence chief Prince Turki then began to visit Kandahar regularly. After Turkey visited Islamabad and Kandahar in July 1996, the Saudis provided funds, vehicles and fuel for the successful Taliban attack on Kabul. Two Saudi companies, Delta and Ningacho, were now involved in the gas pipeline projects across Afghanistan, increasing local business pressure on Riyadh to help ensure a Taliban victory. But it was the Wahhabi ulema in the kingdom who played the most influential role in urging the royal family to back the Taliban. The ulema play a leading advisory role to the Saudi monarch in the Council of the Assembly of Senior Ulema and four other state organizations. They've consistently supported the export of Wahhabism throughout the Muslim world, and the royal family remains extremely sensitive to ulema opinion. King Fahd had to call a meeting of 350 ulema to persuade them to issue a fatwa allowing U.S. troops to be based in the kingdom during the 1990 war with Iraq. Saudi intelligence cooperated closely with the ulema, as did numerous state-run Islamic charities, which had funded the Afghan Mujahideen in the 1980s and now began to do the same for the Taliban. Moreover, the ulema had the vast network of mosques and madrasas in the kingdom under their control, and it was here during Friday's sermons that they built up public grassroots support for the Taliban. According to the Saudi analyst Nawaf Obaid, 
The key players in the ulema who pushed for Saudi support to the Taliban were Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, the Grand Mufti, and Chairman of the Council of Senior Ulema, and Sheikh Mohammed bin Jubair, the Minister of Justice, and a key member of the Council of the Ulema. In return, the Taliban demonstrated their reverence for the royal family and the ulema and copied Wahhabi practices such as introducing religious police. In April 1997, Taliban leader Mullah Rabbani met with King Fahd in Riyadh and praised the Saudis effusively. Since Saudi Arabia is the center of the Muslim world, we would like to have Saudi assistance. King Fahd expressed happiness at the good measures taken by the Taliban and over the imposition of Sharia in our country, Rabbani said. Meeting King Fahd five months later, Taliban leaders said the Saudis had promised more aid. King Fahd was too kind. The Saudis have promised us as much as they can give us, said Mullah Mohammed Stanaksai. Riyadh's support for the Taliban made them extremely reluctant to exert any pressure on the Taliban to deport Osama bin Laden, even though the USA was urging them to do so. Only when Prince Turkey was personally insulted by Mullah Omar in Kandahar did the Saudis curtail diplomatic links with the Taliban. Significantly, it was a personal insult that guided Saudi decision-making rather than an overall change in foreign policy. Saudi Arabia still appeared to have learnt little from its negative experiences of trying to export Wahhabism. Saudi Arabia's initial support for the Taliban convinced Iran that the USA was also backing them in an intensification of its 1980s policies to surround Iran with hostile forces and isolate it. The USA, according to Tehran, had a new aim to promote oil and gas pipelines from Central Asia which would bypass Iran. After the Taliban captured Kabul, Iranian newspapers echoed the long-held views of officials. The Taliban capture of Kabul was designed by Washington, financed by Riyadh, and logistically supported by Islamabad, wrote the Jamuri Islami newspaper. However, for Tehran, the real fallout with Afghanistan was internal. The leadership was divided between hardliners, who still hankered after supporting Shias worldwide, and moderates, who wanted a more measured support for the anti-Taliban alliance and less confrontation with the Taliban. Iran suffered from the same problems as Pakistan in having multiple departments and lobbies trying to push their personal vested interests in the making of Afghan policy. The Iranian military, the Revolutionary Guards, the intelligence agencies, the Shia clergy, and the powerful bunyads, or foundations, which are run by the clergy and control much of the state sector economy and also finance foreign policy adventures with their large, unaccounted funds, were just some of the contending lobbies. All these lobbies had to be kept on an even keel by the foreign ministry and Alaeddin Burujerdi, the deputy foreign minister for Afghanistan. Burujerdi, who ran Afghan policy for more than a decade, was a smart diplomat. He had outlasted the earlier regime of President Akbar Ali Rafsanjani to take up the same appointment under President Khatami, until he was forced to resign after the Iranian diplomats were killed in Mazar. He could be both a dove and a hawk on Afghanistan, depending on whom he was talking to, and he also had to ensure that Iran's conflict of interest with Pakistan and Saudi Arabia did not get out of hand. In contrast, in Saudi Arabia, the foreign minister Prince Saud al-Faisal deferred Afghan policy to his younger brother Prince Turkey and Saudi intelligence. The collapse of the Afghan state increased Iran's own insecurity by creating a massive influx of drugs and weapons. The spectre of Afghanistan's ethnic conflict threatened to spill into Iran along with the economic burden of supporting millions of Afghan refugees who were deeply disliked by ordinary Iranians. There are an estimated three million heroin addicts in Iran, the same number as in Pakistan, although Iran, with 60 million people, has half the population of Pakistan. The smuggling of fuel, foodstuffs and other goods out of Iran to Afghanistan created losses in revenue and periodic economic problems, just when Iran faced a dramatic fall in revenue because of the drop in world oil prices and was trying to rebuild its economy. Of even greater concern to the Iranians was that since 1996, 
the Taliban were also secretly backing Iranian groups who were anti-regime. In Kandahar, the Taliban had given sanctuary to Ali Sunnah wal Jamaat, which recruited Iranian Sunni militants from Khorasan and Sistan provinces. Its spokesmen, from Iran's Turkmen, Baluchi and Afghan minorities, claimed that their aim was to overthrow the Shia regime in Tehran and impose a Taliban-style Sunni regime. This was a bizarre aspiration, given that over 90% of Iran's population was Shia, although it presumably helped to bolster support among the small band of insurgents. The group received weapons and support from the Taliban, and the Iranians were convinced that the Pakistanis were also sponsoring them. Iranian military aid to the anti-Taliban alliance escalated after the fall of Kabul in 1996 and again after the fall of Mazar in 1998. However, Iran had no contiguous border with the alliance and was forced to either fly in or rail supplies to Massoud's forces, which involved getting permission from Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. In 1998, Iranian intelligence flew in plane loads of arms to Ahmed Shah Massoud's base in Kuliab in Tajikistan, and Massoud became a frequent visitor to Tehran. The danger which the Iran supply line faced was highlighted when Kyrgyzstan's security forces stopped to train in October 1998, in which were discovered 16 rail cars loaded with 700 tons of arms and ammunition. The train had been travelling from Iran to Tajikistan with the weapons disguised as humanitarian aid. The Taliban were incensed with Iran's support for the alliance. In June 1997, the Taliban closed down the Iranian embassy in Kabul, accusing Iran of destroying peace and stability in Afghanistan. A Taliban statement in September 1997, after their failure to capture Mazar, was explicit. Iranian planes, in gross violation of all internationally accepted norms, intrude our country's airspace to airlift supplies to airports controlled by the opposition. The grave consequences of such interference will rest with Iran, which is the enemy of Islam. Afghanistan is capable of harboring opponents of the Iranian government inside Afghan territory, and thus of creating problems for Iran, the statement said. However, it was the killing of the Iranian diplomats in Mazar in 1998 that nearly forced Iran into war with the Taliban. There was enormous popular support for an Iranian invasion of western Afghanistan, which was further manipulated by hardliners in Tehran wanting to destabilize President Khatami. Even the reticent foreign minister Kamal Karazi was forced to adopt extremely tough language. The Taliban are Pashtuns, and cannot sideline all the other ethnic groups from the political scene without sparking continuing resistance. In such circumstances, there will be no peace in the country. I warn the Taliban, and those who support them, that we will not tolerate instability and conspiracy along our borders. We had an agreement with Pakistan that the Afghan problem would not be resolved through war. Now this has happened, and we cannot accept it, Karazi said on the 14th of August, 1998. Iran felt betrayed by Pakistan on several counts. In 1996, just when President Burhanuddin Rabbani, under Iranian advice, was trying to broaden the base of his government and bring in Pashtuns and other groups, the Taliban captured Kabul. Iran was convinced that Pakistan had sabotaged Rabbani's effort. In June 1997, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif visited Tehran. Together with President Khatami, the two leaders called for a ceasefire in Afghanistan and declared that there could be no military solution. But Iran considered that Pakistan had no intention of sticking to the agreement. Pakistan has left no room for our trust and has destabilized its position with the Iranian people. We cannot accept seeing Pakistan cause problems for our national security, wrote the Jomhuri Islami. Then in the summer of 1998, Pakistan persuaded Iran to participate in a joint diplomatic peace mission. Mid-level Iranian and Pakistani diplomats traveled together for the first time to Mazar and Kandahar on the 4th of July 1998 to talk to the opposing factions. Just a few weeks later, the Taliban attacked Mazar and slaughtered the Iranian diplomats, scuttling the initiative. 
The Iranians were convinced that Pakistan had duped them by pretending to launch a peace initiative, just as the ISI was preparing the Taliban for the attack on Mazar. Moreover, Iran claimed that Pakistan had promised the safety of its diplomats in Mazar. When they were killed, Iran was furious and blamed the Taliban and Pakistan. Iranian officials said that Mullah Dost Mohammed, who allegedly led the Taliban seizure of the Iranian consulate, had first gathered the diplomats in the basement of the building and spoken by wireless to Kandahar before shooting them dead. The Taliban replied, correctly as it appeared, that the Iranians were not diplomats, but intelligence agents involved in ferrying weapons to the anti-Taliban alliance. Nevertheless, in the diplomatic skirmishing that followed, trust between Iran and Pakistan evaporated. The Iranians were also furious that the Taliban actions had endangered its growing rapprochement with the USA. U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright had said in June 1998, the critical role that Iran plays in the region makes the question of USA-Iran relations a topic of great interest and importance to this Secretary of State. The Iranians had been encouraged that the USA was taking them seriously for the first time. USA-Iran cooperation on Afghanistan certainly can be an exemplary case and shows that the US has a better understanding of the reality in this region and the role that Iran can play for the promotion of peace and security, Kamal Karazi told me. We have been trying for a long time to tell them, that is the USA, that Iran is a key player in the region. Iran and the USA had also drawn closer because of Washington's changed perceptions about the Taliban. Both countries now shared the same views and were critical of the Taliban's drug and gender policies, their harboring of terrorists, and the threat that the Taliban's brand of Islamic fundamentalism posed to the region. Ironically for the USA, the new threat was no longer Shia fundamentalism, but the Sunni fundamentalism of the Taliban. The Taliban were now even proving an embarrassment to Saudi Arabia, which helped bring Tehran closer to Riyadh. The Taliban's harbouring of bin Laden had exposed their extremism and posed a threat to Saudi stability. Significantly, the rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia did not falter, even when Iran was threatening to invade Afghanistan in 1998. In May 1999, President Khatami visited Saudi Arabia, the first Iranian leader to do so in nearly three decades. The Taliban pose a security threat to the Saudis, especially through their support for Saudi dissidents. In the past, the Saudis had deferred to the Taliban's fundamentalism without giving due thought to what kind of state, political compromises and power sharing should evolve in Afghanistan but they could no longer afford to take such a casual attitude. With so much of Saudi foreign policy run on the basis of personal relationships and patronage, rather than state institutions, it has become difficult to see how a policy towards Afghanistan geared more to Saudi national self-interest and stability in the region rather than Wahhabism can evolve. If President Khatami were to push forward his reform agenda at home, the Iranian regime would increasingly desire and need a peace settlement in Afghanistan to end the drain on its resources from funding the anti-Taliban alliance, stop the drugs, weapons and sectarian spillover from Afghanistan and move towards a further rapprochement with the USA. Ironically, the Taliban's extremism had also helped bring Iran and Saudi Arabia closer together and weakened Pakistan's relationship with both countries. The big loser from Iran's return to the diplomatic mainstream was Pakistan. However, to end its isolation from the West, Iran needed to demonstrate that it was a responsible and stabilizing member of the international community. Its first and biggest test could be in helping to bring peace to Afghanistan. Chapter 16. The Last Chapter. Conclusion. The Future of Afghanistan. Afghanistan has become one of the world's orphaned conflicts, the ones that the West, selective and promiscuous in its attention, happens to ignore in favour of Yugoslavia, said former UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali in 1995. The world has turned away from Afghanistan, 
allowing civil war, ethnic fragmentation and polarization to become state failure. The country has ceased to exist as a viable state, and when a state fails, civil society is destroyed. Generations of children grow up rootless, without identity or reason to live except to fight. Adults are traumatized and brutalized, knowing only war and the power of the warlords. We are dealing here with a failed state, which looks like an infected wound. You don't even know where to start cleaning it, said UN mediator Lachda Brahimi. The entire Afghan population has been displaced, not once, but many times over. The physical destruction of Kabul has turned it into the Dresden of the late twentieth century. The crossroads of Asia, on the ancient Silk Route, is now nothing but miles of rubble. There is no semblance of an infrastructure that can sustain society, even at the lowest common denominator of poverty. In 1998, the ICRC reported that the number of Afghan families headed by a widow had reached 98,000, the number of families headed by a disabled person was 63,000, and 45,000 people were treated for war wounds that year alone. There was not even an estimate of those killed. The only productive factories in the country are those where artificial limbs, crutches and wheelchairs are produced by the aid agencies. Afghanistan's divisions are multiple. Ethnic, sectarian, rural and urban, educated and uneducated, those with guns and those who have been disarmed. The economy is a black hole that is sucking in its neighbours with illicit trade and the smuggling of drugs and weapons, undermining them in the process. It will take at least 10 to 15 years before there will be a functioning central authority capable of doing the minimum of the administration needed for the development of the country. And that is, in my view, a rather optimistic statement, said Swedish aid worker Anders Fanga. Complex relationships of power and authority, built up over centuries, have broken down completely. No single group or leader has the legitimacy to reunite the country. Rather than a national identity or kinship tribal-based identities, territorial regional identities have become paramount. Afghans no longer call themselves just Afghans or even Pashtuns and Tajiks, but Kandaharis, Panchiris, Hiratis, Kabulis or Juzjanis. Fragmentation is both vertical and horizontal and cuts across ethnicity to encompass a single valley or town. The Pashtun tribal structure has been destroyed by the loss of common tribal property and grazing grounds and by war and flight. The non-Pashtun identify their survival with individual warrior leaders and the valley of their birth. The tribal hierarchy, which once mediated conflicts, has been killed or is in exile. The old, educated ruling elite fled after the Soviet invasion, and no new ruling elite has emerged in its place which can negotiate a peace settlement. There is no political class to compromise and make deals. There are lots of leaders representing segments of the population, but no outright leader. In such a scenario, with no end to the war in sight, the question of whether Afghanistan will fragment and send waves of ethnic fragmentation and instability spinning through the region becomes paramount. Much of the blame for the continuation of the war lies in the hands of outsiders who continue to back their proxies in an ever-increasing spiral of intervention and violence. The FSU began the process with its brutal invasion of Afghanistan, but suffered hugely. We brought Afghanistan with us, in our souls, in our hearts, in our memory, in our customs, in everything and at every level said Alexander Lebed, who served as a major in the Soviet army in Afghanistan and is now a presidential candidate. This feeble political adventure, this attempt to export a still unproved revolution, marked the beginning of the end, he added. The Afghan Mujahideen contributed to the demise of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Empire and even communism itself. While the Afghans take all the credit for this, the West has gone the other way, barely acknowledging the Afghan contribution to the end of the Cold War. The withdrawal of Soviet troops from Afghanistan heralded the end of the Gorbachev experiment in Perestroika and Glasnost, the idea that the Soviet system could be changed from within. There is a lesson to be learned here for today's meddlers. 
Those who intervene in Afghanistan can face disintegration themselves, not because of the power of the Afghans, but because of the forces that are unleashed in their own fragile societies. By walking away from Afghanistan as early as it did, the USA faced, within a few years, dead diplomats, destroyed embassies, bombs in New York, and cheap heroin on its streets, as Afghanistan became a sanctuary for international terrorism and the drugs mafia. Afghans today remain deeply bitter about their abandonment by the USA, for whom they fought the Cold War. In the 1980s, the USA was prepared to fight till the last Afghan to get even with the Soviet Union, but when the Soviets left, Washington was not prepared to help bring peace or feed a hungry people. Regional powers took advantage of the political vacuum the US retreat created, saw an opportunity to wield influence, and jumped into the fray. Today, the USA, by picking up single issues and creating entire policies around them, whether it be oil, pipelines, the treatment of women, or terrorism, is only demonstrating that it has learnt little. The abortive Unical project should have taught many lessons to US policymakers, but there appear to be no signs of it as US diplomats scurry across Central Asia, trying to persuade oil companies and governments to commit to building a main export pipeline from Baku to Jehan. But even that is likely to be indefinitely delayed. The start-up for construction scheduled for the year 2000 has been progressively delayed to 2003 and most recently to 2005. The lessons from the Unical project are several. No major pipeline from Central Asia can be built unless there is far greater US and international commitment to conflict resolution in the region. In Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Nagorno-Karabakh, Chechnya, Georgia, and with the Kurds. The region is a powder keg of unresolved conflicts. Nor can secure pipelines be built without some degree of strategic consensus in the region. Iran and Russia cannot be isolated from the region's development forever. They will resist and sabotage projects as long as they're not a part of them. Nor can pipelines be built when ethnic conflicts are tearing states apart. Ethnicity is the clarion call of the modern era. Trying to resolve ethnic problems and keep states together needs persistent and consistent diplomacy rather than virtual bribes to keep various warlords quiet. Oil companies cannot build pipelines which are vulnerable to civil wars, fast-moving political changes and events, instability, and an environment beset by Islamic fundamentalism, drugs and guns. The old great game was about perceived threats in which force was never directly used. Russia and Great Britain marked out borders and signed treaties, creating Afghanistan as a buffer between them. The new great game must be one where the aim is to stabilize and settle the region, not increase tensions and antagonism. The USA is the only world power which has the ability to influence all the neighboring states to stop interfering in Afghanistan. It has to do so with far more commitment than it has demonstrated so far. Pakistan Weakened by the demise of its strategic partnership with the USA after the end of the Cold War and in the throes of a deep economic crisis, was nevertheless determined to extend its zone of influence by trying to nominate the next government in Kabul. Faced with a belligerent Indian neighbour seven times its size, Pakistan's obsession with security has naturally shaped its domestic politics and foreign policy concerns since it was created in 1947. But the military, bureaucratic, intelligence elite that has guided Pakistan's destiny since the 1950s has never allowed civil society to function. Only this elite has had the right to determine the nature of the threat to Pakistan's national security and its solutions, not elected governments, parliaments, civic organizations, or even common sense. Since 1988, four elected governments have been dismissed, Ten governments have come and gone, and domestic stability is still as distant a dream as ever. With such deep crises of identity, political legitimacy, economic mismanagement and social polarization, the elite has nevertheless indulged in the worst example of imperial overstretch by any third world country in the latter half of this century. Pakistan is now fighting proxy wars on two fronts, 
in Kashmir and Afghanistan, and even though the repercussions from these wars, Islamic fundamentalism, drugs, weapons and social breakdown, are now aggressively spilling into the country, there is no reappraisal or policy review. Pakistan is now ripe for a Taliban-style Islamic revolution, which would almost certainly jeopardize stability in the Middle East, South and Central Asia. What Pakistan's policymakers have failed to realize is that any stable government in Kabul will have to depend on Pakistan for reconstruction, foodstuffs, fuel and access to the outside world. Pakistan's own economy would benefit as it would provide workers, technicians and materials for Afghanistan's reconstruction. The Afghan refugees would return, easing the financial burden of sustaining them. And Pakistan could begin to reassert some control over its dilapidated state institutions and borders. While Pakistan has had a forward policy in Afghanistan, Iran's interference has essentially been defensive, maintaining a limited influence and resisting a total Taliban takeover. But Iran has contributed heavily to the fragmentation of Afghanistan by playing the Shia card, the Persian language card, and keeping the very ethnic groups it supports divided amongst themselves. The disparateness of the Hazaras and the Uzbeks, the two ethnic groups Iran has provided the most aid to, is sufficient to show how Iran's policy of divide and rule has devastated the anti-Taliban alliance. Iran's policies have reflected the intense power struggle within the Iranian elite, which has only intensified in the last two years. Moreover, the complete breakdown of trust and understanding between Iran and Pakistan has set back the peace process and proved ruinous for the Afghans. There is no common ground between the two states on a solution to the Afghan civil war, and even more ominously, both states are funding proxy wars between Shias and Sunnis in each other's countries, as well as in Afghanistan, increasing the likelihood of a major sectarian explosion in the region. With the advent of the Taliban, sectarianism and ethnic sectarian cleansing has reared its ugly head for the first time in Afghanistan's history. The Central Asian states are the new players on the block, but they have quickly taken to protecting what they see as threats to their national interests. Pashtun domination of Afghanistan does not suit them, and they abhor the kind of Islamic sentiments the Taliban espouse. Until their ethnic cousins in Afghanistan are part of some power-sharing formula in Kabul, the Central Asian states will not cease to aid them to resist the Taliban. This places in jeopardy Pakistan's plans for accessing pipeline and communication routes across Afghanistan from Central Asia. If the Taliban were to conquer the entire country, the Central Asian states would have to accept the Taliban reality, but they would be unlikely to trust their energy exports to go through Taliban-controlled Afghanistan and Pakistan. Saudi Arabia, it appears, has proved incapable of evolving a rational foreign policy which suits its national interest rather than merely appeasing its domestic Wahhabi lobby. It took Mullah Omar to personally insult the House of Saud before the Saudis pulled away from the Taliban. The Saudi export of Wahhabism has now boomeranged back home and is increasingly undermining the authority of the royal family. Osama bin Laden's critique of the corruption and mismanagement of the regime is not falling upon deaf ears amongst the Saudi population. And unless Afghanistan moves towards peace, dozens more bin Ladens are ready and waiting to take his place from their bases inside Afghanistan. For Muslims everywhere, Saudi support for the Taliban is deeply embarrassing, because the Taliban's interpretation of Islam is so negative and destructive. Increasingly, Western popular perception equates Islam with the Taliban and bin Laden-style terrorism. Many Western commentators do not particularize the Taliban, but condemn Islam wholesale for being intolerant and anti-modern. The Taliban, like so many Islamic fundamentalist groups today, divest Islam of all its legacies except theology. Islamic philosophy, science, arts, aesthetic and mysticism are ignored, Thus, the rich diversity of Islam and the essential message of the Quran to build a civil society that is just and equitable in which rulers are responsible for their citizens is forgotten. 
The genius of early Muslim Arab civilization was its multicultural, multi-religious, and multi-ethnic diversity. The stunning and numerous state failures that abound in the Muslim world today are because that original path, that intention and inspiration, has been abandoned, either in favor of brute dictatorship or a narrow interpretation of theology. Muslim history has been a cycle of conquest, renewal, and defeat. Perhaps it has been the destiny of Islam to attract and use the primitive peoples who surround or cross its territory, but then to fall prey to their violent power. Ultimately, order is restored and wounds are healed. The successful primitive warrior is tamed by the all-powerful urban life of Islam, wrote Ferdinand Brodel. Following this Muslim tradition, could the Taliban also change or moderate their policies and absorb Afghanistan's rich ethnic and cultural diversity to become the country's legitimate rulers? In their present form, that is unlikely. The Taliban are essentially caught between a tribal society which they try to ignore and the need for a state structure which they refuse to establish. Tribal fragmentation among the Pashtuns is already coming back to haunt them, as they fail to satisfy even the local demands of power-sharing, while they ignore the non-Pashtuns. This was never the case in the past. Despite the seeming dominance of the Pashtuns, the actual process of state-building entailed the participation of the elite of all the ethnic groups, and a prominent role played by non-Pashtuns in both the bureaucracy and the military, writes Afghan scholar Ashraf Ghani. The Taliban are bucking the entire trend of Afghan history, because they have no understanding of it. At the same time, the Taliban refuse to define the Afghan state they want to constitute and rule over, largely because they have no idea what they want. The lack of a central authority, state organizations, a methodology for command and control, and mechanisms which can reflect some level of popular participation, lawyer jirga or Islamic shura or parliament, make it impossible for many Afghans to accept the Taliban or for the outside world to recognize a Taliban government. There can be no effective government unless there is a common acceptable definition of what kind of state is now required to heal the wounds of war. But the Kandahari group around Mullah Omar brooks no outsiders and no advice. Divisions within the Taliban are multiplying fast, and it is not unlikely that more moderate Taliban may mount a coup against Mullah Omar and the Kandahari ulema. No warlord faction has ever felt itself responsible for the civilian population, but the Taliban are incapable of carrying out even the minimum of developmental work because they believe that Islam will take care of everyone. This has raised fundamental questions for the UN and the NGO community, that humanitarian aid is in fact prolonging the civil war because foreign aid keeps the population alive, absolving the warlords of the responsibility of having to provide for the people and allowing them to channel all their resources into the war effort. This dilemma is now common for the UN and aid agencies in other failed states such as Sudan and Somalia and presents the greatest challenge to the international humanitarian community in the future. It seems that the only effective Afghan NGO is based on organized smuggling and the drugs trade. Thus, the limited reconstruction which the Taliban has undertaken so far is entirely related to improving the efficiency of smuggling and drugs trafficking, such as repairing roads, setting up petrol pumps, and inviting U.S. businessmen to set up a mobile telephone network, which will qualitatively speed up the movement of drugs and illicit trade. The benefits of this reconstruction all accrue to the transport and drugs mafia. No warlord is building schools, hospitals, water supply systems, or anything remotely related to civic development. In their present form, the Taliban cannot hope to rule Afghanistan and be recognized by the international community. Even if they were to conquer the North, it would not bring stability, only continuing guerrilla war by the non-Pashtuns, but this time from bases in Central Asia and Iran, which would further destabilize the region. Yet in the Pashtun belt of Afghanistan, the only alternative to the Taliban is further disorder and chaos. 
The majority of Afghans south of Kabul would most probably agree that the Taliban, although they're not as popular today as when they came, are better for the people, their security and welfare, compared to what was there before them, and that there is no real alternative but anarchy. The Taliban cannot be wished away, but a more likely scenario is that the Taliban will form factions with separate and rival Taliban fiefdoms in Kabul, Kandahar, and possibly Herat. The anti-Taliban alliance is incapable of conquering or ruling over the southern Pashtun area. So far, Massoud has proved unable to galvanize enough Pashtuns who reject the Taliban and who would give him some national legitimacy. The opposition's only chance for survival depends on winning over sections of the Pashtuns, which will doubtless prolong the war but also weaken the Taliban and offer the possibility that both sides could then negotiate. The anti-Taliban alliance has also failed to set up minimum state structures or a representative leadership which absorbs even all the non-Pashtuns. Their bickering internal differences and leadership power struggles have decimated them in the eyes of many Afghans, who may loathe the Taliban but have no faith in the anti-Taliban alliance either. The fear of fragmentation is ever-present, and the lines have been well drawn since 1996, a Pashtun south under the Taliban, and a non-Pashtun north divided by the Hindu Kush mountains, leaving Kabul contested by the two sides. With the devastating massacres, sectarian pogroms and ethnic cleansing in so many areas, the chances of fragmentation appear extremely high. Fortunately, there is no Slobodan Milosevic or Saddam Hussein amongst the warlords who would be prepared to preserve power and their fiefdoms at the expense of partition of the country. Despite their interference, fragmentation suits none of Afghanistan's neighbours because it would open a Pandora's box of ethnicity that would rapidly spill across Afghanistan's borders, creating massive refugee influxes and further spread the culture of drugs, weapons and Islamic fundamentalism in their already fragile states. Formal fragmentation and even partition of the Afghan state is still possible, but so far none of the players desire it. That is the one positive hope for the future of the peace process. Peacemaking by the UN has so far failed to yield any dividends, but not for lack of trying. The reason is simply that as long as outside powers fuel the warlords with money and weapons, the civil war does not have a likelihood of winding down. A possible solution might lie in a process which would have to begin from outside Afghanistan. All the regional states would first have to agree to an arms embargo on Afghanistan, implement it sincerely, and allow it to be monitored by the UN effectively. The regional states would have to accept limited areas of influence in Afghanistan, rather than continuing to push for their proxies to rule the entire country. An Iran-Pakistan dialogue would be essential, in which Pakistan would accept limiting its influence to the Pashtun belt, while Iran accept the same in western and central Afghanistan with guarantees for the Shia minority. In short, each neighbouring state would have to recognise not only its own national security needs, but also those of its neighbours. Outside influence cannot now be eliminated in Afghanistan, but it must be contained and limited with mutual agreement to acceptable levels. No neighbouring country can presume to undermine the acknowledged security interests of its neighbours. Negotiating such agreements would be extremely tricky because they would involve not just diplomats, but the military and intelligence officials of each state. The UN and the international community would also have to guarantee that such agreements would not be furthering the future disintegration of Afghanistan or interfering with the process of government formation inside Afghanistan. Afghanistan's internal settlement can no longer be achieved by what is euphemistically called a broad-based government. There is no possibility that Mullah Omar and Massoud are going to be able to agree to sit down in Kabul and rule together. Instead, what is needed is a ceasefire, a weak central government for an initial period, the agreed demilitarization of Kabul, and a high degree of autonomy in the regions controlled by the factions. All the factions would have to agree to build up a strengthened central government in the long term while maintaining their own autonomy in the short term. In this way, they would retain their independent military units, 
but would also contribute to a central policing force in Kabul. The factions would receive outside aid for reconstruction on an independent basis, but work together through the central government to rebuild the country's shattered infrastructure. This would in turn generate greater confidence and understanding between them. All the factions would then have to agree to set in motion some sort of legitimizing process through elected or chosen representative bodies in their regions, which ultimately could lead to a central jirga or shura in Kabul. It cannot be underestimated how difficult it would be to negotiate such agreements, given that at present there is no will among the belligerents to negotiate. One lure could be a substantial reconstruction package put together by international donors, the World Bank or large private charities, which would not be dispersed until there was a minimum agreement. This would essentially be a bribe for the warlords and an incentive for the Afghan people to pressurize them to accept an agreement. Any serious peace process would need much greater commitment to peacemaking in Afghanistan from the international community than it has shown so far. Peace in Afghanistan would pay enormous dividends across the entire region. Pakistan would benefit economically from the reconstruction in Afghanistan, and it could begin to tackle the leftovers of the Afghan war on its own soil, the proliferation of weapons, drugs, terrorism, sectarianism, and the black economy. Pakistan's diplomatic isolation in the region would end, and it could reintegrate itself into the Central Asian network of communication links, offering as it does the shortest route to the sea. Iran would return to its position in the world community, and its role as a great trading state at the center of South Asia, Central Asia, and the Middle East. Turkey would have links and commercial ties to Turkic peoples in Afghanistan, with whom it has a historical connection. China would feel more secure and be able to carry out a more effective economic development program in its deprived Muslim province of Xinjiang. Russia could build a more realistic relationship with Central and South Asia, based on economic realities rather than false hegemonic ambitions, while laying its Afghan ghosts to rest. Oil and gas pipelines crossing Afghanistan would link the country into the region and speed up foreign assistance for its reconstruction. The USA could evolve a more realistic Central Asian policy, access the region's energy in a secure environment, and deal with the threat of terrorism. But if the war in Afghanistan continues to be ignored, we can only expect the worst. Pakistan will face a Taliban-style Islamic revolution, which will further destabilize it, and the entire region. Iran will remain on the periphery of the world community, and its eastern borders will continue to be racked by instability. The Central Asian states will not be able to deliver their energy and mineral exports by the shortest routes, and as their economies crash, they will face an Islamic upsurge and instability. Russia will continue to bristle with hegemonic aims in Central Asia, even as its own society and economy crumbles. The stakes are extremely high. Appendix A sample of Taliban decrees relating to women and other cultural issues after the capture of Kabul, 1996. This translation from Dari was handed to Western agencies to implement. The grammar and spellings are reproduced here as they appeared in the original. 1. Decree announced by the General Presidency of Amr Bil Maruf and Nai Az Munkar Religious Police, Kabul, November 1996. Women, you should not step outside your residence. If you go outside the house, you should not be like women who used to go with fashionable clothes, wearing much cosmetics and appearing in front of every man before the coming of Islam. Islam, as a rescuing religion, has determined specific dignity for women. Islam has valuable instructions for women. Women should not create such opportunity to attract the attention of useless people who will not look at them with a good eye. Women have the responsibility as a teacher or coordinator for her family. Husband, brother, father have the responsibility for providing the family with the necessary life requirements, food, clothes, etc. In case women are required to go outside the residence for the purposes of education, social needs or social services, they should cover themselves in accordance with Islamic Sharia regulation. 
If women are going outside with fashionable, ornamental, tight and charming clothes to show themselves, they will be cursed by the Islamic Sharia and should never expect to go to heaven. All family elders and every Muslim have responsibility in this respect. We request all family elders to keep tight control over their families and avoid these social problems. Otherwise, these women will be threatened, investigated and severely punished, as well as the family elders, by the forces of the religious police, the Munkrat. The religious police have the responsibility and duty to struggle against these social problems and will continue their effort until evil is finished. 2. Rules of work for the state hospitals and private clinics based on Islamic Sharia principles. Ministry of Health on behalf of Amir ul Mominim Mullah Muhammad Omar, Kabul, November 1996. 1. Female patients should go to female physicians. In case a male physician is needed, the female patient should be accompanied by her close relative. 2. During examination, the female patients and male physicians both should be dressed with Islamic hijab, veil. 3. Male physicians should not touch or see the other parts of female patients except for the affected part. 4. Waiting room for female patients should be safely covered. 5. The person who regulates turn for female patients should be a female. 6. During the night duty, in what rooms which female patients are hospitalized, the male doctor without the call of the patient is not allowed to enter the room. 7. Sitting and speaking between male and female doctors are not allowed. If there be need for discussion, it should be done with hijab. 8. Female doctors should wear simple clothes. They are not allowed to wear stylish clothes or use cosmetics or makeup. 9. Female doctors and nurses are not allowed to enter the rooms where male patients are hospitalized. 10. Hospital staff should pray in mosques on time. 11. The religious police are allowed to go for control at any time and nobody can prevent them. Anybody who violates the order will be punished as per Islamic regulations. 3. General Presidency of Amr Bil Maruf, Kabul, December 1996. 1. To prevent sedition and female uncovers, Behajabi. No drivers are allowed to pick up women who are using Iranian burqa. In case of violation, the driver will be imprisoned. If such kind of female are observed in the street, their house will be found and their husband punished. If the women use stimulating and attractive cloth and there is no a company of close male relative with them, the drivers should not pick them up. 2. To prevent music. To be broadcasted by the public information resources. In shops, Hotels, vehicles and rickshaws, cassettes and music are prohibited. This matter should be monitored within five days. If any music cassette found in a shop, the shopkeeper should be imprisoned and the shop locked. If five people guarantee the shop should be opened, the criminal released later. If cassette found in the vehicle, the vehicle and the driver will be imprisoned. If five people guarantee, the vehicle will be released and the criminal released later. 3. To prevent beard shaving and its cutting. After one and a half months, if anyone observed who has shaved and or cut his beard, they should be arrested and imprisoned until their beard gets bushy. 4. To prevent keeping pigeons and playing with birds. Within 10 days, this habit hobby should stop. After 10 days, this should be monitored and the pigeons and any other playing birds should be killed. 5. To prevent kite flying. The kite shops in the city should be abolished. 6. To prevent idolatry. In vehicles, shops, hotels, room and any other place, pictures, portraits should be abolished. The monitors should tear up all pictures in the above places. 7. To prevent gambling. In collaboration with the security police, the main centre should be found and the gamblers imprisoned for one month. 8. To eradicate the use of addiction. Addicts should be imprisoned and investigation made to find the supplier and the shop. The shop should be locked and the owner and user should be imprisoned and punished. 9. To prevent the British and American hairstyle. 
People with long hair should be arrested and taken to the religious police department to shave their hair. The criminal has to pay the barber. 10. To prevent interest on loans, charge on changing small denomination notes and charge on money orders. All money exchangers should be informed that the above three types of exchanging the money should be prohibited. In case of violation, criminals will be imprisoned for a long time. 11. To prevent washing cloth by young ladies along the water streams in the city. Violator ladies should be picked up with respectful Islamic manner, taken to their houses and their husbands severely punished. 12. To prevent music and dances in wedding parties. In the case of violation, the head of the family will be arrested and punished. 13. To prevent the playing of music drum. The prohibition of this should be announced. If anybody does this, then the religious elders can decide about it. 14. To prevent sewing ladies' cloth and taking female body measures by tailor. If women or fashion magazines are seen in the shop, the tailor should be imprisoned. 15. To prevent sorcery. All the related books should be burnt and the magician should be imprisoned until his repentance. 16. To prevent not praying and order gathering pray at the bazaar. Prayer should be done on their due times in all districts. Transportation should be strictly prohibited and all people are obliged to go to the mosque. If young people are seen in the shops, they will be immediately imprisoned. This concludes the reading of Taliban by Ahmed Rashid. The book was read by Nadia May. If you would like to obtain a complete printed catalogue of our titles or our monthly update telling you about new releases and our new collection of books on CD, write Blackstone Audiobooks, Post Office Box 969, Ashland, Oregon 97520, or call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's one 800 729-2665. You may also obtain the same information from our award-winning website. Our address, all one word, is www.blackstoneaudio.com. Thank you.